This is Audible. Dragon Emperor 2 Human to Dragon to God Written by Eric Vall Narrated by Alex Perone and Marissa Parness Chapter 1 Fighting water demons next to a river definitely wasn't my idea of a relaxing picnic. Why won't they die? I growled as one of the fifty water demons fell apart like jello underneath my claws, only to reform itself instantly. This was supposed to be a chill day, not interrupted by whatever the fuck these things are. These creatures were easily the strangest I'd seen since coming to the world of Anadi. Some of them could almost pass for humans, but others bore the heads of horses and gills along their pale blue necks. Some of the water demons were even see-through, as if they were made up of nothing more than water, and would shatter into great big fat droplets before their bodies reformed. Others had more substance to them, almost like they were made out of flesh and bone, but their bodies were still as flexible and fluid as water. The three dryads, with their hair and eyes brilliant shades of green, had been setting up the picnic while I'd been lounging in the sunlight in my dragon form. So, while we'd been caught slightly unawares when the demons attacked, it wasn't like we were completely defenseless. Anton and Laika, two of the wolf warriors from the Blue Tree Guild, had come along as guards, but water was a weak point for anyone's nose. It washed away the scent of both prey and predator, which led to the ultimate escape or the perfect surprise attack. Now, Laika held a sword in each of her hands, and she was a whirlwind of gray fur and hair as she mowed down water demons dozens of times after they rose up again. She was lithe, dangerous, and all toned muscles underneath her leather armor. Laika's dark gray hair was tied up in a high ponytail, and her furry ears were erect as she growled angrily at the water demons. Anton was a perfect gray-haired shadow of Laika's movements, and fire enveloped his fists as the bodies of the water-based creatures evaporated wherever his attacks landed. The demons also took longer to reform after they were destroyed by fire, so it was giving us a little bit of an advantage. But there were still a lot of bastards left to deal with. A few yards away from the fighting glowed a barrier, and three beautiful dryad sisters defended it in cohesion. They didn't allow any of the water demons to travel any farther than the riverbank, and any demon that tried was quickly and efficiently dispatched. Marina and Polina had their hands on the ground as thick roots emerged and lashed out at the water demons, and Trina spun in vicious and deadly circles as her dagger pushed back the creatures that had emerged from the river. Inside the barrier were two small children with silvery blue hair and small horns on their foreheads. Ilya and his sister Ilyushina were survivors from a village attacked by summoned spirits. They clutched each other tightly now, and the little girl hid her face in Ilya's chest at the sight of the battle. Ilyushina's whimpers reached my ears, and I slashed forward at the water demons with renewed rage. This was supposed to be a happy and relaxing moment for all of us, something to take our minds off the constant attacks and battles we'd all been forced through. But these fuckers wouldn't stay down. They just kept reforming and coming back at us no matter what we did to them. It was like they were gluttons for punishment, and every slash seemed to only drive them even further into a frenzy. I racked my mind for a way to fight them. My claws weren't doing anything to them, and they seemed almost unstoppable. There had to be some sort of way to stop them. Suddenly, an idea struck me. Maybe pulling these demons away from the river would weaken them. I didn't know if it would work but it was worth a shot. So, I pulled at the well of magic deep inside of me and latched on to the power of stone. A moment later, the earth around me hummed and sang as I dug my claws into the sandy ground. Rise! I growled as I yanked at the rock beneath the sand and pulled it upward. Stone pillars rose up from the ground and skewered the water demons that had separated me from the others. The pillars rose up for a hundred feet into the sky, and I could feel them as extensions of my own body. On the spikes, the water demons writhed in what seemed to be agony, and triumph began to climb its way up through my chest. The sense of victory died quickly, however, when instead of dissipating into nothingness, there was a surge of cold energy, and then the water demons multiplied. Rage burned through my blood as I stared up at the descending water demons. Was there really nothing we could do to end them? 
Fuck that. I launched myself into the air, claws first at the water demons that fell from the spikes. Their sudden multiplication was ridiculous, and if this had been a game, I'd say it was a shitty mod. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Aliona hold her own against a group of water demons. They had corralled her against one of the fallen stones of the aqueduct that lay in ruins along the river, but she was keeping them at bay with a defensive martial art style I hadn't seen before. The fabric of her white dress was drenched and clung to the curves of her perfect body while she slammed palm strikes into the water demons. Her silver-white hair swung out around her as she fought, and her amethyst eyes glowed with power. I snarled and got ready to attack the water demons around the priestess, but then a sudden rise of purity in the air drew my full attention from the beasts to Aliona. Evan! Aliona called out behind her as she ran toward the river instead of away from it. Lead them back to the river, as close as you can to the water. Then the divine princess of Rama dove into the river in one smooth arc, and her white and raven hair fluttered behind her as one of the water demons tried but failed to grab hold of her legs. Aliona! I dove into the river after her and plunged into the icy depths of the raging current. The water of the river was strange. A deep chill emanated from it and curled into my bones, and I could feel my core temperature drop almost instantly. This wasn't like the time I dived into the lake in the cave where the Blue Tree Guild had found me. The chill of that water hadn't bothered me in my draconic body, but this was like I jumped into a glacier, and I was completely exposed to the elements. Even my lungs seemed to seize inside of my chest as my heart began to beat sluggishly. I knew what all these were symptoms of, but it was the first time I'd been affected so badly in my draconic form. How had hypothermia set in so quickly? I lifted my head above the water and searched for the priestess on the surface, but I couldn't find her. A bright blue light grew within the depths of the river, and I knew the light had to be coming from Aliona. Thrumming waves of purity emanated from the light, and the water demons flinched away from it. I didn't know what she was planning on doing or how it would help defeat the water demons, but I could drag them back into the river for her and trust that whatever she was planning would work. With one flap of my massive wings, I was airborne, and then I used my tail to sweep as many demons as I could into the river without throwing the wolves or dryads into the water. My comrades had heard the priestess's shout and seemed to be as confused as I was, but they worked quickly in driving the water demons back into the river. The Dryad sisters pushed the wall of roots closer to the water, and with it, the water demons. Laika and Anton rushed off in opposite directions to form a three-sided enclosure and block off any route of escape. And then, Anton formed a wall of flames that flickered and licked at the running river. Laika's swords alone were enough to drive back the water demons, and her blade was quick and sure as she landed heavy blows that pushed back even the turbulent waves of the river. I blinked, and for a moment, I thought I could see the swirl of energy and power coalesce in Laika's hands as they gripped the hilts of her swords. My lips curled back in a grin at the sight, but it fell quickly. This plan seemed counterproductive in my mind, since the water demons would be stronger when surrounded by more water. Then, the blue light beneath the river exploded like a supernova, and I squeezed my eyes shut as a wave of purity washed over me. Instantly, the bodies of the water demons came apart and splashed into the settling waters of the river, and I wanted to roar in triumph, but then I saw something that stilled the victory in my throat. Even though the water demons had been hell-bent on attacking us just moments before, relief was visible on their faces as their bodies slipped away. I blinked in confusion, and then I thought I saw a group of spirits hover above the surface of the river before they faded into the sun's light. Everyone all right? Laika called out as she shifted her stance and kept her eyes suspiciously on the water. Our picnic was ruined! Trina groaned as she fell back on the riverbank. Paulina grimaced as she too flopped on her side and came face to face with a waterlogged basket. All of the food inside of it was now soaked with water, and much of it had crumbled into pieces. It could have been far worse. Anton grunted as he sat down next to the pouting dryads. I barely noticed their conversation as I flew over the river and searched for any sign of the priestess in the water. Aliona still hadn't come up for air. I flapped my massive wings to gain some altitude again, and then I circled above the place she dove into, 
but I couldn't see or sense anything on the bottom of the deep river. The waters had been crystalline blue before the water demons attacked, but now the surface was dark and murky. It was as if black dye had been poured into the river and it obscured everything. Come on, come back up, I muttered to myself as I continued to flap my wings. Why hasn't my lady come back up? Marina shouted as she peered nervously at the river and then back at the barrier around the two azuras. She'll be fine. Laika clenched her jaw and tightened her grip on her swords. She has to be. Fuck this. I wasn't going to wait around anymore for Aliona to come back up. What if she'd somehow gotten hurt and needed our help? I swooped into the river and focused my power so I would take on my smaller human form. It would be easier to search whatever crevices made up the riverbed if I wasn't a huge dragon, and the transformation into my human body was swift. The water wasn't glacial cold anymore, thank God, but the inkiness that had taken over its color had yet to dissipate. I could barely even see my hand in front of my face as I swam deeper into the darkness. It was like the river was never ending, and I didn't realize how deep it actually was. From the riverbank, it looked like it was maybe 15 feet deep, but now that I was inside of the water, I knew it was much more. There was a sudden drop-off in the center of the river that came down at least another 50 feet. My lungs burned with the need for air, but as I directed my healing power toward myself, the pain came to a stop. I didn't take the time to wonder how or why healing my lungs had actually worked or made it easier for me to keep searching through the river. I needed to find Aliona. Even her immortal body could feel pain, and the thought of her drowning over and over again wasn't a pleasant one. My more animalistic instincts took over, and I swam deeper until I reached the bottom of the river where a faint light glowed. I followed the light, and it led me to Aliona. The priestess sat on a smooth rock at the bottom of the riverbed, and her hair floated up all around her face. Cradled in her hands was a pearl that glowed through the darkness of the river, and the light grew steadily until it was almost brighter than the sun. I swam toward Aliona and winced at the brightness of the light. As I got closer, I even had to squeeze my eyes shut against the onslaught. When I finally did reach her, I cracked one eye open and saw she was so focused on the pearl in her hands, she hadn't even noticed me. I quickly pulled her into my arms and swam upward to break the surface of the river. The two of us gasped for air as we emerged, and the raging currents of the river began to calm to a languid pace around us. What is that? I gasped for air as I nodded at the glowing pearl in Aliona's hands. It's like you were in a trance down there. A spirit stone. Aliona replied as she gently held up the pearl so I could see it. The pearl still glowed, but it was no longer the intense light from earlier. It had calmed down and only gave off a faint glow that could almost be mistaken for a simple sheen. I was curious about the pearl in Aliona's hands, and whatever she'd done to the water demons to make them disappear, but I didn't trust the river. So, with one arm wrapped tightly around the priestess, I swam toward the riverbank where our friends waited for us. Then we stumbled onto the sandy shore and collapsed on the warm sand. Milady, are you all right? Lyca knelt down and looked over Aliona's body. The water demons, how did you banish them? I hope you made them suffer. Trina muttered as she looked at the ruined food. Our picnic is over before it even started. I couldn't help but let out a laugh as I looked around us. While there had already been rubble along the river thanks to the ruined aqueduct, the earth had been completely torn up by the fighting. I could see scorch marks from Anton's flames and the holes left by the dryad's roots, not to mention the deep gouges caused by Lyca's swords. Ilya and Ilyushina recovered quickly with the stamina of children, and they wandered closer to us as they began to gather seashells. They've already suffered enough, those poor spirits. Aliona sighed as she lifted the pearl and sunlight glinted off of it. I led them toward the light they've been looking for all this time. The pearl shimmered in the air before it disappeared from view, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. It wasn't the feeling of spatial magic, but something stranger. I stared at where the pearl had been in Aliona's hands and noticed a glittering sheen on her skin. Before I could ask her what happened and what she meant by light, I sensed we had company, and I looked up to see a familiar face. What happened here? Julia looked down at all of us from the top of the crumbled aqueduct and furrowed her brow. It looks like you've just had a battle. 
Were you all sparring instead of having a picnic? Julia was one of the elders of Hatra. She was a striking woman with pale blue eyes that pierced through everyone she spoke to and light brown hair tied in a loose ponytail. Next to her, a young fox demihuman stared down at us with wide eyes as she pushed her dark blue bangs out of her face. The fox was Afra, a teenager I'd met in the farms of Hatra, and I was surprised to see her with an elder so far out of the city. Water demon infestation, I wryly replied from where I'd collapsed on the riverbank. It's weird because I didn't sense them the first time I flew over the river. They just appeared out of nowhere and attacked us. Has anyone ever been attacked by them before, or did we pull the short straw? First, I had no idea about the angry crimson dragon that lived in the canyons near Hatra, and I'd ended up flying in that very direction. Now it had been a horde of water demons intent on... Well, none of them had actually talked to us. They just started rampaging and trying to rip us apart, which was a good enough reason to fight back against them. After facing down stone giants and two armies, I wasn't about to get done in by a walking jellied puddle of water. It's not quite accurate to call them demons, Aliona said as she shifted one of the black braids off of her face and rolled over to look at me. They're the souls of those unfortunate enough to have died violently in water. People who have been unable to move on to the netherworld. There's never been water demons here, though. Julia frowned as she looked between all of us and the ravaged riverbank. Not even after Hatra was destroyed. We've never been warned away from the waters of this river. Well, you've been warned now, I replied as I let myself fall back onto the warm sand. You pretty much just missed all the action by seconds. A pity, then, Julia said wryly as she glanced around at all of us. It seems like you all had great fun. You're right, Trina snorted and glared at the river. They came out of nowhere and tried to rip us apart. Generally, that's what demons do. Julia sat down on one of the shattered pieces of the aqueducts that had once brought this very river to the center of Hatra. They aren't quite friendly, even on the very best of days. You weren't attacked by stragglers, were you? My brow furrowed as I looked between the two perfectly dry women atop the aqueduct. Also, I thought you were going to stay behind in the city. Did something happen? Is everyone okay? Everything is fine. I was just accompanying Afra. Julia placed her hand on Afra's shoulder and glanced over at the nearby rubble. She wanted to collect some herbs by the river, and I needed to compare the aqueduct ruins to some schematics. There are lots of plants growing by the river that can heal us and be used as food. Afra chimed in as she pointed happily at some of the plants near the water's edge. They've been hard to keep alive inside of the city because of their growing environment, and they would die quickly each time the miasma came. I'm hoping now that the miasma hasn't been attacking, we can grow them inside the city. Elder Julia, do you mind if I start? Of course, dear. <laughs> Julia chuckled fondly as she plucked a leaf from Afra's hair. She waved Afra off, and the girl dashed away to collect some of the plants by the riverbank. Then Julia placed her hand in the air in front of her, and I sensed a small wave of power as she pulled out scrolls from thin air. You gotta teach me how to use spatial magic. I said with a grin, as I walked over to Julia and looked at the open scroll in her lap. Are those from the library? There is quite a bit I need to teach you. The elder nodded, and her eyes gleamed with delight. And yes, these are the schematics I found. It seems when the aqueducts were first built, there were enchantments tied into the stone itself. Wait, so even buildings can be enchanted? My eyes went wide as I looked from the scroll to the scattered stones around us. Not just jewelry and little things? I thought back to the beautiful jewelry I'd seen Aliona imbue with power when we were inside the archives and she'd first found the reference to dragon's blood. It almost seemed like a thousand years ago in my mind. So much had happened since then that it was hard to believe a full month hadn't yet passed. They can. Julia traced the carvings on the stone she sat on and smiled. Lady Aliona? Well, I should say Princess Aliona now, shouldn't I? I don't think she'll mind. I chuckled as I looked over to where Aliona was playing happily with the two children. But, uh, you were saying? Oh! Julia clapped her hands together and glanced back down at the schematics in her lap. Yes, we don't know if this knowledge is outdated. What if there's been advancements in the past thousand years since the city fell? Or maybe this is as good as it's gotten? Still, for us, 
This is like rediscovering how to make fire. Lady Aliona would be able to teach us how to enchant buildings or lead us in the right direction. Hey, all of this is new for me, I shrugged. So I'll be learning with you guys. Speaking of learning... <laughs> Julia laughed softly as she rolled up the schematics, stood, and motioned for me to follow her. We're having a meeting once we're all back in the city. A meeting? I tilted my head in curiosity and followed Julia to where the others sat. What about? Now that, dear dragon. <laughs> Julia laughed and slipped her arm around mine. Would be ruining the surprise. Chapter 2 Ilya and Ilyushina were left in the care of the fox demi-human Afra, and they'd headed off to the communal kitchens the moment we got back to Hatra. The Dryad sisters and Anton dashed off in the direction of the airship, which left Julia to lead Laika, Aliona, and myself to the temporary town square. There were still tents set up inside of the square, and we walked straight for the largest one. Inside of the tent was a large, long table made out of wood with a dozen or so seats. At the table sat the other two elders, Ruslan and Moskal, with food before them. There were plates of bread, cheese, dried meats, and fresh vegetables from the farms. My stomach growled at the sight of the large spread. Other than this morning's aborted picnic, I couldn't really remember the last time I ate. Well, that was if I didn't count feasting on Aliona's beautiful body the night before. Welcome to the first official meeting of the newly reborn Council of Hatra. Ruslan grinned widely and motioned for us to sit down at the table. The fox demi-human sat at the head of the table, and Moskal had a seat at his left. Enchanted crystals brought light into the tent, and they cast shadows all around us. A uh, council? I grinned as I sat down at the long table. That isn't such a bad idea. Julia sat to Ruslan's right and smiled lightly at the two women who sat next to me. Aliona sat primly and properly. Her back didn't even touch the backrest of the chair, and her hands were folded daintily in her lap. Laika, in comparison, rested her elbows on the armrests of the chair and held her face in her hands. It is only fitting if we are to rebuild this city and survive any future attacks, Moskal said as he glanced at the tent's entrance. A lone drop of water achieves nothing, Aliona murmured and stared down at her folded hands. But many may tear down a cliff. I hope we aren't late, a voice said suddenly, and then the wolf demi-human Pyotr stepped through the tent flap with a sharp smile. I gathered two members of the Blue Tree Guild's council to join us. The others are attending to guild matters, but they shall be filled in later. Two people followed Pyotr through the open tent flap, and I looked at them with curiosity. One of them was a woman with dark skin and ears on the top of her head, not unlike Ruslan's, and a sleek tail that wrapped itself around her waist. Her dark purple hair was tied back into a long braid that hung over her shoulder, and she wore dark leathers embroidered with blue trees and a gorget around her throat, just like Laika's. Her eyes were a brilliant crimson and bright like rubies. I focused on the woman as I wondered just what type of demi-human she was. Classification? Fox demi-human. Condition? Healthy. Priority? None. Danger? None. Status? Healthy. The other guild member was a man with piercing blue eyes and almost blue black hair that fell loosely down his back. There wasn't really anything I could pinpoint from his appearance to see if he was a demi-human or not, but I did notice the sharp claws on his hands. Unlike the fox demi-human and other members of the Blue Tree Guild I'd seen, he didn't wear any leathers. He wore simple black robes that flowed to the ground and swished as he moved. I guessed he was some type of reptile or bird as I focused on him. Classification. Crow demi-human. Condition. Healthy. Priority. None. Danger. None. Status. Healthy. I smirked. So, he was a bird. I was right. Honorable grandfather. Respected advisors. Well met. Laika stood immediately from her seat and clasped her hands in front of her. The three members of the Blue Tree Guild returned her greeting and clasped their own hands in front of their chests before they sat down at the table. Ah, Laika, were you by the river? Pyotr glanced at his granddaughter with evident curiosity in his face. Is that why there's a bit of algae in your hair? 
The older wolf reached out to flick away the bit of greenery from behind Laika's ear. We were. Laika's ears flattened on her head as her jaw clenched. Water demons surprised us. Water demons? Pyotr's ears perked as he hummed in thought. There shouldn't be any here, considering how close the desert is. That was my concern as well, Julia said as she fluttered her fan and frowned. Suddenly, the flaps of the tent moved again, and the two adult azuras, Natalia and Maxim, entered. Both bore the pale blue hair I'd come to learn was typical of azuras, and there were slight horns on their foreheads. How strange to hear of water demons, Natalia said from the entrance of the tent and tilted her head. Has the meeting begun? Ah, you're just in time. Moscow shook his head as he settled his hands inside his sleeves. We have barely begun to make introductions. Ruslan, would you lead us off? The air inside of the tent shifted as power condensed and stirred, and all the airness and gentleness from before disappeared. Now there was only steel inside of the tent, and I felt my own power rise with the elders. It was time for badass people to talk about badass things. I am Ruslan of the House of Hatra. The fox demi-human stood from his seat and bowed with his hands clasped in front of his chest. I have defended this city for over half a millennia and more. I will continue to do so until my dying breath, but in the meantime, I work as a blacksmith. Julia of the House of Hatra. Julia stood gracefully as she curtsied and moved her fan with a flourish. I am an elder alongside Ruslin and my brother Moskal. I am Hatra's keeper of knowledge. And I am Moskal of the House of Hatra. Moskal stood and bowed with his hands clasped in front of his chest. I am the third elder of this city, and I am an herbalist. Laika of the Blue Tree Guild. Laika declared as she copied the elder's movements and bows. I am the guild's current leader. Pyotr of the Blue Tree Guild. The older wolf intoned and repeated the same actions his granddaughter had done. Former guild leader and advisor to the current leader. Daya of the Blue Tree Guild. The fox demi-human murmured as she executed the same greeting. Mistress of war and the advisor to the current leader. Tyon of the Blue Tree Guild. The crow demi-human said, and his claws glinted in the light of the tent as he clasped his hands in front of him. Master of commerce and advisor to the current leader. Natalia is my name. The Azura woman announced as she stood and bent at the waist. Former blacksmith of the Azuras I was. A blacksmith of Hotra, now I am. Maxim of the Azuras I was once. Maxim's voice was soft and barely audible as he stood and bowed. An herbalist I am, and now I lay claim to Hatra as my home. I am the divine maiden Aliona. The priestess beside me declared as she stood gracefully and dropped to one knee with her hands clasped before her chest. Daughter of the White Jade Sect and successor to the White Jade Seat. There was a moment of silence as everyone in the tent stared at Aliona and the deep respect that she, the princess of the country, had offered to everyone gathered here. I didn't have to be a native of the world of Inati to know just how rare it was for a royal to do something like that. And I'm Evan, the dragon of Hatra. I stood and clasped my hands in front of my chest as I mirrored Aliona's movements. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw small, approving smiles from not only Aliona, but also the elders of Hatra. Now, let's get down to business. Rusland motioned for everyone to sit back in their seats. For the newly arrived Blue Tree Guild members, what do you know of Hatra so far? Tian and Daya exchanged glances as they took their seats on either side of Pyotr. An abandoned city inhabited by stubborn descendants and plagued by miasma, Pyotr answered as he leaned back in his chair. Her Highness tracked down our airship and pleaded for help in saving the city. Five of our finest immediately volunteered, including our current leader, my granddaughter, Laika. Why only five? I frowned as I looked at the older wolf and the other members of the Blue Tree Guild. Why not the whole guild? It was a vanguard of sorts. Laika shrugged her shoulders and leaned forward in her seat so she could face me. We would go ahead, and the rest of the guild would follow if need be. Many of our members were returning from missions, or still out fulfilling requests. Those needed to be completed before the guild could follow us. My brows furrowed as I took in her words. That did seem to make sense. I guess I was just overthinking things. 
And then our esteemed leader commanded for all of us to make our home in an abandoned city. Tion tapped his claws absent-mindedly on the armrest of his chair. It was quite surprising to receive that message. I can imagine. A smile twitched on my face as I thought back to the conversation I had with Laika the night she'd sent said message. Laika told me the Blue Tree Guild had no home but wherever their airship was at any given moment in time. I'd asked her if the Blue Tree Guild would make Hatra their home if I promised to give the Blue Tree Guild the same protection I offered Hatra. She agreed, and now, here we were. What of you, Master Dragon? Daya tilted her head as she spoke, and there was a dark timber to her voice. We were told Laika and the others found you in one of the caves in the nearby forest, an otherworlder summoned to our own world. I was a bit startled by her question, though it wasn't like I'd forgotten I was from Earth and that this world definitely wasn't Earth. I was just surprised to realize just how little time had passed since I'd come to this world. It hadn't even been a month since I'd put on the dragon mask and ended up as a dragon in the world of Inati. That's correct, I replied as memories flooded my mind of stone giants and crystal caves. I found them battling stone giants and I had to help them. I wasn't going to stand by when I could help save someone. And that is why you've ended up in Hatra, no? Daya's ears twitched forward as she leaned toward me. Because of this need to save others? It is, I answered with a nod. I promised I would do anything and everything in my power to help Hatra and its people. Aliona slipped her hand into mine and squeezed. I smiled at the beautiful princess sitting next to me and squeezed her hand in return. That does not explain the Azuras. Tion frowned as he looked between me and the two Azuras at the table. I thought your people kept to themselves outside of your trading season. Why are you here in Hatra? Our village was destroyed, Natalia replied as she lifted four fingers in front of her face and looked at Tion. Out of us all, only four survived. We two who you see here, and the two children of our lord. What? Pyotr gasped in disbelief and leaned forward. The village was destroyed? This cannot be! Natalia and Maxim exchanged a mournful look as the herbalist slumped in his chair. Before the army at our doorstep a few nights ago, there was another one, Julia said as she snapped her fan shut and clenched it tightly between her hands. It was comprised entirely of corrupted corpses and those tainted by the miasma, as if they were puppets on a string. An army? Daya frowned as she questioned Julia. How many of them corpses? There were thousands of them, Moscow grumbled as he leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. Why would Hatra be at the center of so many attacks? Pyotr hummed thoughtfully as he picked up a slice of cucumber and tossed it into his mouth. It's as if we were being targeted for a reason. It's the Archive, I replied with a shake of my head. Archive? Pyotr raised one of his dark gray eyebrows as he looked at me. Library, archive, whatever you want to call it, I said and waved one hand dismissively. There's a massive complex beneath the city. We've only explored a small part of it, but there's thousands of books and records, some of them dating back to the founding of Hatra. And those are only just the ones we've found. There's more rooms and passageways we haven't been able to explore yet. The library was truly a place we needed more time than we had on hand to explore. None of us could even begin to imagine the secrets such a place held, and it was an adventure I itched to undertake. But, first things first, I needed to make sure my people were safe. The last thing I wanted was a repeat of what happened with the corrupted corpses and Aliona, for someone to be attacked, and for me to be deep underneath the city and out of reach. Did no one truly know about this place? Pyotr murmured half to himself as he looked up at the ceiling of the tent. Such a place must have been the pride and joy of the rulers of Hatra. I can't begin to imagine anyone forgetting about such a treasure. It was sealed, Grandfather. Laika shook her head and her ears perked up. No one had been in there for a thousand years. The secret died with the city. Evan and I found it. Or rather, there was something, some kind of power, that called us to it. I think that's one, if not the main reason why Hatra is being targeted. I nodded as I shuffled the puzzle pieces in place for them. The first day we went searching in the archives, Aliona found a book that held a clue for keeping the miasma at bay. Dragon's blood. Where did you find the Azuras? Daya asked as she ran her hand through her hair. 
Was it right after you found the archive, or a few days later? We set out on the same day to the village, I explained, and reached for one of the clay pitchers of water on the table. Laika and Aliona said it was a few hours away if we ran the whole way, and when we got there, well... Aliona's grip on my hand grew stronger, and I knew she was remembering the destruction of the Azuran village. It hadn't been a pretty sight, although by the time we'd arrived the two older Azuras had already buried the dead. Even so, death lingered in the air, and ash covered everything in sight. There was no escape from the destruction that had touched the Azura's home. The village was scorched, Aliona said, and her voice was tight with restrained emotion. Then we found a summoning circle with the protective ring of dragon's blood trees. Whoever created that circle was an expert. No one would have known until it was too late. Ruslan and I had done our best to destroy the summoning circle, and I'd been given an impromptu lesson on those magical arrays. It had left a deep sort of distaste in my mouth, probably because of the way I'd seen the array being used for destruction and death. After we came back with the survivors and whatever saplings survived, I continued from where Aliona left off, a man came to Hatra. Against Evan and Laika's better judgment, we welcomed him into Hatra. Ruslan added, and there was bitterness in his eyes, but he managed to keep that emotion out of his voice. Though you weren't fond of him either, were you, milady? I gritted my teeth as I remembered the man who called himself Olivier. He'd been the cause of much agony for me. Scholar, he called himself, Aliona said, and her eyes grew cold. He knew too much. His eyes knew too much. And it felt like I was being consumed alive by him. Then a summoning circle appeared inside of Hatra, Julia intoned, and her voice was emotionless. From whence came the army of corrupted corpses and those tainted by the miasma, and the scholar conveniently disappeared. The elder snapped open her fan and fanned herself furiously inside of the tent. Around her, the temperature suddenly dropped, and I could almost see the way her breath misted out. And Milady was attacked inside of the archive at the same time. Like a growled as her hands tightened around the armrests of her chair, and the sound of groaning wood could be heard. The princess? Tion's eyes snapped open wide. What happened? I cannot remember. Aliona's back was still ramrod straight, but she let go of my hand to move a stray lock of hair from her face. All I remember is being forced to retreat into my spiritual sea and fighting for control of it. Something strong enough to force me into deviation had attacked me. I heard shame in Aliona's voice, well disguised, but I had come to know her well. She still carried guilt over falling into deviation phase, and from what Olivier taunted her with, I knew it was a dangerous thing. But Aliona was more than just a potential threat. She wasn't defined by her power and the tightrope she teetered on when it came to her magic. She was beautiful, brave, and kind beyond measure. My asthma covered her and she was comatose for a week. I reached out and grabbed Aliona's hand tightly to reassure her. The sight of Aliona covered in the accursed black smoke would haunt me for a long time. Her entire body had been on the verge of shutting down as her power worked overtime to purify the miasma that coalesced over her. And when she woke up, there was an army at our doorstep. Laika added as she placed her arm around Aliona's shoulders and comforted her. They used her and Evan's presence in Hatra as an excuse to attack the city. Ruslan gritted his teeth and the fur on his ears bristled. They called us worshippers of the Black Dragon and said we'd kidnap the Divine Maiden to use for... voyal purposes. Kidnap the princess? Pyotr shook his head. That's treason of the highest degree. Besides... How would you take her from the Miharedi Mountains all the way south to Hatra, with all the cities and nobles of the sword in between? That would be like having a death wish. It would be difficult to prove she had been kidnapped. Daya mused as she plucked a piece of bread off the table and tore it into bite-sized chunks. But it's a good excuse to lay waste to any city. They said they were from the Green Glass Sect, I said, and glanced around at the table. Does that name ring a bell for anyone? We haven't heard of it, Pyotr hummed thoughtfully as he looked at the two advisors who sat next to him. Have we? Word of such a sect hasn't reached our ears. Tion shook his head as he slipped his arms into his sleeves. Somehow, the name sounds familiar. Aliona frowned and tapped a finger against her lips. 
Like I've read it in an old book when I was a child. Would anyone from the white jade sect know? I asked as I leaned toward Aliona and looked at her troubled face. One of the stewards, or maybe one of the swords. Perhaps, Aliona murmured with a tilt of her head. Maybe we could ask one of the survivors. I glanced over at the elders since I had no idea what had been done with the surviving members of the Green Glass sect, or if there were any survivors left to question. The survivors are currently imprisoned in the brig inside of our airship. Daya's smile was feral as she leaned back into the chair. They have been less than cooperative. Well, maybe we have another option, I muttered, and I bit back a wince as I thought of how Asher slept inside of my spiritual sea. Another option? Pyotr leaned forward with curiosity evident in his voice. What do you mean? I'm really not sure how to explain this, I began. But after I fought with Asher, you know, the leader of the Green Glass Sect's army, I kind of absorbed him. My predation ability developed into an assimilation sort of ability. You mean to say you have Asher inside of you? Ruslan leaned forward and tilted his head in confusion. Don't ever say that again. I groaned as I buried my face in my hands. But yes. Why? Julia asked and tapped her fan against the palm of her hand. What caused your ability to evolve? I think it was because I wanted to help him, I said, but it came out as more of a question than a statement. Again, why? Ruslan blinked at me, and I could tell he was equal parts confused and proud. I shrugged. There was something weird about him. Saying weird wasn't really enough to go by, but I wasn't sure how else to explain it. Excluding the fact that he had an army on our doorstep? Ruslan asked, with a bit of amusement in his voice. And was threatening to tear us apart, limb from limb? It was like he was being controlled by something or someone, I replied, as I remembered the echoing voice and face that overlapped with Asher's during the battle. I could see my asthma coiled around him and his heart like string. That sounds a bit like soul magic, Aliona murmured as she tapped her finger on her lips. Soul magic? I turned to look at the priestess in curiosity. No, no, continue with your story about Asher. Aliona urged as she smiled at me. I can explain soul magic to you later. Um, okay, I said with a confused frown, but I forged on anyway. Well, he's sort of just there, inside of my spiritual sea, or actually, off to a corner of it. I can barely sense him. It's like he's sleeping. As I spoke about the former leader of the invading army, I could barely feel him inside of my spiritual sea. His presence just slept on, and it was barely noticeable like a piece of glass in a snow-ridden valley. I knew he was there, but it was almost like he wasn't, like he was just a ghost I was remembering. There was a part of my power that worked constantly to analyze the miasma attached to him. My predation ability had evolved, or rather, it developed a subclass. Assimilation was the name of it, and the skill had the ability to analyze whatever I consumed and even start researching possible antidotes. I really was learning something new every day. What about the miasma inside of him? Tion asked curiously as he leaned forward and stared at me. Does it affect you in any way? I hadn't thought about that possibility, but I didn't sense any miasma seeping out of Asher and into me. Maybe the miasma couldn't keep up with the strength of predation, or it was my own healing power that kept the darkness at bay and away from me. Whatever it was, it was serving like a hazmat suit, or maybe even a vaccine. It's still there, I tapped the side of my head with my free hand and shrugged. But it's dormant. He's asleep, and the miasma is asleep too. There is danger in that. Aliona hummed as she tilted her head in thought. The miasma and Asher are separate entities, albeit Asher is controlled by the miasma. Asher being asleep in your mind serves as a failsafe. The miasma cannot use him, nor can it get out of him to try and leech onto you. But the moment he wakes up, there is the chance the miasma will take control of him. Aliona's voice trailed off as her eyes lost focus, and she fell into deep thought. Her fingers kept up a steady tapping rhythm on her armrest that the more feral instincts inside of me found entrancing, almost like it was the beating of a drum that would signal the start of a chase. What if Evan continues cultivating his energy? Ruslan asked, and there were sparks of anger in his eyes. So that, no matter what happens, the miasma won't be able to harm him. 
Then I realized it was worry in Ruslan's eyes, not anger. I glanced between him and the other two elders, and I saw they wore the same concern on their faces. Moscow fiddled with his thumbs in nervousness, and Julia was holding on to her ever-present fan so tightly I thought it would snap. Not just cultivating his own energy, Julia interjected as her pale blue eyes glittered with worry. He'll have to spend hours out of the day learning how to control the flow of both earthly and heavenly energy. We have to help him build up enough mental fortitude that the miasma won't be able to do harm, even if it does wake up and attempt to leech onto him. A swell of emotion rose in my chest, and my eyes threatened to water. I hadn't realized how much they'd begun to care for me in such a short period of time. The elders were hundreds of years old, and they'd only known me for less than a month. Yet they were already so concerned about me, someone who wasn't even from their world. Well, I guess it was my world now. I'll be fine, I said as I swallowed back my emotions. I have some awesome teachers, and I'm a pretty quick study. I will help you as well, Aliona promised as she placed one of her hands on mine. Since birth, I have been cultivating both earthly and heavenly energy. I will teach you all that I have been taught by the sages in the Miharedi Mountains. Perhaps this is a good moment? Natalia interrupted as she placed a small wooden box on the table. Perhaps this will help Master Dragon in subduing the miasma within. A thrum of power emanated from the box, and somehow it reminded me of the taste of Aliona's purity. With my mind's eye, I could almost see a pale glow around the box. Is this from the mine? I shifted in my seat as I itched to open the box and hold whatever was inside of it. You've already finished making weapons? We have more at the smithy. Natalia nodded stoically as she sat ramrod straight in her chair. We brought some to show. Weapons? Pyotr asked as he leaned toward the wooden box curiously. Orichalum is a sacred metal guarded by our people. Natalia drew in a steadying breath before she continued speaking. The mine was a gift from the heavens. A star came down and opened a hole in the earth. The star spoke and promised us nothing would hold a candle to the power of the metal. It would be stronger than the scales of any creature and sharper than glass. I know of this metal. Aliona said quietly as she kept her eyes on the box. His eminence has halls full of weapons and armor crafted from it deep in the mountains. He's never allowed anyone to wield any of the weapons, nor wear any of the armor. What he always told me was that they were not for waging war, but for protecting. He speaks truly. Maxim tilted his head as he leaned back in his chair. We Azuras once used that gift for ill. We rampaged across the land until the Lord of the White Jade Sect stopped us. Ashura's rampaging? <laughs> Daya snorted as she shook her head. I've never heard of that in any records. You've all been a peaceful lot. I doubt any of you would have even attacked a small settlement if provoked. You are wrong. Natalia's eyes shifted, and there was an ancient knowledge deep within them. This was before the breach opened and the netherworld collided with our own, allowing for devils and demons to seep in and wreak havoc. I realized then just how little I truly knew about the Azuras. I'd thought they were a quiet people who'd always lived in the forest near Hatra. This evidently wasn't the case. They had a far deeper and richer history than I'd previously imagined. I wanted to learn so much more, and there was so much treasure dripping from Natalia's lips as she fed us information, tidbit by tidbit, about her people and the holy metal. Before the breach? Laika's eyes were wide as she stared at Natalia in awe. That would have been more than five thousand years ago. Is this recorded down anywhere? I asked and thought of the ancient histories Aunt Emma always spoke of. It can't just be the Azuras who remember this. I prayed it wasn't just the Azuras who had this knowledge. Otherwise, so much of it was lost with the attack on their village. If the Azuras had such deep knowledge of things kept secret from the rest of Rama, then their fall would be equivalent to the burning of the Library of Alexandria. It was. Natalia inclined her head in Aliona's direction and smiled softly. His eminence is not the only one who remembers. The princess has honored the pact between us. The knowledge and history of the Azuras isn't lost, Aliona explained, and her gemstone eyes glittered as she smiled. 
There are slabs of jade, small enough to fit in your hand, sent to Azuras every time an Azuran child is born. Knowledge and information can be stored inside of those jade slips, and there are linked copies of each of them in the various safe houses the White Jade Sect guards as fail-safes in case of widespread destruction. If there's some cataclysmic event, and all governing powers in this world are toppled, all the knowledge of this world won't be lost. It will be there for future generations to use. That's fucking awesome, I breathed out as I leaned back in my chair. The jade slabs opened up a realm of possibilities in regards to the flow of information in Inati and how I'd be able to learn things quickly. While I didn't fully know how they were used or formed, I knew Aliona would fill me in on the details if I asked. As it was, we'd gotten sidetracked from the main point, the box with the weapons crafted by Natalia. I leaned forward and reached out to lift the lid of the box, and then I gasped when I did. Are they to your liking, Master Dragon? (laughs) Natalia laughed, and her voice was smug. In the box was a set of nine exquisitely crafted daggers that glowed with an inner light. The hilts of each were set with moonstones, and carvings of ferocious dragons curled around the gem. Along the length of the scabbards was also a soaring dragon surrounded by clouds and stars. How long did it take you to make these? I breathed out as I traced one finger along the beautiful scabbard. They're gorgeous. Not long. Perhaps a week in all. Natalia hummed and tilted her head in thought. Twenty swords, one thousand arrowheads, and thirty more daggers in total. And you did this alone? Tion blinked at the Azura, and shock was evident in his face. Aye, Natalia replied, but she gave no explanation as to her speed or prowess. Master Dragon, take one of the daggers and tell me how it feels. A jolt of pure power ran through me when I lifted one of the daggers from the box and slid it out of its scabbard. The metal of the blade was sleek and smooth with no visible imperfections, but I didn't know much about blades to begin with. Almost instantly, a soothing energy coursed through my body and settled in my spiritual sea. The energy was an ocean of calm that swept away my worries and soothed my own power down from the anxious height I hadn't even noticed it had risen to. It feels almost like I'm back in the River Moonstone house, I murmured as I balanced the blade in my hand. There's power in the dagger, but it's calming and soothing, like a blanket of armor around me and my mind. That is the power of the metal. Natalia nodded at my words as a wide smile crept onto her face. Can you keep up this production and make a storehouse? I asked, and my mind moved rapidly from idea to idea. I know you said this isn't for war, that it's to be used to protect. So we'll do just that. Can this be added onto the walls? No, the gates. Can you forge gates from this? If this metal truly was stronger than anything else in this world, that would make the walls of Hatra impossible to breach. Julia was already studying the enchantments that had been added onto the aqueducts, and we'd just have to figure out how to layer enchantments and the metal onto the walls. Aliona could help us with the enchantments, and I knew her power and knowledge would be invaluable in the rebuilding of Hatra. There is enough, yes. Natalia hummed in thought, and she tapped her armrest. But I will need more help in the forge. Elder Ruslin has been helping me as I teach him the ways of the sacred metal, but we would need more hands. We will need more space as well. I glanced at the elders, and they nodded in agreement. Whatever you need, you shall have it. Julia snapped open her fan and fanned herself. We can draw up schematics for expanding the smithy, and we'll recruit more hands for help. Are there any among the Blue Tree Guild with smithing experience? Some, but mainly for repairing and maintaining weapons, Tion replied with a grimace. That would be enough. Natalia's amber eyes glittered with excitement as she leaned forward. I can teach. They will learn quickly. Natalia, the rest of these daggers, do you mind if I take them? I asked as my eyes dropped to the other eight daggers in the box in front of me. Master Dragon, it would be my honor. Natalia clasped her hands in front of her and inclined her head. The dagger in my hands was the only one I was going to keep. I was going to give the other eight daggers away to the people I wanted to protect. Two would definitely be given to Ilya and Ilyushina, 
I didn't want any harm to come to the youngest Azuras, and while I wasn't exactly happy about giving them weapons, they needed to have protection. With my mind made up, I stood and grabbed the box. Then I walked toward the three elders and offered the contents to them. Elders of Hatra, my voice was strong and sure as I spoke. I offer each of you a dagger made of this sacred metal. You are the living history and symbols of the city. If there are any who should wield these holy blades, it is you three. It is our honor to accept this gift. Ruslan stood and placed his hands on my shoulders. We shall wield them wisely. Julia and Moskal also stood, and pride made their eyes gleam as they placed their hands on my shoulders as well. Ruslan was the first to pick a dagger out of the box, and he hummed thoughtfully as he balanced the blade in his hand. I saw you craft these, Natalia, Ruslan said as he glanced at the Azura, who seemed almost nervous. They are beautifully made, and the balance is perfection itself. Natalia let out a small breath I hadn't even realized she was holding in. Thank you, Elder Ruslan. Julia was the next one to choose a dagger from the box, and she tossed the blade in the air before she caught it swiftly in the palm of her hand. A fine creation indeed, she murmured as she slipped the dagger into its scabbard and then into her orange robe. The intricacy of the etchings on these are exquisite, Moskal added as he plucked one dagger from the wooden box, balanced it in his hand, and smiled. I moved from the elders to where Aliona and Laika remained seated, and their eyes glittered with curiosity as they stared at the metal. Aliona and Laika had been my allies since the moment I arrived in this world. They'd fought alongside me and burrowed deep into my heart. Courageous Laika was a brilliant warrior, and I hoped this weapon would serve to protect her in every battle she stalked into. For Aliona, although I'd only seen her in combat once, I hoped the divine power inside of the dagger would augment her own purity as a priestess. To those of you who have fought by my side, in the defense of this city, my comrades and friends who I trust with all of my heart and soul, I intoned as I held out the blades to them, may they serve you well. I am honored to be your comrade. Laika stood and clasped her hands in front of her before she picked up a dagger. I will wield this with pride and bring honor to us all. The wolf warrior tied the dagger onto one of the belts that hung low around her hips, and the silver metal gleamed brightly in contrast against the dark leathers Laika wore. Aliona stood from her seat, and my heart thudded loudly in my chest as the princess knelt. She clasped her hands in front of her, and for a moment, the color of her eyes shifted from amethyst to silver. I thank you for this gift, and this trust that you bear in me. Aliona's voice echoed in the tent as she spoke, layered over with the whispering of voices that weren't hers. I shall use this in the defense of this land, and to cut out the evil that has taken root. The moment Aliona placed her hand on the dagger, there was a spike of visible power in the tent. It was a wall of energy that rose up not just from the blade, but from Aliona as well. Sigils ran up her arms and shone silver just as the dagger glowed so brightly it was like a sun that threatened to blind all of us. I squeezed my eyes shut to shield myself from the light, and as I did so, I felt a disturbance in the fabric of reality. When I opened my eyes again, the weapon in the priestess's hands was gone. Aliona had used spatial magic to hide the dagger away. What the fuck happened? I blinked furiously as I tried to get the spots to clear out of my vision. The metal reacted to the princess's power. Natalia explained quickly as she walked to where Aliona stood. The blade is divine, and so is the princess. Natalia, that's the why of what just happened, not the what. I rubbed at my sore eyes as spots still danced in my vision. Fuck, I still can't see straight. This was one moment where having enhanced eyesight sucked. The dagger greeted me, Aliona explained quietly as she sat back down. My power responded in turn, and the dagger was bonded to me. You felt power when you first touched your dagger, did you not? Yeah, it was comforting. I blinked as the dots finally faded from my vision. Felt pretty familiar, actually. That was just what happened with me, but simply on a larger scale. Aliona said, and her hands fidgeted in her lap as she kept her eyes on the table. Aliona's explanation seemed like it was lacking to me, and I wondered if the reaction had more to do with her immortal body and her power. 
I'd seen galaxies swirl in her eyes more than once, and I remembered how Natalia explained the legend was that a star had come down from the heavens and given the Azuras the mine. There were secrets in Aliona's blood, but I wouldn't push her for those answers. I trusted she would tell me in due time. I moved from Aliona and stood in front of Pyotr. There was one dagger left without an owner in the wooden box, and I planned for it to go to him. While I'd only spoken with the older wolf maybe once before, and that was during the midst of battle, I wanted there to be a solid understanding of friendship and not just a political alliance between us. I offer this dagger to you as proof of Hatra's friendship and trust in the Blue Tree Guild, I declared, and my voice was steady as I nodded at the dark-eyed wolf. Pyotr stood and stared at me for one long moment before he broke out into a wide smile. I gratefully accept this proof of our friendship. Pyotr lifted one of the daggers and tied it onto one of his belts. The Blue Tree Guild shall defend Hatra until its last breath, and we will plant roots here in this city. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding and returned to my seat with the box in my lap. There had been a niggling doubt in my mind as to whether or not the rest of the Blue Tree Guild had agreed with Laika's decision to settle in Hatra, but that seemed to be okay. Hopefully... There and Aliona's presence in Hatra would deter anyone from attacking the city for a while. I hope such drastic measures won't happen any time soon, I said, and a frown crossed my face as I realized something. Wait, is there anyone or anywhere else near the city we should worry about? Daya? Pyotr turned to the mistress of war next to him and raised an eyebrow. The fox warrior slipped her hand through the air, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up as she pulled out a pile of scrolls using spatial magic. Then she spread open one of the maps and motioned me over to look closely. I stood and leaned over to look at the map. There were six land masses on the page, and Rama was on the largest of the continents. If I compared it to maps from back on Earth, it was the size of Europe and Asia combined. The country of Rama took up a good third of the continent, and none of the other twenty countries were even close to Rama's size. Damn! I let out a low whistle. I didn't realize how large Rama is! The closest in size was the country of Ogrines on the northeastern border of Rama, but even then it had only a third of the landmass. It is a sizable kingdom, Aliona agreed, and I realized she stood to inherit a pretty good chunk of the world. Wait, what's that? I asked as my eyes drifted to the large red splotch on the map that stretched from the eastern edge of the continent nearly to the western edge. That's the breach. Daya tapped the map with her finger and traced the length of the red splotch. Rama, Ogrine, Ska, and Troas are the only countries that share a border with it, but the breach reaches out to the ocean. Its tainted waters reach the coastlines of Offer, Udri, and Zostia. I shook my head in wonder. The breach was immense. It was nearly the size of a country, and I wondered how many people it had swallowed up. What about near Hatra? I tore my gaze from the breach and found the small dot of our city near the western desert. Are there any cities that could pose an issue? None that come to mind. Daya shifted and sat on the table as she traced a wide perimeter around Hatra. Even at a fast pace, it'll take a week to reach any civilized village or city, and no lord would risk traveling through the desert or around the Crimson Canyons and wake the wrath of the Crimson Dragon. They're more worried about any possible skirmishes with bandits or demons. I winced at the thought of the dragon I'd encountered once already. What about border skirmishes with other countries? I was curious as to why Daya hadn't mentioned any political instability, but maybe Inadi was calmer on that front than most worlds. Only the breach is keeping other countries from outwardly attacking us. Aliona explained bitterly as she stood and traced the breach with one delicate finger. Only Rama's armies and his eminence are stationed at the breach, even though it threatens all of our world. Because of that, the other kingdoms know militarily attacking us is out of the question, even if they were strong enough for it. The threat of mutually assured destruction keeps most of the vultures at bay. Vultures? I asked, and wondered at the bitterness in the usually sweet Aliona's voice. Perhaps that's insulting to vultures, comparing those poor birds to them. Aliona smiled wryly as she leaned on the table. Rama is mostly self-sufficient, but the other countries raise taxes on any of our traveling citizens and impose ridiculous tariffs. We are wealthy, 
but taxing us to even breathe foreign air. There is also the matter of segregation in the foreign kingdoms. Laika added as her ears fell flat on her head and her fur bristled. Demi-humans are ostracized and even enslaved in some of those countries. What? Anger spiked inside of me, and the wood under my hands splintered with the sudden pressure. There's slavery in Anati? Which countries? I couldn't believe it. Actually, I didn't want to believe it, but it made sense. Even if it was a world of magic, there would still be the same cruelty found back on Earth. The only countries other than Rama that don't practice segregation to an extent are few. Aliona explained as she looked away from the map to the ceiling of the tent. The lands of Ska, Odrain, Troas, and Ogrines are the only ones I can think of. I clenched my fists as I listened to Aliona list the four other countries that weren't entirely cruel and hopeless. This was ridiculous, and I would do whatever I could to change it once Hatra was safe. I didn't care how long it would take me. What about the survivors from the battle? I asked. Could the Green Glass sect have gathered their army of adventurers from any of those cruel countries? Maybe they could tell me where they came from and why they attacked us. I knew Asher had been corrupted by miasma, but what about the others? Well, there's about 70 of them, and they've been quite uncooperative. Daya's grin was vicious as she looked up from the map. Though I wouldn't be quite happy if I was inside of the Blue Tree Guild brig. Take me to them, I ordered. I didn't know if I'd be of any help, but it wouldn't hurt to try. Chapter 3 Daya led our small group to the area outside of the city walls where the airship was docked, and my mouth dropped open at the sight in front of me. Holy shit! I breathed as my eyes widened. The airship of the Blue Tree Guild was as immense as I remembered it. The ship was the size of an aircraft carrier back on Earth. Seamless mahogany wood formed the hull of the airship, and there were no planks or nails I could see along its length. A ramp of the same mahogany wood led from the ground to a great gate in the center of the hull. With my enhanced senses, I could hear the clamor of people running around in the airship and chatting away. I couldn't help but wonder just what it was like to live and travel on this massive ship. It was the strangest mode of transportation I could have imagined, but also the coolest. Impressive, is she not? Daya smirked as she strode forward in the direction of the ramp. We have a level dedicated entirely toward training our guild members and maintaining our combat abilities. There is also our archives and library that span an entire level. We do have a stable yard, so to speak, on board, as well as smaller airships near the storage levels. Much of her is unused, but she served well in times of disasters when we've been contracted to evacuate cities. Now, follow me to the brig. It isn't far. Well, relatively speaking. Quick to enter, but difficult to get out of. I glanced at Laika and Pyotr as they murmured to each other behind the group. Laika's ears were flat on her head, and she was scowling as her grandfather spoke. You're going to be left behind. Julia tugged on my sleeve and led me into the airship behind the two advisors. Out of everyone who'd been at the first council meeting, only Julia and I accompanied the Blue Tree Guild members to their airship. Ruslan left with Natalia to the smithy to see just how much they would need to expand, and Maxim and Moskol went off to find Afra and the healing herbs she'd brought back from the river. As for Aliona, she'd said she wanted to look through the archives. I'd been hesitant about her going down there alone again after what had happened with the miasma, but she'd promised to take someone down with her so she wouldn't be alone. So it was just Julia and I with the Blue Tree Guild members. We were led through mahogany-framed passageways, and I felt we were traveling toward the bottom of the ship, close to where it touched down on the ground. This is our humble brig, Daya said as she placed her hand on a thick door of steel engraved with runic circles and sigils. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and I took in a deep breath as the door opened. At least a hundred cells lined the large space on either side, with a little under half of them full and in the center of the hall were five demi-humans standing around a bloodied prisoner. The prisoner wasn't tied down, but they were curled into a fetal position as a dark blue light crackled over their body, and there was a runic circle carved into the metal beneath them. What are you doing to them? I asked as I stared in shock at what was happening in front of me. 
I'd seen horrible things as an EMT, but I'd never seen a person be broken down to this extent. What torture is this? Julia's fingers dug tightly into my arm as her breathing quickened. They've done nothing to deserve this. What happened to the honor of war accorded to survivors? Grandfather ordered for the prisoners to be interrogated. Laika intoned and clenched her jaw as her tail hung limply behind her. The mages are simply following Grandfather's orders and forcing their way into the prisoner's mind. I turned my attention to the prisoner on the floor and realized it was a girl underneath all of that grime. She couldn't have been any older than Laika, and her pale blue hair covered her face as she writhed and screamed on the ground. It was a horrible sound, a death rattle that echoed throughout the brig. She was dressed in rags, and blood covered her body, so I focused on her and searched for any wounds. Classification, snake demihuman. Condition, fractured mind, shattered ribcage, and internal bleeding detected. Priority, immediate healing required. Danger, in danger of dying. Status, critical. I knew she'd been part of the force that attacked Hatra, and a part of me was perfectly fine with what she was being put through. In fact, it wanted even worse to be done to her. But that was the dragon side of me, and I knew I was slowly changing to become more ruthless. The part of me that was still Evan, the EMT, didn't agree with this. But I wasn't the same Evan anymore. I couldn't just go around spouting out about the Geneva Convention when this was a world where torture was considered normal. This was a new world, and I was a new being. Still, there were other ways to get information out of a person that worked far better than pain ever could. From drugs that loosened one's tongue, to mental manipulation, those could be trusted more than a pain-induced false confession. Anyone would do or say anything to get the pain to end. Stop! I commanded as I stalked toward the mages. You won't get anything out of her like this! She can't even talk! Daya and Tion looked at me with curiosity in their eyes as the mages glanced between them and me. Continue with the interrogation, Daya ordered as she leaned against a wall. These prisoners would have murdered and tortured all the people of Hatra. Pyotr shook his head in disbelief as he looked at me. Why do you have any sympathy for them? Because they're still people, I replied as I pointed at the broken prisoner. But more importantly, breaking them down like this won't give us answers we can trust. They might even lie just for the torture to stop. This is the way things are. Pyotr lifted his chin as he crossed his arms in front of his chest. This world is a brutal and lethal one. Passiveness and mercy can and will get you killed. Answers are what we need. Answers these prisoners can give us. I understand that, but you aren't getting any answers from them like this. I shook my head and turned toward Laika. Laika, stop this and let me try to talk to them. Torturing them isn't working. My way might work. Laika clenched her fists at her side as the snake demi-human thrashed and screamed in front of us. The she-wolf's ears lay flat on her head and the muscles in her jaw twitched as she stared at the ground. Laika, this is madness! Julia pleaded as she stared at the tortured girl in front of us. Stop this! Don't listen to them, child, Pyotr interrupted as he placed his hands on Laika's shoulders. You know this is the only way to get answers. Laika, you know doing this won't work, I said with a frown. She's dying, and none of us will get any answers if she dies. A tense, silent moment stretched on in the brig, broken only by the girl's screams of agony. Then Laika snapped her head up, and a fire burned brightly in her gray eyes. I command you to stop! Like a snarled as she broke away from her grandfather and stood in front of the mages. By my rights as guild leader and clan leader, I order you to cease and desist. No further mind invasions are to take place, so do I command. The dark blue light around the snake demihuman dissipated as the mages stepped away from her. Without hesitation, I ran to the girl, and Julia followed behind me. Blood dribbled from the girl's crimson-stained mouth and nose as her whole body shook as if she were possessed. It was time to play good cop. Calm down, you're safe now, I whispered to the girl as I placed my hand on her forehead. If you can hear me, I'm going to heal you now. The moment I touched the girl, she screamed shrilly and tried to back away from me, but Julia was on the other side of her. Then, the elder gently but firmly held the girl down so she wouldn't hurt herself. I'll calm her. 
Power swirled in Julia's hands as the girl grew limp in her arms. Quickly now, Evan! I pulled my healing power up from the very center of me as the scales on my arms multiplied. Then the magic shimmered in my hands in a glittering kaleidoscope of color which I poured into the girl, and I focused on healing her body as I ignored the faint arguing behind me. Ever so carefully, I guided bones to mend and flesh to stitch itself back together. The brutality of war had left its mark on the girl, and it read a savage story. I could see old wounds and scars heal under my guidance, and I knew whatever life she led before she'd been brought to fight at Hatra, it had not been an easy one. Suddenly, a door slammed behind me, and I sensed people had left the brig, but I wasn't sure who'd left until I could look. A minute later, my work was done. Her body is healed, I murmured as I glanced up at Julia and leaned back for some air. I'll take her back to the city and see what we can do for her mind. Julia cradled the snake girl gently to her chest as she looked down at the other cells. I followed her gaze and frowned. How many were just in this same condition? Although it had been less than a week since the attack on Hatra, the snake girl still bore wounds from the battle. I doubted the survivors had been given anything more than some simple first aid by the guild members. From the earlier argument and the way I'd come to understand how this world functioned, resources couldn't and wouldn't be wasted on potential enemies. You're a strange one, Master Dragon. Daya's voice punctured the silence in the room. Healing and caring for the enemy. I turned to look at the guild's mistress of war and saw she was the only other guild member left in the room. They're no longer the enemy. My jaw clenched as I stood and walked to the first cell. I don't specifically care for torture one way or the other. I want results, so we will try a different method now. Inside of the cell were about ten prisoners. Their armor varied from leather to metal, but they all had one thing in common. They were completely bloody and battered. All but one of the prisoners were pressed up against the wall and averted their gaze from me. The only one who didn't look away from my eyes was a man with a broken and bloodied leg stretched out in front of him. There was pure ice in his crimson eyes as he lifted his chin at me. His body was tense and I could pick out the veins on his neck. It was obvious to me he was afraid for the others in the cell with him and that he would do anything to protect them, just as I would do anything to protect my own family. That would be my leverage. I glanced down at his leg and frowned at the shattered limb. I hoped there were no bone shards floating around in his bloodstream. That would make things difficult and dangerous for the man if he developed a fat embolism. Still, it was rare on earth for that to happen, but he'd been without treatment for a few days now. I almost dreaded summoning up his status information, but I did it anyway. Classification, Crow Demihuman. Condition, shattered leg, bruised ribcage, no internal bleeding detected. Broken bone shards detected in circulatory system. Priority. Immediate healing required. Danger. In danger of permanent crippling leading up to death. Status. Critical. Bone shards in the bloodstream and a fat embolism meant death if left untreated. I can help you, I began as I gathered my healing power in my hands. So you can kill us afterward? The crow demihuman laughed as he raised one black eyebrow. No. Even if you heal us, you won't have our trust. You're just like the rest of them. We'd rather die with dignity. I didn't kill your comrade, I explained softly as my power shimmered over the prisoners. I healed her body, and one of our elders is going to heal her mind. The prisoners looked up at my words, startled by the fact the snake demihuman was still alive and by the glittering power that healed them instead of killing them. After healing all the prisoners, I stood in the hallway outside of the brig. Julia had already left with the snake girl in her arms while I tended to the others. They'd been in better condition than the snake girl, and that had been a relief. Even so, I couldn't stay in the airship anymore. I'd had enough, and we wouldn't get any answers from anyone today. I was upset, and I was angry at this world that forced everyone to be so cruel to each other. But I couldn't blame the Blue Tree Guild members when they were a product of their environment. I was the one who needed to adapt to this new world and find a middle ground that wouldn't have me abandoning all of my morals. I had to learn how to live in the gray area of morality and move away from the mentality of everything being so neatly black and white. 
I was going to have to learn to be a dragon that was once a human. Where are you going? Daya asked as she leaned on the doorframe and blinked lazily at me. I need somewhere quiet to think. My voice echoed in the quiet hallway, and we were completely alone. More quiet than this? Daya snorted softly as she shook her head. You look ill at ease, Master Dragon. What troubles you? I buried my hands in my sleeves and clasped them tightly. How could I explain I felt pity for the survivors imprisoned in the brig while a part of me wanted to rip their throats out? How could I explain my new body was changing my mind and that I knew I should be fearful, but I was only excited about what I was becoming? So many of their comrades died, all for the whims of some mysterious master. A muscle in my jaw throbbed as I remembered the chaos of the battlefield from the night the Green Glass Sect army attacked Hatra. A part of me hates them for what they did, but another part of me wants to help them. If you draw your sword... Daya smiled viciously as she spoke. You must be prepared to die. You must wield your weapon on the battlefield with honor, for either you live or you die. You come from another world, Master Dragon, but this is our world you are in now. It is a world of pain and suffering for those who do not have power. And these people? Their hearts may yet beat, but they died the moment they lost the battle. This wasn't right. This wasn't why I had become an EMT back on Earth. What was the use of power if I couldn't save people? I didn't know if this bloodthirsty mistress of war would understand my reasoning, but I didn't fight just to kill or because I needed to have power. I fought to protect what was important to me. Then I'll protect my people, I declared. If it meant protecting the entire world, I would do it, even if it meant fighting the evil sect's tooth and nail. Treat them well, and in a few days I'll come back to talk to them. See if I can build up some camaraderie with them. Daya nodded silently, and that was the end of the conversation. I walked from the airship to the half-forgotten garden by the ruins of the Lunar Palace. Ivy ran amuck within the garden, and it covered the remains of walls and benches. At the center of the garden was a pavilion, made out of a seamless piece of blue stone, and in that pavilion was the marble statue of a woman. Ruslan hadn't told me who she was, and I hadn't bothered to ask him. I doubted he would know exactly who she was, since the stone felt ancient under my fingertips as I touched the cool marble that formed her cheek. She was a beautiful woman, and for a moment I imagined she was the moon princess who built Hatra. I wondered what the princess would think of what had happened to her beautiful city, destroyed and laid to waste by demons after she'd left. What would you do? I murmured to the statue as a breeze rustled through the garden. Would you destroy everything in your path to protect Hatra? Throw aside your humanity and everything that makes you who you are, all for the sake of your precious people? There was no reply from the statue, and she continued to look mournfully at me. It was as if that was her reply, that she had no humanity to give up for Hatra. After all, like Aliona told me during my first night in the city, the Moon Princess left Hatra after her husband was murdered by the very people she'd sworn to protect. I shook my head and bent to press the stone at the statue's base that would open the passageway to the River Moonstone House. With a groan, the stone floor of the pavilion shifted. Just as the staircase came into view, I took a step down and felt the calming energy of the chamber start to work on me. The tight ball of tension in my stomach began to dissipate, and I breathed a sigh of relief. It was quiet inside of the River Moonstone House, and I found the silence to be deafening as I took a seat in the center of the hall. I closed my eyes and slowed my breathing. With each breath I took, I imagined it flowing throughout the entirety of my body, and as I exhaled, I expelled all my worries and doubts. Everything flowed out of me, from the thoughts of the water demons and the niggling fear of the possibility of the miasma returning, to the quiet longing I had for returning back to Earth. Every day worry of how Aunt Emma was doing, and if she was heartbroken over my disappearance, lingered in the back of my mind. Deep inside of my heart, I knew I wouldn't be returning home any time soon. I'd promised to protect the city of Hatra, and I always fulfilled my promises no matter how long it took me to. Suddenly, my mind plunged deep into my spiritual sea, and the world shifted around me. 
I was no longer just inside of the River Moonstone House, but diving into the essence of who I was. This voyage wasn't the smooth path I'd traveled when Ruslan had guided me to cultivate my predation ability, so I could harness the power of stone I'd gained from killing stone giants. No, this journey was much different. Darkness swam around me, and stars sparkled as they orbited me at an incredible speed while I fought to stay on the path to who I was. Comets appeared out of nowhere, and I ducked as their fiery tails just missed me. I could smell burnt hair and knew it had been a close call. Finding out if I was fireproof or not was not on my to-do list right now, though it would eventually have to come up. Especially if that crimson dragon from the canyon ever came up again. A shudder went down my back and through my mind, but I wasn't sure if it was from pleasure or from fear. The dragon had been a fearsome creature, and I knew she wasn't someone I could take in a fight right now, but fuck if she wasn't gorgeous in her human form. As quickly as the thought of the Crimson Dragon came, it was chased away by the thought of Aliona and Laika. There was a flash of tanned thighs in my mind, and I bit down on my cheek. Then I tasted blood as the path underneath my feet disappeared and the darkness swarmed around me again. I was lost inside of my spiritual sea, the very essence of who I was, and my power washed over me. Memories drifted over me and pulled me into a current of emotions that fueled my passion, my rage, and my sorrow. It was in a corner of my turbulent spiritual sea that I finally found Asher. Strings hung from black globs near his feet and head, leaving him suspended in the air, and a tar-like substance dripped from the strings wrapped around Asher's body. Blood mingled with the tar, and every droplet of blood sizzled as it fell from Asher's wounds and into the globs of corruption. I reached forward to try and rip the miasma-imbued strings from Asher's body, but the moment my hand touched the strings, blood bubbled up from my mouth, and I choked on it as I desperately tried to remain calm. Bright crimson blood flew from my lips as I coughed and coughed, and an aching pain filled my body as piercing screams echoed throughout my spiritual sea. Heat burned my face as the screams became shriller and shriller while my mind tried to break free from whatever was trying to attack me. An ancient presence pressed down on my mind, and I gasped for air while blood filled my mouth with every passing moment. There was no escape from the presence or the blood, and it grew while the screams drowned out every conscious thought in my mind. Pain and an endless abyss of flame and brimstone. Blood dripped down my face from my lips, and I was crying tears of blood as I stared down at the waters of my mind. Slowly, they changed from pure azure to tepid black tinged with crimson blood. The waters churned, and waves crashed behind me as a sudden roaring grew underneath the screams. Everything broke open underneath me, and the water gave way to a burning abyss where I knew everything that was good came to die. It was just never-ending agony and pain— if hell had a face, this would be it. What seemed like claws latched onto my body, and they tore at my flesh as if they were eager to consume me and my power. I struggled to gather my power and try to break free, but I could only hear that ancient presence laugh at me. Fuck you! I gasped out as blood dribbled down from my mouth. Fuck you, whatever you are! I'm going to find you, and I'm going to make you pay! Anger and pain was the only thing that coursed through my body, the only thing I could focus on in this world that had solely become comprised of misery and anguish. It was like all I'd ever known was this horrible existence, and there was never anything wonderful about life. Why was I even fighting it so hard? Wouldn't it just be so much easier to sleep and give up? I leaned against the darkness and felt as cold tendrils reached out to wrap around me. Evan! A strong voice suddenly called out in the darkness of my mind. For a moment, I thought I'd imagined the voice, but I hadn't. Out of the corner of my eye was a small crimson fox with a crescent moon on its forehead. It snarled and gnawed at the darkness that embraced me. Why was there a fox? I looked down at the creature in confusion as the darkness tightened around me. Do I know you? I tiredly asked the fox as it dodged the darkness. Why are you fighting so hard? Won't it be easier to just go to sleep? This isn't you, the fox growled as it tore apart one of the tendrils latched onto me. You'd never give up. What about your promise? Promise? What promise? I don't know you, 
I paused and furrowed my brow. Who am I? The waters of my mind stirred, and the world around us shook as the crevices became smaller. I frowned as I tried to remember why I was here and why the darkness had been so welcoming when I'd been so disgusted by it earlier. Had I been disgusted? It hurt me, didn't it? You're the one all of Hatra's hopes and dreams rest on, the fox said as it suddenly began to glow and the light chased away the darkness. You're my son. A cascade of memories came pouring into my mind, from growing up on Earth with my Aunt Emma to coming to the world of Inati. I saw the galaxies that swirled in Aliona's eyes and the stars that came down like meteors at her command, and I remembered Laika slaughtering water demons in a mesmerizing dance with her swords. Behind me, a city carved out of bluestone rose up and glowed with an inner light. An endless list of names flowed through me, and then I came to my name. My name is Evan, I murmured to the darkness in front of me. That's right! The fox jumped onto my shoulder and nuzzled its head against my cheek. And what are you? I'm a dragon, and this darkness has no control over me, I snarled as I reached out with my claws to slice away the darkness that held me. Everything fell away from me, the darkness, and Asher, and I opened my eyes to the marble ceiling of the River Moonstone house. What happened? I groaned as I rolled onto my back and rubbed at my eyes. You had your first experience with not only the demons of your heart, but the demons that plague Asher as well, Ruslan explained as he sat down next to me and placed a cool cloth on my forehead. And I think you might have fought against the miasma. You called me your son. I paused as I turned my head to look at Ruslan. Why? The fox demi-humid smiled down kindly at me. Because I want you to be my heir, Ruslan said as he placed his hand on my head. I want to trust you with my hopes and dreams, to have you one day be lord of Hatra. Your heir? I blinked at the older man and sat up. You want me to inherit Hatra? I could understand where the fox was coming from. After all, I'd saved Hatra a few times already. But still, it was a surprise. I do. Ruslan ruffled my hair for a moment as he grinned. If you agree to this, there would be an adoption that would add my blood to yours. You would have Hatra's blood running through your veins, and no one in this country would be able to take that away from you, even if they dared to try. I believe you can lead Hatra back to greatness. No, you'll lead Hatra to even greater heights than she's ever reached. I grinned at his words. Ruslan was right, and I didn't doubt I could lead Hatra to the likes of glory no one has ever before seen. I had the advantage of being from Earth. I had knowledge no one in this world ever had, and part of it came from all the time I'd spent gaming. I had the benefit of fighting thousands of battles over and over again without dying. I could see the errors I and other players made so I could learn from those mistakes and not make them. I knew how to make life-or-death decisions. I'd been an EMT and studying to be a doctor. People trusted me to save them and to take care of them because I was good at that. Also, I was a fucking dragon that had the power to steal magical abilities from the enemies I killed. Of course he wanted me to take over the care of his city, but this wasn't a decision I should make in a split second. I'm really honored by all of this, I began as I glanced back at Ruslan, but I need some more time to think about this. I'd gone from being Evan the EMT to Evan the Dragon, and now I had the chance to be Lord Evan. What would I be after that? King Evan? Emperor Evan? The Dragon Emperor? I kind of like the sound of that. Chapter 4 I stayed in the River Moonstone house for a long time after Ruslan left, mostly just thinking. Would being adopted by the fox demi-human mean I'd be giving up any hope of finding a way back home to Earth and Aunt Emma? Would this be trampling on the memory of those who raised me? Throughout my childhood, I never had a father figure, but I turned out just fine without one. My mother and my aunt had done everything in their power to raise me, and they were the ones who taught me right from wrong and that kindness was never a weakness. The only way to truly be strong was to be as soft as water, and I'd lived my life according to that motto. But other than my only surviving family, I'd never had help from anyone else. But I wasn't alone in this world, just as I wasn't entirely alone back on Earth. 
This was a new world where I had awesome powers. I was a fucking dragon for fuck's sake. Adventure was everywhere around me, and I'd met beautiful women who fought by my side, and one of them was even a divine princess who was in love with me. There was so much in this new world for me, but what would it cost? Would I never see Aunt Emma again? Was she in a police station praying for any news of me and wondering what had happened to me? I shook my head to clear my mind of all these thoughts and questions. I couldn't stay in this marble hall for long since Hatra wasn't going to be rebuilt and flourish again overnight. We'd all have to work ourselves to the bone first, not to mention we'd have to prepare for the representative of the White Jade sect who would be arriving to inspect both the city and Aliona's welfare. While there wasn't a time frame for the representative's arrival, the attack by the Green Glass sect had proved we couldn't keep pushing self-defense training back. With a population of around 200 now, not counting the hundreds of the Blue Tree Guild, we'd have to be able to stand up to whatever threat faced Hatra. With that said, I needed to check up on the self-defense training of the villagers, which had been long overdue. If I remembered right, the training would be taking place outside of the infirmary in case anyone was injured while learning the defensive moves. The walk from the River Moonstone House was a quick one, since I was able to avoid anyone in my path simply by jumping up on the rooftops and traveling across the city that way. I couldn't believe the sun was still high in the sky with everything that had happened today. Honestly, I thought I'd been inside of the River Moonstone House and my spiritual sea for days. A shudder went down my spine as I remembered the toxic sensation of the tendrils. I couldn't even begin to imagine how Asher lived with that thing inside of him. For the short period of time I'd touched it, the miasma had made me feel like I was in a living hell, and I was continuously dying. There was no point in living or fighting after touching that, and all I could do just to keep a semblance of sanity was to give in. I came to a stop on the flat roof of the infirmary and looked down at the full square. There were at least fifty people down there in neat lines as they followed the movements of the Blue Tree Guild warriors and what they were practicing looked similar to Shaolin Kung Fu, with its almost hypnotic movements. At the very front of the group was young Ilya, and I couldn't help the fond smile that grew on my face as I watched him practice. Other children surrounded him, but he was clearly the youngest and the smallest in the group. Even so, his movements were the most fluid, and I remembered I'd promised him I would teach him how to be strong. I wasn't sure what I could teach him, though. I hadn't been able to help Asher, and I'd almost fallen into the darkness myself. How could I help him if I couldn't even help myself to begin with? Ilya looked up at the moment and cast his brightest smile at me. Then he waved at me as he turned away from one of the warriors who was guiding him in the proper movements. I waved back at the little Azura, and I felt one of the burdens in my heart lift. A teenage fox demi-human with his crimson hair tied up in a high ponytail laughed at Ilya's exuberance, and he pulled the boy to the side of the group. I watched as the two boys sat on the ground and closed their eyes. Meditation was my guess, and I sighed as I looked away from the group. There was a small structure on the flat roof of the infirmary, just big enough for a tapestry to act as a door and to cover the staircase that led to the ground floor. I shifted the tapestry aside and walked down the steps to the infirmary. I came down to Aliona's former living area, but all of her things had been moved out of there and into a proper room. Her new living quarters were actually a small suite of rooms in the same building mine were, with a terrace that looked out over the rebuilding of the city. There was a bedroom, a curtained alcove in one of the walls that served as her bed, with two additional rooms off to the side. One served as a sitting room, and the other was where all of her books and maps were stashed. One large table had been placed in the center of the room that had been turned into her study, and in that room was where the orb of miasma was kept. It wasn't proper enough for a princess, but it was definitely better than having her live and sleep in an infirmary. Toward the other end of Aliona's old bedroom was where Julia sat with the snake demi-human. The elder had the girl wrapped up in blankets with a pile of books and unmarked pages on the table next to them. How's she doing? I asked as I walked over to the two women and leaned against the wall. Her body is healed, but her mind is in shreds. Julia rubbed her eyes and sighed deeply. If those mages hadn't torn up her mind as they did, I would have tried to wake her, but I don't dare try anything. Not now, at least. It's too early for me to have gained her trust. There was a book open in Julia's lap, and I peered at it. 
I still couldn't read the language of this world, but I could see there were a variety of herbs and plants sketched out on the pages. Some of them looked familiar to me, things like mint and lavender. What now? I asked with a frown. Do we just wait for her to sleep forever? I thought this was similar to when Aliona had fallen into deviation. This was another situation where my healing powers wouldn't help, no matter how much I wanted them to. What I needed was knowledge of how to heal fractured minds and damaged spiritual seas. But I was a paramedic and not a psychologist. No, of course not. Julia shook her head as she set the book carefully on the table next to her. I sent Afra to bring as much dried lavender from the storerooms as she can. Dried lavender? I echoed and wondered if she was going to make some sort of herbal tea. Why? Lavender has several properties, including healing. The elder tapped the sketch of the lavender plant on the book she'd set down on the table. She'll have daily hot baths with desert salt and dried lavender leaves. The salt will strive to purify her body and mind from any darkness, and it'll draw out the pain from her mental wounds. As for the lavender, it'll serve for a variety of purposes, from calming her to encouraging her spiritual sea to grow peaceful and for her heart to be full of love. It'll really do all that? I moved off the wall and leaned down to look closer at the book. I thought you just used lavender for tea and things like that. I don't think I've ever heard of them being used for healing. Do herbs not work like that in your own world? Julia asked, and curiosity and the thirst for knowledge sparkled in her pale blue eyes. No, not that I really know of, I replied with a shake of my head. I mean, my aunt would always be talking about the metaphysical properties of everything, but there was nothing ever proven by science. I chuckled fondly as I remembered how every morning there was a teapot in the kitchen, ready for a different tea Aunt Emma had brought back from an adventure or grown in her small garden. I hoped I had absorbed enough of that herb lore growing up with her since it seemed to be true in this world. Well, herbs have a wide variety of healing capabilities here, Julia said as she closed the book with a soft smile. You should talk to Moskal or Maxim. They'll be able to tell you more about them. That is their forte, after all, and my brother would enjoy teaching you what he knows. I guess I'll have to put that on my to-do list, I said with a nod. I hadn't thought about that, but the two men were both herbalists, and they would be able to help me learn about the medicine of this world. Probably needs to happen sooner rather than later. Julia hummed lightly as she glanced at the snake girl in the bed next to us. Then she slid her hand into her robes and pulled out her fan to tap it against her knee. It was a nervous tick, I realized. Having the fan in her hands reassured the elder, and I wondered if it came from the hundreds of years she'd been alive. She'd surely seen terrible things, being the oldest of the three elders. Is it safe to say Rustlin spoke to you? Julia suddenly asked as she glanced up at me and played with the fan in her hands. Uh, about the adoption? I clarified. Yeah, he did. I see you didn't give him an immediate answer. The elder snapped the fan open with a smooth movement of her wrist and began to gently fan herself. How do you figure that? I frowned at her words and wondered how long it had been since that conversation with Ruslan. Did he tell you? Ruslan would have been ecstatic and yelled it to the heavens. Julia laughed lightly behind her fan, and the laughter made her seem younger. The deer wears his heart on his sleeve. What do you think about it? I asked, and I didn't break eye contact with the elder. Ruslan adopting me, I mean. I think you would make a fine heir. Julia's eyes lost their amusing light, and she became solemn as she spoke. You're brave, and you have a strong moral compass. You wouldn't lead Hatra to doom, and perhaps things would have been different if you were here a thousand years ago. Perhaps Hatra would never have fallen. Perhaps instead of Ruslan adopting you as his son, you would have become his older brother. The elder, the keeper of knowledge of the city of Hatra, was so sure in her words that there wasn't even a single drop of doubt in her. She sat ramrod straight as she stared at me with resolute eyes. Thank you for your thoughts, I said with a grateful nod. So, you will take him up on the offer? She asked as she raised an eyebrow. I'm still thinking about it, I murmured as I ran my hand through my hair. But you're busy here, so I'll go draw up some plans for rebuilding the city. I grabbed a pot of ink, a brush, and a pile of blank pages from the desk before I turned to the stairs. A few moments later, I was out of the infirmary, and I used my stone powers to form a table from the stone of the roof. A bench followed, and then I sat down to sketch. 
I didn't have any plans or ideas of what I wanted to sketch out. I simply just started. The whole world around me disappeared, and all I could focus on was each brushstroke as it slid across the pages in front of me. As time passed, I realized it was the city from my vision that I was sketching out. Hatra rebuilt and more glorious than ever before. A Hatra that would be the most beautiful city I could craft with my hands, and it would never fall to anyone. That was the only thing I was sure of, that I would do whatever it took to protect the city I called my own. The scales on my arms shifted as I sensed a presence of sheer purity make its way up the stairs, and I knew it was Aliona, but I didn't look up. I heard what happened earlier today after you left the meeting with the Blue Tree Guild, Aliona said as she sat down next to me at the stone table. What part? I set down the ink brush. The torture, or what happened later? Both. Aliona spoke softly as she placed her hand over mine. Laika came to speak with me. Why didn't she come talk to me? Because she was ashamed from what her grandfather had commanded her guild members to do. There was no judgment in Aliona's sweet voice as she calmly continued. She felt you would judge her because she'd been unable to retrieve any information from the prisoners and that the method used had angered you. What? I looked at Aliona with confusion in my eyes. I wouldn't say I was angry, exactly. Even so, Laika wasn't the one who made the decision to rip apart the girl's mind. But she made the decision to stop it so we could do things my way. She doesn't want you to judge her guild, either. Aliona hummed gently as she tilted her head and peeked at me. Will you judge the Blue Tree Guild for acting as they have always done? Aliona, I won't judge them for that. I pulled my hand away from the princess and buried my face in my hands. In my old world, there are laws against torture, but people have found many ways to work through the loopholes. For me, I never thought about torture because I was working and studying to save people. Killing and torturing was never in my job description. What happened in that brig was beyond any moral reason for the old me. It was sheer cruelty. But I'm not the same person I was when I came to Inati. I understand now we need the information in the prisoners' minds, but whatever information they would give us through torture would be tainted by their fear of pain. So I didn't think it would- Understand. She said as she smiled at me. Oh? <laughs> I chuckled. Aliona placed a gentle hand on my back and leaned on my shoulder. This is a world where power is what rules. Every day, every moment of existence in the world of Inati is governed by who is the strongest and who is the weakest. A spider may eat an ant, and then the spider will be eaten by a frog, and then the frog will be eaten by a hawk, and so it will continue as a vicious but necessary cycle. Kindness and mercy is often met with betrayal and a dagger in your back. You don't believe that, not fully. I pulled my face from my hands and stared at Aliona. You risked everything for people you don't even know. You're the gentlest and kindest soul I've ever met. If those prisoners had been under your command, you wouldn't have done that. You would have found a different way to get the information you needed. I knew Aliona wouldn't have done that. She never would have forced her way into someone's mind as they were bleeding from their mouth and nose. Aliona would have taken someone's place if they were being tortured. She would never be able to torture anyone because her heart and soul were softer than water. It doesn't matter what I believe, Aliona said as she pulled her hand from my back and let it fall in her lap. All that matters is if I have the power to stand up after the dagger has been plunged into my back. And if I can continue protecting that which is most important to me, no matter how dirty my hands will become. That is how you have to live in this world. You suffer, and you fight for what you believe is right. So do that, Evan. Stand up and help me change this world into a better one. Of course I'll change this world, I said with a frown. I'll protect you and everything you treasure. There are more Hatras throughout this world, more cities and people who cower underneath the threat of the demons and miasma. I won't let them live like that, wondering if any day now they'll fall to the threat of the demons. But to do that, I need more power. Just like you said, I need more power than I have in my hands right now. I need the power to stand against an entire world. Even as I spoke, I could almost hear my mother and Aunt Emma cheer me on. They had always told me one person could change the world and that I could be that person, but they weren't here. 
If I give you power, it will be meaningless. Aliona placed her hands on my cheeks and forced me to look in her gemstone eyes. Your critics will laugh in your face and sneer behind your back. They will say you are hiding behind my skirts when you would never need to. Evan, I don't think you understand just how much power you have. You're right when you say you heal people. You have healed the city of Hatra, and its scars have begun to mend and fade away. You brought an army to this city and routed another one. You have bled and sweated just for the sake of protecting this city. In less than a month, Hatra has gone from a forgotten ruin to a city that will once again thrive and become a jewel in this desert. All because of you, my dragon. There was unshakable power in Aliona's words, and I wondered where she gathered this complete and absolute trust in my ability to change this world. It's still only one city, I half-argued. I've been able to do so much for Hatra because they wanted the help. They were open and welcoming to me. I won't get the same welcome elsewhere once people find out I'm a dragon. Then become something else as well. Aliona whispered, and her gemstone eyes glowed as stars danced inside of her amethyst irises. Allow yourself to become something greater. Greater than you've ever dreamed of. What? I asked, and I couldn't tear my gaze away from her eyes. What are you talking about? Become heir to the House of Hatra. Aliona's voice echoed in my ears as she pleaded quietly with me. I need to think about it. I shook my head and pulled away. There'll be rules and things I won't be able to do if I agree to this. So? Aliona's delicate fingers were firm on my cheeks, and they held me in place. The people of Hatra love you. The elders adore you. And you've risked everything for the city. I realized then, as Aliona spoke, that she looked at me as if I were the sun. It was sheer, unadulterated love in her eyes. That was where her trust and confidence in me and my power came from. Not only her, but the rest of Hatra as well. They loved me, and I loved them in return. I wasn't throwing away my mother and Aunt Emma, but expanding my family. I don't want to fail. I rested my forehead against hers and sighed. I want to lead Hatra to glory and greatness, so that never again will this city fall to anyone. Then become Ruslan's son. Aliona pulled away and pressed a chaste kiss against my lips. Become heir to the house of Hatra. Become the son of a lord and accept the glories and the burdens that come with such a title. From simply Evan, you will be a lord. But then, you never were just Evan, were you? I pressed a kiss to the palm of Aliona's hand as her words resonated deep inside of me. She shifted next to me and kissed me again, this time a much deeper kiss that left me gasping and her mewling softly. This wonderful woman loved this city, and I did too. Hatra wasn't just walls and buildings, it was my home now. And the people who lived here were my family. From little Ilyushina and Ilya to the elders, they were all my family. And now... My family needed me to become more than just their dragon. They needed me to become the heir to Hatra. So, I would become the heir to Hatra, and anyone who threatened those that I loved would meet a swift death at my claws. Chapter 5 to be adopted into the ruling house of Hatra, even if it was a thousand years after the city was destroyed by demons, was an important affair. A priest or priestess would have to preside over the adoption ceremony, and there would have to be a member of the royal family or high-ranking official of the White Jade sect present. Luckily for us, Aliona would be able to fill the role of both priestess and princess. As heir to the seat of the White Jade sect and Divine Maiden of Rama, Aliona answered only to the Lord of Rama. The only issue was that all of the temples of Hatra were completely destroyed when the city fell a thousand years ago. Only small shrines remained, shrines built and maintained by the survivors, but none of them were large enough for what we needed in regards to the adoption ritual. According to Julia and Aliona, the adoption ceremony, when for members of nobility, was traditionally held in the largest of the temples in the city, so the populace could be a witness to it. 
The reason behind this was so they could witness the summoned God judge and oversee the adoption ceremony. If the summoned God judged the adoption candidate to be a fair choice, the ceremony would go on smoothly. But, if the summoned God found the adoption candidate to be corrupt, unjust, or incapable of fulfilling the duties of their position, the nobility wouldn't be able to hide it. I'd suggested the idea of using one of the large open spaces in the city I'd cleared during my first round of rebuilding the city walls. When I brought that idea up during the discussion about the ceremony, Julia's eyes lit up and she explained that we did have the perfect place for the ceremony. In preparation for the ceremony, I'd been stripped and forced into a hot bath in one of the old bathhouses by a group of motherly-looking villagers and an anxious Julia. These bathhouses had been repaired simply long before I'd ever arrived at Hatra, and they somewhat reminded me of the Turkish baths Aunt Emma was so fond of. There was essentially a massive oven built underneath the bathhouse, and that heated up the small pool I was floating in. River stones lined the walls and floor of the pool, but they were all smooth to the touch. Now that I thought about it, this was the first proper bath I'd taken while conscious in an Adi. All the other times I'd ended up in water while awake were pretty much by necessity or accident, like swimming through an underground lake or fighting water demons. I might as well take this opportunity to relax in the deliciously hot water because I didn't know when I'd have time for such a luxury again. There wasn't much downtime after the adoption ceremony since it was already all scheduled out. Rebuilding and fortification was going to continue in full swing, especially since our population had massively grown with the addition of the Blue Tree Guild. The jump in the populace was immense, and I didn't know yet how many people would move from the Blue Tree Guild airship and into Hatra itself, but the airship was larger than any aircraft carrier back on Earth, and, if I remembered right, those ships could house over 5,000 people. I couldn't even begin to imagine Hatra rising from a hundred or so people to thousands. I sighed and leaned my head against the rim of the stone bath. Lavender leaves and cuttings from the dragon's blood plants floated around me in the stone pool I soaked in. The water was a deep mahogany from the resin of the dragon's blood, and it almost seemed like a dye had been poured into my bath. Absently, I wondered if the snake demi-human's baths were as relaxing as this one, or if her mind was too shattered to enjoy the gentle heat and the relaxing scent of the flowers. Think, Evan, think! What kind of treatments for war victims can you combine with magic? I murmured to myself as I sunk deeper into the water. A little voice in the back of my head whispered that maybe I'd find a way to stop Aliona from ever falling into deviation again, and I smiled at the thought. If I found a way to combine medical treatments from Earth with my healing magic, I'd be able to protect my princess from any danger that threatened her. And if through that I was able to help others, that was perfectly fine. Nothing came to mind at the moment, though, so I would have to study as much as I could to find a solution. Suddenly, nearly silent footsteps fell on the stone floor of the room, and I lifted my head to see Julia standing in the doorway with a pile of folded robes in her hands. Time to go? I asked, and she nodded. There were towels next to the edge of the bath, and I grabbed one of them to wrap around myself before I got out of the water. Then I used the other towels to dry myself as Julia gently shook out any wrinkles from the robes she'd carried in. Do you remember how the ceremony is going to go? Julia asked as she toweled my hair dry. Yeah, Aliona is going to summon the hearth god and give him a body to inhabit. I nodded as I repeated the steps I'd memorized. The hearth god is going to ask for her opinion as priestess and princess as to my qualifications for being adopted into Hatra's ruling family. Uh, then the hearth god is going to question Ruslan and me. Aliona had explained to me the hearth god was the deity in charge of all familiar affairs, especially in regards to adoption ceremonies. When a priest or priestess summoned a god in order to oversee an adoption ritual, it would either be the hearth god or his wife, the hearth goddess. And then what happens? Julia hummed as she moved from toweling my hair to running a comb through it. If and when the hearth god is satisfied about me being the right choice, we move on to the next step, I recited as I patted dry the small black scales on the inside of my arms. Ruslan and I are going to be given a knife by the hearth god, and we prick our fingers with it and let some of our blood fall into a cup of alcohol. Then we both take a sip and receive the hearth god's blessing. After that, we state our intentions as a family. Julia handed me the first layer of the azure robes she'd brought in, and I noticed there were tiny moons embroidered with silver thread on them. 
Carefully, I slipped into the first layer and bent down to slip on a pair of dark blue trousers. Are you sure you're ready for this? Julia paused and tightened her grip on the blue fabric in her hands. There's no going back on this once the ceremony begins. I could hear concern in her voice, and I knew it was the proud elder being worried over my choice. While she'd been pleased that I'd agreed to become a part of her family, she was worried I'd rushed into my decision and would come to regret it. But I wouldn't. I know, I said gently as I turned to face the elder. And I'm prepared for that. I want to be a part of Hatra. I want to belong here. I'm not giving up on my old home or trading it in for Inati, but I'm accepting that I can belong to two different worlds. What I didn't tell her was I was also accepting that I was a dragon and human, two different species in one body. Oh, Evan! Julia's pale blue eyes watered with unshed tears, and she placed a hand on my cheek. We never meant for you to feel like you had to give anything up. We just wanted you to be a part of our family. Maybe we were being selfish. We didn't even think about that. No, you weren't. I shook my head as I smiled widely. You wanted to give me a home here, and a family can be as large and as widespread as ours. A family doesn't have to be all in one place for it to be a family. The woman nodded, and then she blinked away her tears and went back to helping me with my robe. Once I was fully dressed, the two of us left the bathhouse and walked in the direction of the Lunar Palace. Slowly, villagers began to join us as we walked and followed behind us as they laughed and chattered away. When we were near the smithy, Ruslan was waiting to join the parade. Are you ready? Ruslan asked as he walked next to me in a dark blue robe. The fox demi-human was, for once, dressed properly, and his hair was pulled back into a high ponytail. I could even see boots on his usually bare feet. Ready as I'll ever be, I grinned at the elder in front of me before a thought popped in my head. Pops! Ruslan blinked for a moment before he threw his head back and laughed. After this! Ruslan threw his arm around my shoulders and mussed my hair as he laughed. I will be! I laughed loudly along with the cheering villagers and felt happier than I'd ever been. The sensation of this being right wouldn't leave me. This was even better than getting into medical school. We continued in that manner along the path to the Lunar Palace and the location of the adoption ceremony. It made sense the ritual would take place within the palace grounds. While all of the temples were destroyed and the shrines too small for the adoption ritual, the gardens of the Lunar Palace were safe enough to enter and large enough for all of Hatra to turn up. I swallowed heavily when Aliona came into view in the center of the garden. The sight of her was enough to almost make me go mad with desire, and the dragon instincts inside of me roared for me to take her away to a secluded cave so I could make her mine over and over again. Aliona's white hair was pulled back into a high ponytail, except for her black forelocks, but instead of her usual braids, they flowed freely. Her amethyst eyes were heavily lined in black coal, and her full lips were painted a deep red that was almost purple. A delicate purple flower that looked like a lotus was also painted on her forehead, and every inch of her arms was covered in intricate purple markings. She traded her usual flowing dresses for a diaphanous creation of thin silk and heavy embroidery. Gold trimmed her bodice as it dipped down to reveal her waist, and I could see even more purple markings travel over the swell of her breasts and down to her full hips. Gold dripped from both her ears and her wrists, and a thin chain of gold wrapped around her neck. The golden chain was cradled within her cleavage, and I could see tiny diamonds sparkle along the length of the chain. In her hair, she wore golden flower ornaments, and I knew Aunt Emma would drool over them if she were here. Once we begin, there is no turning back, Aliona intoned as she took a step toward me. Are you sure you want to go through with this? I am. I stood straight as I looked at the priestess with the utmost confidence. If I'm going to be adopted by Ruslan, I'm not going to half-ass it. Be brave, my dragon. Aliona stretched out her hand and let it fall onto my heart. The Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens is not known to be gentle. The Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens? Ruslan gasped as his ears flattened on his head. She's the one you're going to call upon? Not the hearth god? There was a fire in Aliona's gemstone eyes as she lifted her chin and faced Ruslan. 
The purple flower on her forehead flickered just as silver began to tint her amethyst eyes a pale color, and a coolness settled into the air. Do you find the dark lady to be lacking in any manner? Protectiveness slid into her gaze as she stared up at the fox elder with cold eyes. The dark lady has made it known to me that she would use her authority as regent of the Western Palace to oversee this ceremony. The hearth god stepped down at her command. Rustlin took a step back from the priestess as she closed her eyes and drew in a deep breath. It would be an honor for the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens to oversee this ceremony, Rustlin murmured softly as he kept his worried eyes on the priestess. Uh, who is that? I glanced between Rustlin and Aliona in confusion. I thought the adoption ritual calls on one of the family deities, like uh, the Hearth God. Isn't he the one who protects families and governs them? She is a goddess of war. Rusland explained with a furrowed brow. The Dark Lady is she who slays evil and protects righteousness through any means. Anyone she finds lacking is immediately slain and sent to spend the rest of eternity in the fires of hell. She is both judge and executioner. Before I could ask more about this Dark Lady, Aliona suddenly turned to face us and dropped to her knees. Then she raised her hands up in front of her and placed one on top of the other as a silver light emanated from the tips of her fingers. There had been fluffy white clouds in the sky before she knelt, but the moment her knees hit the ground, all of the clouds disappeared from view. Oh, four great heavenly kings, guardians of this world and those hereafter, Aliona's voice echoed throughout the garden as she spoke. Merciful gods who dwell in the heavens above, Saints and sages who live upon the earth below, your child of jade born to the north beseeches you to look down upon her and grant her your wisdom and your virtue. The air shifted and a breeze curled around us as delicate flower petals from the garden whirled in a tornado. Then a feral energy filled the air and it was an overwhelming sense of power like being lost on a battlefield. A mirror image of Aliona suddenly appeared before us. She had black hair drawn up in a high ponytail and white forelocks that hung loosely in the wind. Instead of amethyst gems, the eyes of this mirror Aliona were glimmering rubies, shining with a cruel light. This had to be the Dark Lady. Child of Jade and our Numina of the Western Winds, we have answered your call. The Dark Lady purred as she reached out to cradle Aliona's face. What do you seek? For what will you use our wisdom and our virtue, beloved child? Do you not have all that you would wish, child of jade and maiden of the stars? A house of Rama, bound to the first divine master, seeks to renew their line. Aliona replied as she placed her palms on the ground between them, and the silver light faded. The line unbroken, but broken still, pleads for renewal in the form of a son, an heir to the swordless lord of the house. What use do we have of a broken house? The dark lady wrinkled her nose and waved her hand. They lay broken and remain broken. Shall we care of broken lines when misfortune will come to all mortal things? What care should we have of this broken house? What care do you have of this broken house? Perhaps they even brought their own reckoning upon themselves. They fell and failed, and now reap what has been sown. Rage churned my blood at the way the Dark Lady spoke about Hatra, but I held my tongue. This had to be part of the test I'd been warned about. This child dares to speak, to argue, to plead. Aliona shook her head as her eyes bore straight into the Dark Ladies. One thousand years has been the price of Hatra's punishment for a sin they did not commit. One thousand years has Hatra been without justice. This child asks for your mercy, for such injustices cannot go unanswered. The desired heir and lord stand before you today. They seek to answer these injustices and bring back Hatra el Shamash. We shall humor you, child of jade. The dark lady sighed dramatically as she turned to look at us. Who is this heir who seeks to arm the swordless and mend the broken? Who is this son you speak of? A dragon does this child present to you. 
Aliona said as she lifted one delicate hand in my direction. He has won both this one's favor and her trust. He is a warrior full of honor and hope. We shall be the one to judge that. The dark lady sniffed the air as her ruby eyes glared at me. Dragon in human form, step forward and speak to us. Speak to us of who you are and why the precious child of Jade speaks so highly of you. Why should you be given to Hatra el Shamash? And why should Hatra el Shamash's blood be given to you? What is it you can give to Hatra el Shamash that is so desperately desired? My name is Evan, Dark Lady. I took in a deep breath as I answered the fickle deity in front of me. I have promised to give Hatra el Shamash all of me, all of my magic and all of my power so it can live and prosper. We shall be the judge of that. The dark lady drawled as she wrinkled her nose at me. Promises have always been made only to be broken by those without power or ambition. Perhaps there is a weakness in your blood that will cause you to fail. Or perhaps there is weakness in your heart that will paralyze you at the pivotal moment when destiny and fate are on the brink of being realigned. Her words cut through me like daggers, and all I could do was listen helplessly as her terrible crimson eyes stared at me. She was pure and merciless judgment, and I could understand how she was feared by most. But there was no need to fear judgment if you haven't done anything wrong. And I hadn't. I'd done nothing wrong to receive such harsh and cruel judgment, so I kind of wanted to tell her to fuck off, but she was a goddess. I am not weak. I managed to force out from underneath her judgment. I will not fail. The dark lady covered her mouth with her hand and let out a laugh that echoed throughout the gardens. She seemed to be genuinely amused by my words. Even so, the amusement faded quickly, and her face grew cold again. Who seeks to take this dragon into his home? The dark lady asked as she wrinkled her nose again. Who is it who seeks to take this dragon into his house, to make him one of the noble blood and ancient lineage of the house of Hatra el Shamash? Ruslan, son of Tristan, does. Ruslan answered clearly and stepped forward. I seek to take the black dragon known as Evan into my house and home as my son and heir. Why? The dark lady tilted her head as she rubbed her chin. Why do you take this dragon as your heir? Are you and the Keeper of Knowledge not in bed with one another? Will you not regret this? I will not. The Elder shook his head as he placed his hand on my shoulder. If it weren't for his dedication, Hatra would be ashes. He is an honorable man, full of a need to protect the weak and the innocent. The Dark Lady stared at Ruslan for one long moment, as if she were judging all of his past actions and even his future ones. Who has ever heard of a fox as the father of a dragon? <laughs> the dark lady let out a small snort as she languidly tapped her crimson nails against her cheek. I wonder just how many ripples this will cause. Those old fools on their thrones in the high heavens would be aghast at this. But I? This is amusing to me. Just how will the lineage of Hatra el Shamash change with the merging of this new blood? Shall this child plead once more? Aliona interrupted as her amethyst eyes glowed. Are the ones she has brought before you not fitting of your blessing? Are they not all you, in your great wisdom, have always admired and sought for? Would you not make them father and son in truth and by blood? Hmm. The dark lady huffed as she turned to face Eliona. Your answer is already known, child of Jade. You wish for him to be heir to Hatra el Shamash, so none may question his lineage or his merits. The strange deity smiled darkly at Eliona as a small laugh tumbled from her lips, and then she bent forward in a shallow bow. Eliona smiled mysteriously back at the dark lady. Merciful gods that dwell in the heavens above, saints and sages who live upon the earth below, we beseech you today to magnanimously stand and witness and bless the rebirth of this dragon. The dark lady lifted her hand in Ruslan's direction, and a pale drop of light flickered out from Ruslan's chest. 
The drop of light swayed in the air as it moved from Ruslan and into the dark lady's outstretched hand. Then it melted into her hand as if it had never been there. So be it, the dark lady exclaimed as she placed that same hand on my chest. We shall preach no more, dragon, so take this gift and use it well. You are a child of Hatra, of the line of the sword. Do not waste this gift, or I shall take your soul. I didn't know what to expect since the ceremony had not gone the way I thought it would, but I really didn't expect what happened next. A dark glow enveloped the dark lady's hand as my chest felt like it was being pried apart by steel claws. A cruel light had taken root in her terrible crimson eyes, and I stared back frantically at the creature who made a mockery of Aliona's face. It was like I was dying. My heart was beating like crazy, like I was a rabbit about to be torn apart by the merciless claws of a hawk. I staggered and fell to my knees as the onslaught of oppressive power drove every thought and memory out of my mind. All I could feel was an encompassing gaze that seemed to be judging me as every moment passed. Everything that made me who I am was scooped out for a moment and then mixed back in with something else, something greater than I was before. I forced myself back onto my feet and gritted my teeth as I took in a deep breath to steady myself from the onslaught of pain. Thank you, I bid out to the cruel goddess as I stood up. Dark lady of the nine heavens, for your blessing. With a snort, the dark lady pulled her hand off my chest and disappeared into nothingness as Aliona sighed deeply in relief. Well, that didn't go as planned. Ruslan blinked at me and rubbed his head before he broke out into another grin. But at least I got a son out of it. I couldn't help the smile that broke across my face at those words. I was his son now, and that meant Hatra was in my blood. While the ceremony had gone differently than expected, I could still give the gift I'd planned for the city. It was a promise of hope and new beginnings, and the words reverberated in my mind as I turned to stare at everyone who witnessed the adoption ceremony. The glorious days of old can never return. Hatra will never be what it once was, I declared in a loud voice as I looked out on the faces of my people and my heart swelled with pride. But I promise you I will rebuild the Lunar Palace. I promise you Hatra will be even greater than it was in the days of old. Hatra El Shamash will be reborn, and never again will the walls of this city crumble before any army. They will stand strong, just as the blood of Hatra did this past thousand years. It's true, an army of demons did destroy the walls of this city, but they did not destroy the spirit of Hatra. Hatra has lived on within her people, within all of you who stand here before me. A thunderous roar came up from the crowd as they cheered my name, and my heart leapt into my throat. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Laika in the back of the crowd, and the wolf demi-human lifted two fingers in a salute before she disappeared into the roaring throngs of people. Thank you, my son. Ruslan came up behind me and placed his hand on my shoulder. Thank you for returning hope to Hatra. Chapter 6 A tent and food-laden table had been set up near where the ritual took place in the ruins of a pavilion. The roof crumbled away a long time ago, but the stone column still remained and cast a bit of shade. Openings along the sides of the tent allowed me to look out onto the overgrown gardens of the Lunar Palace, and I noticed the small group of villagers standing off to the side of the tent. It was clear they were, essentially, the servants waiting on us. The only people in the tent with me were my new family and it was like the house of Hatra was having a family dinner or something. Well, except for Aliona. The priestess had excused herself and left almost immediately after my speech. I wanted to follow after her, but I realized she probably needed to rest after the ceremony. Usually, Julia began as she sat down at the table, there would be feasts and dancing after an adoption ceremony, especially after one is taken into a noble family, even a fallen one such as ours. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of celebrating such a fortuitous event in such a grand manner. I glanced at the wide spread of freshly baked bread, the variety of roasted meat, and the vegetables I knew came fresh from Hatra's farms. There was more than enough food in the city, so no one would starve. 
We had magic to thank for that, but there was a certain amount of pride to be maintained. There was no trade with the outside world thanks to the miasma that once plagued Hatra and continued to plague the surrounding countryside. Thanks to that, we only had what we could make with our own power. The status quo wouldn't stay like that for long, though. Now that I was Lord Evan, there were more than a few plans I'd already thought up for my city. It won't be long before we can have feasts so extravagant they'll be written down in history, I replied as I leaned back in my own chair. Hatra won't be looked down upon, nor will we be as poor as we were these past thousand years. Deserts were often valuable. Just because they lacked water didn't mean treasure wasn't buried right under the surface. There could be anything from gold to emeralds underneath those shifting sands, and with the Crimson Dragon in the canyons, that meant no one would have gone anywhere near those lands since they would have feared dying at her claws, not to mention the deadly miasma roaming the countryside. So, the desert was going to be a source of income for Hatra, be it gold or jewels or even glasswork. I would see to it personally. "'What's going on in that mind of yours?' Ruslan asked, as he slid a jug of wine over to me and raised an eyebrow. "'You look like you've struck gold!' "'Figuratively speaking,' I grinned back, as I poured some of the oddly clear alcohol for myself. "'What do you know about the desert and the aqueducts? Julia, you found the original schematics for the aqueducts, right?' The aqueducts had originally fed Hatra's massive waterworks, but they'd been destroyed the night Hatra fell a thousand years ago. What remained of the original system was the underground tunnel that diverted water into the city's underground cisterns. Those cisterns then fed the wells and bathhouses in the city, which supplied Hatra with fresh water. I did? Julia answered with a nod. I grinned as I realized all I would have to do was essentially treat the ruins of the waterways like they were a giant puzzle. It would be as easy as pie with my ability to control stone, and I wouldn't even have to go through the trouble of flying in the air and lifting any of the insanely heavy rocks. Life was good. For enchanting buildings, does that need to happen right when it's being constructed? I asked. Or can it be done later, added on, like a layer of paint or something? From my research, Julia replied as she set a piece of meat on her plate, it's all dependent on the power of the enchanter. Aliona will obviously be able to do that. My words dripped with confidence as I waved my hand. I'll fix up the aqueducts, and I'll bring her there later to enchant them to be unbreakable. With anyone else, my words would have been arrogance or false pride. But they weren't when it came to Aliona. She had the power and ability to back up any claim. If she said she would be able to do it, nothing on the face of this world would be able to stop her. I smirked to myself as I compared Aliona to a living in-game cheat. If this was a game or a show, she would have been an almost unbeatable NPC on the hero's side. Bring one of the schematics of the city, Ruslan ordered one of the villagers standing off to the side of the tent. The man nodded, and a few minutes later, a map of the city was placed on the table in front of us. Who can be spared? I asked as I looked down at the map of Hatra and crossed my arms. My concentration is going to be fixing the aqueducts, so I need someone to watch my back. My first choice would be Laika and Anton, but we're going to need more people. When those water demons attacked, we were almost outnumbered, so maybe 15 or 20 warriors from the guild would be good, I think. It would be best to take a local, Moscow spoke up for the first time and glanced over at me. I would suggest Leon. He is a blooded warrior, but is not blinded by the idea of glory, nor does he follow orders without question. That sounded fine by me. I didn't want people who just did what I asked without thinking. Life would be far too boring like that, and I would end up becoming complacent. I might miss out on different viewpoints, which wouldn't be interesting at all. Then let's get to it, I smirked as I stood up from the table. We'll leave in thirty minutes. That should be enough time for everyone to get to the front gate. A bit bossy now, aren't ya? Ruslan snickered as he leaned back in his chair. Who put you in charge? You did. I chuckled as I grabbed a piece of bread from the table, ripped it open a bit, and put some meat and cheese inside. You're the one who decided adopting me and naming me heir was a good idea. It's a bit too late for you to start complaining, dear. <laughs> Julia giggled behind her fan as she looked at the fox by her side. You're going to have to live with him now, unless you want the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens to strike you down. Hey, hey! Ruslan lifted his hands in the air as his ears flopped back. I'm just a fox. I can't help but tease people. 
It's in the job description, you know. How about you add being a messenger to that job description? I teased as I moved toward the tent's opening. Remember, 30 minutes and I'm heading out. Behind me, I heard the twack of Julia's fan hitting Ruslan, and I snorted into the sandwich I'd snatched from the table. A few moments later, and several firefoxes darted past me in different directions, and I knew my team would meet me soon. It took me 30 minutes to leisurely walk to the main gate, and I was able to finish my sandwich. By the time I arrived, a group of around 30 people were waiting for me. Leon's bright golden hair was easy to pick out amongst the sea of dark gray and dark blue hair of the wolf demi-humans accompanying him. Next to him, adjusting the bracers on her arms, was Laika in full armor, and Anton lagged behind them with his arms crossed behind his head. Laika! I called out to the wolf demi-human and waved her over to me. The Blue Tree Guild is ready to leave at your command. Laika replied as she inclined her head in my direction but didn't move to join me. We can run behind you and keep a steady pace. Where do you wish to begin, my lord? We'll start at the waterfalls near the Crimson Canyons, I said with a frown, but I figured she had gone into guild leader mode, so I shrugged and went along with her strange formalness. The plan is to work our way back to the city. It shouldn't take us long. There's about 10 to 15 miles, give or take, of aqueducts I'll be fixing. Your duty during this time is to keep an eye out. Do you think more water demons are going to come out of the river? Anton's ears and tail drooped as he eyed me with suspicion. Those fuckers were a bitch to fight. They wouldn't stay down. No water demons, I reassured the wolf as I stretched in preparation for the run ahead of us. Aliona got rid of them permanently, so we don't have to worry about them. This is only a precaution. I don't want to have to worry about watching my back while repairing the aqueducts. We'll watch your back, my lord! Leon vowed as he stepped forward, and his golden eyes shone fiercely as he crossed his fist over his chest. We will make sure nothing disturbs you during your work. Well, it's not like I won't join in if there's fighting, I replied as I finished stretching. Just try and keep a dragon out of a fight. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of it, Leon laughed as he stepped back in line with Anton. With that, I broke into a run and led the group toward the waterfall. They were able to easily keep pace with me, but I would expect nothing less from adventurers of their caliber. And while I knew I could push myself to run faster, and by extension them, I held myself back. It would do no good for us to arrive exhausted from the start. I'd be able to push us all to the limit another day. Twenty minutes later, I skidded to a stop just before the large waterfall and paused a moment to take in the serene setting. To my back was the desert, and on either side of me were the walls of the canyon and the ruined aqueducts of Hatra. I glanced behind me to see Laika standing close by with a stern expression on her face. Her gaze was off to the distance, somewhere past the sand dunes of the desert. Did you see something? I walked over to where she stood and followed her gaze. No, my lord. Laika murmured, and her ears twitched when I came to a stop next to her. I thought I sensed bloodlust, but there is nothing out there. Only the wind. I looked out into the desert, but I could hear nothing other than the shifting of sand. There were no heartbeats I could hear, and no one I could smell approaching us. Still, if there was something lurking out there, there were thirty of us with sharp senses and even quicker fighting abilities. Maybe you were sensing the Crimson Dragon, I replied as I dragged my gaze back to Laika. Ruslan told me she won't attack us as long as we stay outside of her canyon. As you say, my lord. Laika's eyes flickered away from me as she took a step back. I dare not intrude on your time any longer. I shall go stand watch. Laika darted away from me before I could reply, and she headed up to one of the nearby dunes to keep watch. Her tail hung behind her and shifted lazily with the wind as she kept her dark eyes on the desert in front of her. When she left so quickly after the adoption ceremony, I thought it had been my imagination. But now, I was sure Laika was avoiding me. I just didn't know why. I'd have to find some time alone with her to get an answer out of the demi-human. I frowned as I turned my attention to the crumbled remains of the aqueducts. The image of how they looked in the original schematics was clear in my mind, with straight lines and a slow descent toward the city. The stone would be smooth and seamless along the outside as it continued on down the length of the aqueducts and carried water. The inside of the aqueducts was a completely different story, though, constructed of many different levels of cleverly carved stone filters that would need my complete attention. 
I drew in a deep breath as I focused on the well of power inside of my chest and the way it called out to the world around me. Stone was my primary concern, but before I took control of the surrounding stone, I stretched my power deeper into the earth. The thought of gold and other jewels under the shifting sands of the desert tempted me, and I wanted to see if I could sense the treasures with my power. I visualized what I was looking for in my mind and concentrated on the image of gold and emeralds. A small hum, almost like the chiming of a bell really, went through my mind, and the image of an immense gold vein flickered behind my eyes. A myriad of jewels and other metals joined in with the gold, and a triumphant smile slid onto my face. We would definitely launch an expedition into the desert to recover those treasures. But first, Hatra needed water. I was about to start putting together the pieces of the aqueducts when I sensed there was something wrong. There was the sound of shifting sand in the distance and the vague smell of acrid blood in the air. I frowned as I strained my neck to look around me. There was nothing I could see, but there was still a niggling doubt that rang like alarm bells in the back of my mind. Around me, everyone was on high alert as well, with their eyes trained on the desert and weapons already in hand. I shifted into my dragon form in preparation for whatever was going to be coming out of the desert. I also preemptively gathered my healing power and allowed a wash of kaleidoscope glitter to settle on everyone around me. We all knew something was coming, we could sense it, and none of us were going to get hurt. Desert vipers! Laika hissed out as her broadsword appeared in her hand. Suddenly, enormous serpents with glowing crimson eyes burst out of the ground. They were the size of buses and had thick black scales covering their bodies. There were nearly twenty of them, and taking them out would have been a pain if I was by myself. Thankfully, I wasn't, and the Blue Tree Guild let out fierce battle cries as they charged the deadly snakes. I launched myself into the air and pulled stone spikes from the ground, but the serpents evaded them. It was almost as if they'd been expecting that move from me, but I didn't have time to think about that. From the air, I could see the synchronized movements of the Blue Tree Guild warriors and the way Leon seamlessly fought alongside them. But there was something off about the battle. Even though only seconds had passed and the desert vipers were smaller than the behemoths summoned by Asher, the serpents seemed to move with one mind. If they were one mind, then there was a fatal weakness to that, and my anger would be enough to exploit it. They were going to be expecting strategy from me, so I wasn't going to use strategy. I was going to let my rage take over. Not enough for it to blind me, but enough for me to be unpredictable. A wash of red covered my vision, and my heartbeat sped up. Then my blood thudded in my ears and mimicked the sound of war drums just as my mind emptied itself of all thoughts. I dove down, angry that these beasts interrupted my work and attacked what was mine. It didn't matter if they were being controlled or not, I would rip them to pieces. My claws closed around the body of one of the serpents, and I pulled with every ounce of strength in my muscles until I heard a satisfying crack, and the snake went limp. Then I let the desert viper fall as I dove toward another one of the serpents. Immediately, the other vipers abandoned the defending adventurers and rocketed toward me. Good, that was going to be their undoing. I faced them and snarled as my claws dug deep within the earth. My stone spikes failed once, but they wouldn't fail this time. I had a much better image in mind, and there was a wealth of resources buried beneath the sands. Suddenly, the sharpest of spikes, tipped by hardened diamonds, exploded from the ground all around me and latched on to the serpents. I grinned with savage delight and slammed my power downward, effectively pinning the vipers to the ground. Immediately, those from the Blue Tree Guild attacked the heads of the desert snakes and slashed them apart. It was easier now to rip their heads off, and it was almost no contest with our superiority. The only two advantages the serpents had going for them was their coordinated attacks and their surprise ambush on us. Other than that, my timing and improvised plan was perfect. The vipers were all impaled by my spikes so we could finish them off and minutes later, their hacked-apart bodies covered the ground all around us. When the sands were drenched in black blood and nothing moved but the wind, I shifted back into my human form and cracked my neck. Are they usually that big? I asked as I nudged the body of one of the vipers with my clawed hand. They're almost as big as I am in my dragon form. Not that I've heard of, Leon replied and stepped around one of the fallen snakes with a frown. 
The elders might know more about these snakes. Is there anything we can use their bodies for? I glanced over at Leon as I sat down in the sand. Can we use their scales or something? Their fangs were pretty strong. Natalia might be able to make some weapons from them. I doubt they'd stand up to Orichalum, but they'd still be nasty enough in a fight. Also, if we use the scales for armor, they would be good for striking fear into our enemies. The scales are quite tough, Leon tapped his hand against one of the scales and tilted his head in thought. Not as tough as those behemoths we fought, but tough enough that they could be used as armor. A pity the bodies of those behemoths disappeared. They kind of look like your scales. Anton sniffed the body of one of the serpents and recoiled in disgust. It smells like it's been dead for a while. I frowned at Anton's comment and wondered if the desert vipers had been killed beforehand only to be reanimated by someone. It wasn't like we'd be able to find out now, though, so I shook the thought from my head. Break them down and take them to Natalia, I sighed as I slid back to my feet. I gotta get back to fixing the aqueducts. I rubbed the back of my neck as I turned back to the shattered waterways while the guild members and Leon turned their attention to the fallen desert vipers. This was definitely going to be a long night. Fixing the collection area for the aqueduct was going to have to be the first thing on the list. To do this, I needed to make a filtering screen out of stone to make sure no debris from the river got into the aqueduct. I rubbed the back of my head as I thought of how many different sized filters I should make for the basin. Maybe, instead of basing this part of the aqueduct system on the Roman structures, the Incan aqueducts would be a better solution. Instead of collecting the water into a stone structure, there would be something like a stone pathway with raised walls. The water would flow down the pathway at a slight angle by using gravity to divert it from the waterfall and back toward the city. Well, now that I had an image of how I was going to rebuild the waterway, there was only one thing left to do. Start drawing on my power and go at it slowly so I wouldn't exhaust myself. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and began to funnel my power up from my spiritual sea. The architecture of the aqueducts wasn't the issue. I could see their original structure was pretty ingenious enough. If it hadn't been for the demons, they would have easily stood for thousands of more years, even without maintenance. But I was going to make them that much better. The demons managed to destroy the aqueducts in the past, and I wanted to ensure that couldn't happen again. So, the aqueducts needed to be strong enough to withstand any attack, and even though I was going to have Aliona enchant the waterways later on, the foundation needed to be impregnable. The bluestone surrounding me was reliable and strong, but I needed the waterways to be even stronger since stone could melt under high enough temperatures and become fragile. I needed to think of every eventuality, of something that wouldn't melt under high temperatures or shatter under low temperatures. The aqueducts also had to be able to withstand any and every attack to be as strong, if not stronger, than my own scales. Just as I was thinking about that, I remembered Aunt Emma's love of superstitions and her hobby of researching obscure pagan beliefs. People had thought crystals and gems could hold energy, and then later on they were used in computer chips. All of that gave me an idea. There was an abundance of gems, even diamonds, beneath my feet. And if they were capable of storing power, then they would be the best foundation for Aliona's enchantments. There was just one problem with my idea. I had no way of changing the diamonds into a liquid form so they'd merge with the bluestone. I could sense the hard gemstones in the sand deep beneath my feet all around me. But they were entirely solid and I could only break them into smaller pieces like I had done to tip the stone spikes when fighting the vipers. I couldn't even breathe fire yet, and I knew I needed a fire almost as hot as the surface of the sun, if not hotter, to be able to melt diamond. I let out a breath as I considered what to do. The diamond walls would have been ideal, but that was out of the ballpark for me right now. Reinforcing the waterways was important, and metal rebars would have been perfect for that except there were no rebars in this world. I'd have to remember to sketch out a design for Natalia and Ruslan to make them. Then an idea struck me. I did have a surplus of bluestone around me, and even better than that, I had exactly the right ingredients to make concrete. All I needed for making the mix was crushed stone, sand, and water. Concrete it is, I grinned to myself as I pictured the mixture in my mind. After some thought, I decided I'd use a mixture of limestone and bluestone for the crushed rock part of the mix. A 1 to 2 ratio of crushed limestone to sand would work perfectly. 
If I had any ash, I would make Roman concrete instead. But since that was out of reach for the moment, I would settle for my crushed stone mix. With my powers, it would work just fine. Although, I was going to have to remember to write down the recipe for Roman concrete and have a mixture ready. It could become a Hatra specialty and be sold to neighboring cities and countries if we weren't able to get at the gold and jewels underneath the desert. I tapped into my power and started to form the filter system, but soon there was a whoosh of air and an overbearingly familiar presence grew behind us. Oh, what now? I groaned. Dragon! Anton yelled out from behind me as all the warriors stopped breaking down the serpents and switched into battle stances. I ripped my gaze from the aqueduct and pinpointed the familiar presence above us. Right on top of the waterfall was the crimson dragon in all her glory. Wait for my signal, I growled out as I shifted into my dragon form. She shouldn't attack us since we're not in her territory, but if she does, all of you aim for her eyes. The Blue Tree Guild warriors shifted into defensive positions alongside me, and I could sense their power rising to the front. Even though we just had the skirmish with the Sand Vipers, my men were ready to fight again. What are you going to do, Lord Evan? Leon asked as he kept his eyes on the other dragon and his fists clenched at his sides. I'm going to see what she wants, I replied, and with that, I launched myself into the air and flew to the top of the waterfall. The proverbial hairs on the back of my neck were standing on end as I landed on the rocky outcropping, and the other dragon stared at me with unblinking amber eyes. She was stretched out on the crimson stone as if she hadn't a single care in the world. Oh, do calm down, she yawned out as her massive tail flicked behind her. It's not as if I've attacked you. You did, I growled and watched her every move for any hint of an attack. Unless you've forgotten chasing me through the canyons last week. That was then, the other dragon replied as she stretched out even further. And this is now. Unless you want me to chase you and tear you to pieces, I would be happy to oblige, especially since you did slip away from me. Yeah, that's going to be a hard pass from me. I blinked at her strange reply and tested the waters with her. So if you're not here to attack anyone, then why are you here? You must be mistaking me for some sort of war-mongering human. <laughs> A breathy laugh came out of her crimson maw as her ivory fangs glinted. You haven't entered my territory, therefore I have no reason to hunt any of you down. I ignored the presence of your group, since none of you entered my canyons. But then, the scent of desert vipers reached me, and I must admit, I am rather curious. What occurred here, and what are you going to do with those ruins? The desert vipers attacked us. I sat down across from her, but kept my muscles tensed and ready. We killed them. Obviously. She rolled her amber eyes and let out a displeased snort. It would be shameful if the dragon who managed to escape from the glorious me was killed by some measly serpents. The odds weren't on their side, I replied dryly as I glanced back down at my comrades. So, those two-legged things down there are capable of fighting? The crimson dragon asked as she leaned her head over the edge of the waterfall to look at my comrades. I might want to have a bout with them. Other than you, there hasn't been anyone who has been able to entertain me in ages. Yeah, just leave them alone. There was more than a little bite to my words as I blared my fangs at her. They're mine, the same way those canyons are yours. A bit territorial, are we? <laughs> she laughed again. Such a greedy dragon. Takes one to know one, I muttered back as I watched her carefully. If she was going to attack my people, I would make sure she would regret it. The fight would be a tough one, but she was outnumbered and would eventually be tired out while my healing power would make sure everyone on my side was still fresh and unwounded. Call it an unfair cheat, but I was going to do whatever it took to protect what was mine. You haven't told me what you're doing with that rubble. Her attention shifted from the warriors to the part of the waterway I'd rebuilt. Are you going to spend your time playing with those pebbles? If you'd like to know, I explained as I motioned to the waterway, I'm rebuilding the aqueduct. How boring. 
There was another giant sigh from her, and she stretched out her wings. Don't get killed. And come to the waterfall when the moons are full again. You aren't quite terrible to talk to. Thanks, I think. I wasn't quite sure how to take her words, but at least it meant she wasn't going to attack us anytime soon, and there was a potential alliance there. By that time, the aqueducts aren't going to be rubble anymore, and you'll see, I wasn't just playing with pebbles. The dragon didn't reply to me. She only lifted her wings and flew away into the canyons. I was still wrapping my mind over what had happened, because she went from attacking me on sight to talking somewhat peacefully to me over the span of a week. I guess the possessiveness of a dragon wasn't something to joke about. I flew back down to the bottom of the aqueduct and settled on the sandy riverbank as I shifted back into my human form. All around me, my comrades regarded me with gaping mouths and wide eyes. So what just happened? Anton asked, and one of his eyebrows kept twitching. I was pretty sure we were going to have to fight that thing. The Crimson Dragon, Leon interjected in a dazed sort of manner as he looked at me with awe. You talked to the Crimson Dragon! Yes, Leon, a dragon. Anton covered his face with his hands, and his ears fell flat on his head. Right after we fought decaying and decrepit serpents from the desert. Have you forgotten <laughs> I'm a dragon? I chuckled. I was wondering if the stress of everything had gotten to Anton, or if he was really that terrified of foreign dragons. Listen, you being our new lord doesn't make you any less terrifying, Anton said as he removed his hands from his face and stared at me with equal parts respect and disbelief. I know you're our friend, and you aren't going to hurt us, but we don't have any guarantees from that dragon in the canyons. And you just went up there, and she flew away, easy as you please, without attacking us. Well, as long as we stay out of the canyons, I explained to Anton and the others. She won't go after any of us. But she wants me to come and talk to her, though. Kind of weird, if you ask me. I'm done with this conversation, Anton groaned comically as his tail drooped. I just... I don't understand how something like that dragon wants you to come and talk to her. And it's a her? Just be thankful she's civilized, I snorted as I thought back to how she had tried to kill me the first time we met. Well, somewhat, at least. I think I'd rather go back to skinning those snakes, Anton muttered as he moved back toward the dead serpents and the other warriors followed him. Yeah, you go do that, I called after him as I shook my head and grinned. Leave the worrying and dealing with giant monsters to me. Thinking that was the end of it, I turned my attention back to the aqueduct. When the Crimson Dragon had arrived, I was partway through making the system of filters. What are you doing now? Leon piped up from behind me as he stepped forward. These rocks used to be what collected water. I pointed over to the shattered and worn down stones poking out of the waterfall's pool. You see those crumbled stones over there by the banks? How they have curved bits? Like a giant stone bowl! Leon's eyes lit up as he figured out what the stones used to be. Kind of like the wells we have in the city. Similar to them, that's right. I nodded at his understanding of the basic structure and decided to explain more. Instead of a bowl, it's going to be kind of like a curved plate that will take the water through a system of filters and a large stone container. It'll collect the water from the waterfall and, through the use of gravity, the aqueducts will carry it all the way to the city. Well, what if there's debris in the water? Leon grimaced as he glanced back at me. Dead animals and things like that. Won't that contaminate the water and make us sick? That's where the filters come in, I explained with a smile. There's going to be layers of filters within the aqueducts, and those will clean out the water. How? Leon tilted his head to the side as he looked back at the rebuilt portion of the aqueduct. There's going to be a screen made out of stone in the container where the water is collected, I said as I created a miniature version of the filters with my power so Leon could see what I was talking about. That way, any of the larger bits of debris won't get into the water. There'll be more filters, too, a layer of rocks and sand that'll clean the water as it travels through the aqueduct. Even if there's blood from a dead animal? Leon furrowed his brow, and there was more than a bit of concern in his voice. That's where Aliona's enchantments are going to come in handy, I said with a shrug. There's only so much all the filters will be able to do, and I don't want to risk any diseases getting into our water. 
Leon nodded and sat down to watch me as I drew on my power to continue rebuilding the aqueducts. I kept the image of the blue stone and concrete mix in my mind and allowed my power to flow out around me. Slowly, the composition of both the sand and the blue stone changed. Then, stone, almost in a liquid form, flew out of the ground and merged onto the broken pieces of the waterway in front of me. Then, the malleable rock mixture lifted into the air, and it was like playing with clay. I controlled it with my mind, and the stone pieces merged seamlessly with the addition of the concrete mix. As awesome as it looked, it was slow-going work. I had to focus on small sections at a time as I pulled forth the bluestone and concrete mix from the ground. But it was more than worth it. The walls of this section of aqueducts were now perfectly smooth, and there were no cracks or crevices along the stone face of the waterways. An exhausted grin spread across my face. No one was ever going to bring these aqueducts down again. My mind ran away with me as I settled into a decent rhythm while rebuilding the aqueducts. I imagined a sprawling, underground complex that spanned the length of the river and the desert. It connected the river and waterfalls to the many oases in the desert and formed a system capable of storing more than enough water for several cities. It would look a lot like the water system underneath Iran's desert back on Earth. It was a painstakingly difficult task for the workers to accomplish that kind of system, though. There was the danger of suffocating since they were too far down from the surface, or the walls of the underground tunnels could collapse at any moment. But I wouldn't have that issue thanks to my control over Earth. If I planned and built this underground network, we would be able to conquer the desert and change it from a world of sand to lush vegetation. Instead of being scorching and unforgiving land, Hatra's desert would be full of life and new opportunities. We could fill it with farms, villages to look over mining operations, or even create a resort. And if I did that, then we'd build roads linking all the villages back to Hatra so there would be safe passage. Maybe even set up guardhouses or way stations every so often for people to be able to rest and in case those areas needed to be defended. We'd already fought the desert serpents, and I didn't know what else was waiting inside of the desert. So I would need to go out into the sands and wipe out every single threat. Those thoughts and plans continued to reverberate inside of my head as I rebuilt the aqueducts bit by bit. And just like that, before I realized it, I'd finished and we could head back into the city. The aqueducts now looked like they'd been created from one solid piece of bluestone. Flecks of pale crystal caught the light of the stars in the night sky and made the waterways glimmer. It was a beautiful sight, and I knew the aqueducts were now stronger than steel. Now that's what I'm talking about, I murmured with a grin as I stared triumphantly at my work. It was morning by the time we'd made it back to the city after fixing the aqueducts and dealing with the remains of the giant vipers. None of us were injured, but some of the clothing of the less lucky had been burned by the viper's poison. It really would have been a mess if they'd somehow gotten into the city. A table was set up in the town square when we returned, and the elders and other citizens sat around it. Breakfast had obviously been set up while they waited for us. You fought what? Ruslan choked on his water and fell into a coughing fit after we reported our night. Desert vipers! But they've never been that close to the city before. I don't think we've ever seen them along the river. Yeah. I replied dryly as I thumped him on the back. That's what Leon told me after we'd killed them. Also, the Crimson Dragon appeared. The fight drew her attention, and she was a bit curious about what we were doing out by the aqueducts. She wasn't that bad this time around since none of us were inside of the canyons. She even invited me back to talk to her. How many were there? Julia tilted her head as she set down her ceramic cup. You said vipers, which is quite odd. They're usually solitary creatures. Then she paused and blinked owlishly at me. Wait, you spoke to the Crimson Dragon? And she invited you back to speak to her? There were about twenty of the vipers, I sighed as I sat down at the table. They were pretty coordinated, too, like they were being controlled by someone else who was watching us fight. As for the Crimson Dragon, I guess the canyons can get kind of boring when you kill everyone who goes in. Getting on the Crimson Dragon's good side is a feat in itself. You might even be able to convince her to fight for Hatra in the future. Ruslan wiped the dribbling water from his mouth and frowned. But back to the vipers. You said you suspect they were being controlled. What led you to that conclusion? They're a desert species, 
I said as I leaned back in my chair and thought back to the fight. There's oases in the desert for them to get their water from. Why would they travel all the way to the river right when we were out there? That can't be just a coincidence. Then there's the fact they were bigger than they're supposed to be, more than twice their size. I didn't have any sure idea of who or what could have been controlling the vipers, but I knew they'd made an enemy out of me. For that, they would pay, and I would tear them apart, just like I'd done to those desert serpents. It seems someone doesn't want Hatra to succeed, Ruslan murmured as he rested his chin in his hand. There has to be a reason why, I frowned as I tapped my hand on the table. I need to know more about Hatra. The reason why Hatra was attacked in the past and is still being attacked is somewhere in its history. I just have to find it. Maybe there are answers to why we're still being targeted now. Julia grinned as she snapped open her fan and fluttered it before her face. A history lesson? I thought you would never ask, dear Evan. Chapter 7 Genealogies and the History of Hatra Julia began as she dropped another immense pile of books in front of me. Are the first order of business. One must know the past in order to prevent making the same mistakes after all. These also have information about trade agreements and treaties with neighboring cities. A thousand years may have passed, but these agreements should still be valid. The moment after I had mentioned wanting to know more about the city, the Keeper of Knowledge dragged me down to the underground library beneath Hatra. Now I was currently being held as a willing hostage by the Elder in one of the library's luxurious study rooms. Dragging my gaze away from the pile of books was more difficult than I thought. The idea of new knowledge sent a thrill through me, and I couldn't help the greedy smile that crossed my face. I hadn't pulled hundreds of all-nighters as a college student and an EMT for no reason. This was going to be a piece of cake. Add in my increased dragon stamina with my photographic memory thrown in, and I was sure I'd be able to push myself further than I would have ever been able to back on Earth. A loud thunk drew me out of my thoughts, and I blinked at the pile of books in front of me. Did you already read all of these? I asked with more than a bit of surprise in my voice. I didn't think anyone would have time to read through that much. It hasn't even been a month since we found this place. Hey, don't tell me you were reading instead of sleeping. I narrowed my eyes at Julia and studied her face. There weren't any bags underneath her eyes, so that meant she was still getting a decent amount of sleep, or so I hoped. The bodies of cultivators were still a mystery to me until I managed to consume all of the knowledge in the library. My, Julia mused with a sly grin. Is the young heir worried about an old woman such as me? Don't come crying to me when you've got wrinkles underneath your eyes, I joked as I leaned back in my chair. You'll just make Rustlin cry if you overwork yourself and start looking like a hag. Such cheekiness, Julia muttered and sat down across from me. You'd think Ruslan had raised you from birth. I suppose that cheekiness and arrogance of yours is exactly what Hatra needs. I blinked at Julia for a moment as she leaned back in her chair. I wasn't really sure what I should call her since I was now Ruslan's son. By that same logic, I was now her son, too. I promise you I won't disappoint you. I clenched my hands tightly as I thought of everything Julia and Ruslan must have given up in order to ensure Hatra's survival. I will bring Hatra back to its former glory. I made that promise to our people, to you, and to Father. I know. A soft smile crossed Julia's face as she rested her face in one of her hands. You've kept every promise you've made so far, and truly, I couldn't have asked for a better heir. A warm pride grew inside my chest at her words. My dragon instincts wanted me to show her I would be a perfect heir, that I would be able to provide for and protect our pack. Wait, pack? I half frowned as I felt the dragon part inside me rear its head in curiosity at my confusion. There hadn't been time for me to get to know the part of me that was a dragon. Hopefully I would soon be able to learn and get to know my draconic side better. There were instincts my dragon side had, and those instincts had helped me out several times and were right on the nose about people and events. From using my power to heal, changing from my dragon form to my human form, and even knowing Olivier was an enemy. The dragon that slept in me was to be trusted, and I needed to find the dragon in my spiritual sea the next time I was in the River Moonstone house. Suddenly, the door to the study room opened and Aliona stepped inside. 
She was still dressed in the same outfit from the previous day's ceremony, but somehow, tiredness seemed to seep from her body. Her gemstone eyes had lost their luster, as if they'd gone completely dead. I'm sorry for my tardiness, Elder Julia. Aliona apologized with a graceful curtsy. There was an additional ritual for me to complete after the adoption ceremony finished. It ended up taking far longer than I thought it would. An additional ceremony? I asked with a furrowed brow. She hadn't mentioned any additional ceremonies when she'd first explained the adoption process to me. Could it have been involved with the appearance of the Dark Lady instead of the Hearth God? It was a sending off for the gods. Aliona smiled sweetly as she stood in front of the table. I needed to thank them for their continued blessings and the success of the adoption ceremony, as well as praying for Hatra's good fortune. There were faint tremors in her hands that she tried to hide by clasping them tightly, but I was able to notice it quickly. I frowned as I looked at Aliona. Is that why you look so tired? I quickly summoned the words to let me know the extent of her condition, but the result didn't help me understand why she seemed so exhausted. Classification, divinity. Condition, fatigued. Priority, sufficient rest will aid recovery. Danger, none. Status, fatigued. Could it have been summoning the Dark Lady instead of the Hearth God that caused her to be like this? Even though I'd gotten used to the immense displays of power from Aliona, I needed to remember her spiritual sea was still delicate, and anything could tip the scales and cause the fire of madness to burn her. I'd already seen her fall into deviation once, and it was something I'd never allow to happen again no matter what. What would you prefer? Aliona suddenly asked, and she tilted her head as she tapped her lips in thought. A ring? Or perhaps an earring? Um, what are you talking about? I blinked at the sudden change in topic and berated myself for spacing out. Oh dear, I've gotten ahead of myself. <laughs> Aliona laughed lightly as she pushed back a stray strand of hair from her face. I want to give you a gift. A gift? A slow smile spread across my face as I popped my chin in my hand. I couldn't help the thoughts of Aliona moaning as she writhed naked on top of me, and my eyes traveled the planes of her bare hips. Every time she moved, the fabric shifted and revealed tempting hints of her delicious body. I could definitely think of a gift she could give me. An enchantment for you. Aliona clarified as she leaned on the edge of the table and rearranged the fabric of her dress. I was hoping you'd be pleased with it, since it's something you've mentioned before. But you've already enchanted me, I laughed. Perhaps I want to keep you under more and more enchantments. Aliona murmured as she placed her hand on my cheek. So all you can think of is me. Aliona would always blush so prettily almost every time I flirted with her. But sometimes there would be a change in her countenance, and it would be like she'd gone from a naive priestess to a seductive princess. Sometimes the shift was subtle, just the teasing tone her voice would take on, but other times there would be a fire in her amethyst eyes that burned me up, and I loved it. <laughs> Julia let a book drop onto the table with such force the wooden legs of the table vibrated. And this is why the lessons are so important. I coughed and gave the elder an apologetic smile. Julia had just become my new mother, and now I was behaving unlike a proper heir. Not that behaving like a proper heir was going to stop me from flirting with Aliona, though. I mean, I was still a badass dragon, and I could do whatever I wanted. Aliona, you were saying about a ring or an earring? I asked as I steered the conversation back into safer territory and kept my eyes strictly on the books in front of me. Hmm? The priestess's tone had taken on a teasing sort of lilt as she leaned closer to me. Oh, yes. What sort of gift would you prefer from me? A ring on your finger, or perhaps for me to stake a claim on your ear with an earring? Now, now, my lady. Julia interrupted with a sigh. There's no need to tease him so. Yes, yes, you have a point. Aliona laughed lightly as she moved to sit down next to Julia. The enchantment is to grant you the all-speak, at least a version of it, so you may read the languages of Inati with ease. Though I am not as powerful as his eminence, or as wise as a sage's, it will allow you to read and speak every mortal language in this world of ours. 
If we had more time, I would have gone to the nearest city with a resident sage and commanded them to craft the gift so you would be blessed with the true extent of all speak. But we don't have the luxury of waiting for such a creation. I hope you can accept such a fact as an excuse. Whatever gift you give me will always be perfect, I said as I reached across the table and placed my hand on her clasped ones. I'm confident in your abilities to enchant something amazing and wonderful for me to use. Then, ring or earring? Aliona tilted her head and thought again. Either will serve perfectly for the enchantment, unless you'd prefer a bracelet or a necklace. Probably an earring. I glanced down at my hands and frowned. A ring might fall off when I change shape, and I could forget about it if I took it off, but not an earring. I find myself agreeing with Evan. Julia tapped her fan against one of the piles of books thoughtfully. It wouldn't do for him to have any fine jewelry either when we're a fallen city. Nor would it help our case if it was obvious you so greatly favored him. Or that I'm not from Anati. I grimaced as I remembered how the green glass sect had labeled me as a blasphemous existence. That would honestly not help our case at all. Thankfully. Smugness crept into Julia's voice as an ironic smile crossed her face. There's no way anyone in Hotra would have grown up with any knowledge of the outside world. I couldn't help the bitter laugh that left me at those words. Who would have thought Hotra's misfortune would turn out to be a potential get-out-of-jail-free card for us? So what do I need to start studying first? I smirked as I propped my chin in my hand. You're looking at one of the top students from my world, you know. First, the matter of the earring, Julia said as she tapped her fan on the table between us. Milady, if you would. Aliona's face lit up as she nodded and lifted her hand in the air. She slipped it through the fabric of reality and pulled out a small gemstone that matched both my eye color and Aliona's. It was half the size of a penny, and I couldn't help but wonder how she would attach it to my ear since I didn't have a piercing and the gemstone didn't appear to have a stud. How are you going to attach it? I looked from the amethyst to Aliona as excitement filled me. Are you going to use magic? Yes. It'll never fall from your ear. Aliona smiled as she nodded. You shouldn't feel any pain, but let me know if you do. I've never enchanted anything on the body of a dragon before. I can take a little pain, I smirked at Aliona as I leaned back in my chair. The priestess stood from the table with the gemstone in her hand and drew in a light breath as the beautiful jewel began to shine with a silver light. Transcend the tongues of the sky and the earth, from the children of the sun to the children of the moon, Aliona intoned as she brought the gemstone to her lips and pressed a gentle kiss to it. Grant this blessing unto this gem, and let none take that which has been willingly given. A warm and gentle light covered the precious stone, and I couldn't help but be comforted by it. Then the light suddenly receded back into the gem, and I frowned at the absence left by the gentle glow. This won't hurt a bit, Aliona suddenly whispered in my ear. The priestess was now standing at my side as she bent closer to me. Her cool fingers sought purchase on the flesh of my ear, and I had to repress the shudder of desire that ran through my body. Wait, what? I asked as I shook the desire from my thoughts and finally processed her words. What isn't going to hurt? Aliona winked as she pressed the amethyst gemstone into the lobe of my ear. It didn't hurt like cuts usually did, but it was like a strike of pure hot light went through my ears and then into my mind. I frowned as the sensation faded but I didn't feel any noticeably different. I lifted my hand to my ear, and when I pulled it away, there was no blood. It didn't hurt, did it? Aliona asked, and her warm breath tickled my ear. No, it didn't, I answered as I touched the gemstone in my ear. I felt it, though, like light ran through me. Is there a mirror in here? Here, Aliona giggled, and with her finger she drew a circle in the air in front of me. A flat silver surface glimmered in front of us, and I leaned forward to see my new accessory. There really was no back or metal to the amethyst gemstone. It was just there on my ear, almost as if it had been embedded or merged into my flesh. Fucking awesome! I grinned as I leaned back into my chair, and the silver magic mirror disappeared. What is this book called? Julia picked up one of the books from the table and absently tossed it to me. Hey! I mock-growled as I caught the book inches from my face. It's called, uh... 
the genealogy of the lords of Hutra. Perfect. Julia purred as she leaned back into her chair and opened her fan with a snap. Now we can get down to business, milady. Aliona nodded as she sat back down across from Julia and picked up an ink brush. Depending on the representative sent by the sect, you'll be judged harshly. Aliona explained as she twirled the ink brush in her hands. The White Jade sect has a long history of traditions they find sacred and will most assuredly be insulted by ignorance, even if it would be understandable in your case, Evan. Perhaps they would find it even more reason to despise you and label you as a heretic. They can just try. I gritted my teeth as I listened to Aliona's explanation. I've already saved Hatra when they were sitting around twiddling their thumbs while the king is at the breach. I won't make any promises about not fighting anyone, but if they start insulting my city and me, heads might roll, and my head won't be one of those. As I said, it depends on the representative. Aliona tilted her head with a sigh. I would be happy if I could say the White Jade sect is solely full of people who have dedicated themselves to serve Rama. But there are those who have snuck in while his eminence's attention has been on the breach. Snakes who wish to only advance their own ranks and rise in power so they can do as they wish. They would use this situation for their own benefit. Even I would have to tread carefully. My leaving the Cave of One Thousand Sages without permission could even be construed as treason if one of the more vicious representatives arrive. Treason? I echoed as I clenched my jaw. Can they even accuse you of that? Can't you get rid of them somehow? If they even tried to accuse my princess of treason, well, it wasn't going to be my fault if they were suddenly dead at my claws. They wouldn't accuse me outright, but they may be able to have me punished. Aliona sighed and set the ink brush down carefully on the table. Either way, it would be very unpleasant for the factions involved. As for their removal, I wish it could be so simple. Much of my life has been lived in forced seclusion, so I've had little opportunity to find talented people to build my own circle, just like his eminences, and protect Rama. Circle? I blinked at Aliona and knew she hadn't meant any type of geometry, but I wondered what she saw in the King of Rama. Talented people I can trust, Aliona explained, and a righteous fire that reminded me of the Dark Lady burned in her eyes. Much like a council, they would be my hands and fight alongside me for the sake of my dream. Aliona had never mentioned what her dream was to me, but she'd hinted at it with her every action. She wanted to protect and unify her people so none of them could ever be used as weapons again. I will be your hands, I replied, and my voice was firm and resolute. I'll stand by your side. Pardon? The priestess blinked in confusion at me for a moment before a wild smile spread across her face. You're my woman, I said and raised my chin defiantly. I'll help fight your battles and you'll help fight mine. Oh, my lover whispered as her cheeks began to turn red. Of course I am your woman, and yes, I'll... First, we must make you into a proper lord. Julia coughed behind her fan in amusement. How else will you help the princess clean out the sects in Rama? Where do we start, then? I smirked as I sat back down. I'm ready to rule and fight for Hatra. We have to do something about that informal language of yours first. Julia tutted at me as she pulled out her fan. There's no issue when it's solely among us who know you, but with representatives and eventually other nobles, you will have to become more formal. Although the future where you interact with other nobles and lords is still far off, we have to prepare you. Hotra's disgrace will be on your shoulders to bear as well, and you must rise above everything thrown your way unless you are sure you can beat them in a duel. As much as it pains me, saw any fight. Look, I sighed, I'm a dragon. Can't I just kill the fuckers that piss me off? I don't really care about... Before I could finish, the three Dryad sisters burst into the room and babbled almost unintelligibly in excitement as they gestured frantically out of the door. Pretty much the only words I was able to catch were healthy and strong, and I bit back a laugh as I noticed each of the Dryads had leaves tangled in their curly green hair. Calm down, girls. Julia chided the Dryads gently as they caught their breath. You can tell us what's going on if you speak one at a time. The dragon's blood! 
Polina exclaimed before she drew in a deep breath. They're ready to plant around the city. They've grown quickly, and there are a lot of them strong enough to be transplanted. They're so beautiful, too. Marina giggled happily as she threw her arms open wide. It's like they're glowing, and their flowers are tiny stars that fell from the heavens. Glowing? I echoed excitedly. Evan must study, Julia sighed. Ah, come on, Mom, I snickered as I glanced at Julia. I just got adopted, killed some giant vipers, rebuilt the aqueducts, and did a bit of studying. Can I go play outside? Oh, please, can we? Marina clasped her hands under her chin and fluttered her eyelashes. I promise we'll take good care of him, Lady Julia. Polina vowed as she placed her slender hands on my shoulders. We'll bring him right back after we're done with the trees. Trina added as she pulled one of my arms flush against her chest. We won't be naughty girls. A warm flush covered the tips of my ears, and I hoped my tan would be able to hide it. I glanced over at Aliona, but the princess only watched on with amusement. She had her chin propped on her hands and seemed to be biting back giggles. We'll continue your lessons once you've seen to the city. Julia waved me off with her fan as she rolled her eyes. Ladies, do take care of his lordship. I'd prefer for my son not to track mud through the city on his return. The dryads giggled and nodded as they latched on to me tighter. Then I'll be taking my leave. I paused for a moment as I thought about the best way to address the two women. Until later, your highness, my lady. Then I did my best attempt at a bow before the dryads dragged me out of the room and out into the city. Chapter 8 I was tugged down the cobbled streets of Hatra by the three Dryad sisters as they chatted away happily. Trina still had my arm tightly wedged into her chest, and while her breasts didn't have the same fullness as Aliona's, they were still deliciously soft and perky. The thought of the princess drew me up short, and I sighed. You should probably let go of me, I murmured to the Dryads as I slipped my arm out of Trina's grasp. You two as well. Why? Trina blinked up at me with curiosity in her dark green eyes. I like holding on to you. Why do we have to let go? Marina pouted on my other side as she tugged at my robes. You girls can't be all over me like that. I tried to explain carefully so I didn't upset any of the Dryads. I don't want Aliona to get jealous. The Dryads blinked at the same time before each one made a small O shape with their mouths. Then the sisters looked at each other before they all burst out into peals of laughter. You think Milady would get upset? Polina asked as she tilted her head. Because we flirt with you? Why would Milady get mad? Um, because we haven't exactly talked about what we are. I rubbed the back of my head as I tried to put my feelings into words. And I don't want to cheat on her. I, well, I really like her. And I want to make it work out between us. Oh. Paulina's light green eyes lit up with delight, and she spun in a happy circle. Milady and Evan would be very pretty together. That was not the reaction I expected from her, but I never knew what to expect when it came to the Dryads. Such pretty babies you'd have. Marina let go of my clothes in order to latch onto Paulina's arm. Wait, would they be called babies or hotchlings? Oh, and with such cute scales and itty-bitty tails. I don't know. I've never seen a baby dragon. Trina mused as she tilted her head in thought and tapped her chin. Wouldn't they be eggs? But Milady isn't a dragon. Polina interrupted her sister as she came to a stop. How would she carry an egg or even lay it? Oh. Trina frowned as she and her sisters stared at the ground in frustration. You may have a point there. I thought I heard a bit of a growl from one of them, but I couldn't be sure which one. My head was spinning, though, and I somehow had to get them back on topic. Girls! I pinched the bridge of my nose as I took in a deep breath. That wasn't the whole point of what I just said. You don't want to make babies with Milady? Polina asked innocently as she tugged on my clothing. No! My eyes snapped open as the thought of Aliona being pregnant with my child floated in my mind. I mean, yes, or maybe. I haven't thought that all through, and it's way too early to think about that. The point is, you can't flirt with me. 
I couldn't get the thought out of my head of marrying Aliona and having children with her. But that couldn't happen, could it? She was the precious princess of the nation, and I was a dragon. Wait a moment. I wasn't just a dragon. I was a noble now. Maybe that could be reality someday. But now wasn't the time to try and think about it. But why? Trina frowned in confusion as she looked at me. Milady won't mind if you have us too. There are always many partners for one person, especially a dragon lord such as yourself. Yes, she will, I argued, but then I choked on my words as I realized what the dryad had just said. Wait, what do you mean she won't mind? And aren't the three of you sisters? Isn't that weird to, uh, be together like that? Don't be silly! <laughs> Trina giggled as she covered her mouth with her hand. Dryads are born from nature. We aren't sisters by blood like humans are. If that's what concerns you, there isn't anything to worry about when you debauch us. You should ask Milady what she thinks. Marina smiled slyly as she trailed her hand down my chest. I don't doubt she has seen her share of harems in the Lord's mansions she's visited. Maybe ask Laika as well. She grew up with many parents. Most of us have, really. Milady might even like to watch one of us ride your cock. <laughs> Polina giggled as she covered her mouth with her slender hand. Would you like that? To see Milady consumed by lust and desire as you take one of us in front of her? My eyes widened at those bold words, and I tried to force away the image they summoned. Of Aliona's face flushed red with desire as she gasped and stroked herself with her fingers while Polina slammed herself down on my dick. Underneath my robes, my cock twitched. Uh, I started to say, but they kept going. Ooh, or maybe Milady should be riding your cock. Trina purred huskily as she traced her mouth with one finger. While I ride your face. My eyes immediately dropped down to Trina's slender and bare thighs as she slowly hitched up the fabric of her dress. I couldn't help but wonder how sweet she would taste if she would taste like honey or candy. Why do you get to ride his face? Paulina pouted as she tugged on Trina's arm. I want to be fucked by Evan, too. By this point, I had already lost the train of the conversation and could only think about the deliciously firm bodies of the dryads writhing underneath and over me as we fucked each other into oblivion. Okay, okay, let me think, Trina said as she moved to lean against me and slowly dragged her finger against my thigh. What if, instead of Milady riding his cock, Polina straddles Milady as Evan thrusts between the two? That leaves just Marina and I to figure out. What if Trina kisses Evan? Marina's sweet mouth formed a circle as she looked down past my waist. And I suck and lick his cock in between thrusts into Milady and Polina. As Marina knelt in front of me and placed her hand on my stiffened cock, I snapped back into reality. Whoa! I pulled Marina up and stepped away from the three dangerous dryads. No one is getting thrust into or sucked. Not even Milady? Paulina tilted her head as she leaned forward. But then who will take Evan's seed? Marina asked as she tapped her lips. Milady, obviously, Trina said as she rolled her eyes. Wait, look! I tried to stop them. But if I am sucking and licking him in between his thrusts into Milady and Polina, Marina pouted, it seems I should be able to swallow his seed as a reward for not getting my tunnel filled with his cock and... But in that plan of yours, I'm only kissing Evan! Trina groaned. I should be the one to feel his seed in my womb when he climaxes, since he wasn't penetrating me. Uh-uh-uh! <laughs> Polina giggled. You two have forgotten something very important. What's that? Marina and Trina asked as they looked at their sister. Lord Evan is a dragon, sillies. I'm sure he can come inside of all four of us many times during our lovemaking. There should be plenty of his seed to go around. Oh! The other two dryads sighed with happy smiles. That makes so much sense! Marina laughed. Can you three calm down? I started to say. But of course, they were still ignoring me. But that means we'll all have a chance to bear Lord Evan's dragon babies? Trina asked her sisters. I don't think anyone is going to have my kit. I tried. 
We still haven't figured out if they're hatchlings or babies yet, Marina pointed out. I think if we lay eggs, they will be hatchlings, Polina concluded as she scrunched up her nose. But if our wombs will be with the child, then they would be babies. Oh, I hope I have Lord Evan's baby in my womb. Trina sighed at me as she batted her eyelashes and patted her lean stomach. You haven't even received his seed yet. (laughs) Marina laughed as she playfully swatted her sister's arm. You can't be pregnant right now. Well, I mean afterwards, when I ride his cock and he fills me with his dragon lord spur- Ladies, I shouted, and the three of them twisted their heads to look at me. Look, um, I rubbed the bridge of my nose. I'm going to need to talk to Aliona and see what- She will love it. (laughs) Paulina giggled. She loves you, and so do we. So she'll want us all to be together and sharing in your thrusts, lovemaking, and then the spray of your seed. Then the four of us can be sister wives and take joy in caring for you and the beautiful babies, our hutchlings. Marina interrupted. Or hatchlings, yes, Polina agreed. Trust us, she will be overjoyed when you talk to her about this. It is the job of women to please their powerful husbands, and there is nothing more powerful than a dragon. Let's just go and see the dragon's blood, I muttered as I cleared my throat, adjusted myself under my robes, and started walking again. Okay. Marina smiled cheerfully as she grabbed onto Trina's hands. Somehow, we were able to arrive at the farms without any further shenanigans from the Dryad sisters, and I was able to maintain my sanity. The Dryads had tested not only my patience, but my willpower as well, and their words brought me sexual fantasies I didn't even think were possible before I'd come to this world. Were harems really that normal in Inati, or were the girls just pulling my leg? I really wanted to know, but I didn't know who I could ask. Julia was out of the question, especially now that she was my mother. I could probably ask my new dad, but only if I made sure Julia was out of hearing distance. But they'd barely had any contact with the outside world for a thousand years, so would the information Ruslan had about harems still be true? At this point, my best option was probably Aliona or one of the Blue Tree Guild members. The issue was bringing it up without seeming like an asshole. I sighed as we stepped through the archway that led to the walled farms, and then I caught sight of a head of dark blue hair and fox ears bobbing behind some pepper plants. Afra, I called out to the fox demi-human in charge of the farms. Afra peeked over the pepper plants in confusion and looked around her before she turned to the archway. My lord! She exclaimed, and her ears perked up when she caught sight of us. Welcome to the farms! If I knew you were coming today, I would have prepared a greeting, or a picnic, or some tea. Oh, I can put together a basket for you quickly if you'd give me a moment or two. Afra rushed toward us, and I met her halfway. Then she dropped into a quick curtsy as she balanced a basket full of peppers on her hip. Don't worry about it, I smiled as I patted her head. You didn't even know I was coming here. Hell, I didn't even know I was coming until those three beauties dragged me here. How can I not worry? Afra shook her head so hard her braids swung out behind her. You're our young Lord Evan now. You're not just Master Dragon anymore. I shrugged as I continued to pat Afra's head. The fox demi-human purred happily at my touch, and I smiled fondly. Afra really was so adorable I couldn't help but want to spoil her. I didn't know if it was my pack instincts that made me think like this, or if it was from the fox blood from my adopted father. If I had access to lab equipment, I would have drawn some of my blood before the adoption ceremony and then after it so I could compare the changes in my body. I knew my new father could control fire, but I didn't know if that would have been passed down with the adoption ceremony. More long afternoons in the River Moonstone house probably awaited me if I wanted to find that out. As I followed that train of thought, a fluffy gray tail in the far end of the rows of pepper plants caught my eye and my face lit up with excitement. Laika! I called out to my wolf friend cheerfully. Where have you been hiding? I walked over to where I had seen Laika, but there was nothing behind the plant. A frown slid across my face as I glanced down the row of plants and caught sight of the tip of her tail. There was no way I was going to let her keep hiding from me, so I brought up walls of stone around her and stalked toward her. Lord Evan, 
This humble warrior greets thee. Lyca murmured as she turned to face me rather sheepishly. Her usually erect furry ears drooped, and a dark flush covered her face. Congratulations on your adoption ceremony and the completion of the aqueduct. All of Hatra is proud to know you will lead this city to greatness. Lyca's sudden formal language confused me, and she refused to meet my eyes. Was this because of what happened during the Blue Tree Guild's interrogation? Or was there something else I was missing? Lyca, you don't have to talk to me like that. I placed my hands on her shoulders as I bent down to try and catch her gaze. We're friends. Friends, the demi-human echoed flatly. I frowned. Yes, friends. That means I'll always trust you to have my back, no matter what. I'll also always listen to you and do my best to not make a sudden decision. I thought those words would reassure her and cheer her up. Instead, her ears drooped further, and I could smell the salty tears welling up in her storm-colored eyes. Please, my lord, you are being too generous to someone like me. Like a drop to one knee, and her voice hardened. I am but a sellsword in the service of Hatra. I could not dare to presume to be anything more than a sword for Hatra. In fact, you should keep your distance from one such as me. If you would excuse me, my lord, I must attend to matters regarding the defense of the city. What I can promise you is I would die before the city is breached. That you can trust in. Lyca stood in a flash from where she was kneeling and darted up and over the wall before I could even open my mouth to reply. By the time I'd lowered the stone walls, she had disappeared from view, and all that remained of her was the scent of pine and storms. What the fuck? I frowned at the space she once occupied. I couldn't understand why she'd said she was nothing but a sellsword, or why she'd become so deferential all of a sudden. Even when the dryads and Afra came up behind me to drag me over to the dragon's blood saplings, I remained silent and deep in thought. It wasn't until the rich, clove-like perfume of the saplings began to overwhelm my senses that I really took in my surroundings. All around me were glowing, small shrub-like trees covered in crimson leaves and delicate white flowers. It was like we'd walked out onto a bloody field while it was snowing, and snowflakes had fallen onto the scarlet blood. The leaves of the dragon's blood were mostly vermilion, but at the center of the leaves was a drop of rich green. Around the leaves and the flowers was a faint glow. It wasn't exactly white, but more of a pearly and sort of luminescent color. I reached out and touched one of the tiny white flowers. The moment my fingers brushed the delicate petals, a jolt of electricity went through my mind, and the world swirled around me. Acid bubbled up my throat, and the sensation of flames licked up my arms as wire cut through my flesh. I gasped as I realized there was no fire consuming me. The feeling actually came from deep inside of me, all the way from the depths of my spiritual sea. Then a voice echoed through my head. It burns and digs deeper into my flesh. What irony! The more I fight to escape, the more I am trapped inside of this madness. The dragon attempted to save me, but he was a fool. I can never escape this hell. Asher, I somehow heard Asher inside of my mind. It wasn't his voice, but it was like his thoughts had reverberated inside of my head. But how did I hear him? Could it have been because I touched the flower? I looked from my hand to the dragon's blood. There was only one way to know. I reached out again, and the moment my fingers grazed the crimson leaves of the dragon's blood, my spiritual sea stirred, and Asher's voice echoed inside of my mind once more. Why is there nothing but pain? O oh, gods in the heavens above, why have you forsaken me to this darkness? Why was I not saved from this poison that dragged me down into the depths of hell? What crime is it that I have been forced to pay for with my existence? Why was I forsaken and forced to fight for this malice? I stared at the sapling and then back at my own hand before I turned and ran toward the entrance. There was no way I could ignore the desperation in Asher's voice. I had to go and find a way to help him. My lord? Aphra stood and called out after me. Where are you going? To find Lady Julia and Aliona, I shouted, but I didn't turn back as I ran as fast as I could out of the farms.
Asher's voice had been desperate as it echoed in my mind, desperate for an end to the madness and pain that tormented him. I knew the miasma controlled him and had treated him like a puppet on razor-sharp strings, but I didn't know how it gained control of him or how to cut him free of those poisonous strings. What made it worse was I could feel lightning coursing through my body, and it was difficult to move. It wasn't painful, but it was like I had too much energy and too much power inside of my body, and it was having problems settling inside of me. I had no idea just what the fuck happened, but if anyone would know, it would be either Elder Julia or Aliona. Julia was the keeper of knowledge of Hatra, and she'd buried herself in the underground library searching for any secrets that would protect Hatra from the miasma. Aliona was the divine princess of Rama, and had the power to purify miasma out of existence. Between the two of them, they had to know something about what just happened to me. With those thoughts drowning out everything else, I crashed straight into Ruslan. Evan, what's the hurry? Ruslan asked as he steadied me, and his ears twitched with concern. You look like you've seen a ghost. I don't know what's happening, I confessed as I bit back a pained wince. I heard Asher inside of my mind, and now it's like lightning is inside of me. I was heading back to the library to see if Julia or Aliona knew what was going on. Concern darkened Ruslan's emerald eyes as he looked at me for one short moment. We're heading to the River Moonstone House. That'll settle your spiritual sea. Ruslan slung my arm around his shoulder as fire engulfed his other hand. I'll have Julia and Aliona meet us there. Okay, I said as my father's summoned firefox sped away from us in the direction of the underground library and we turned in the direction of the River Moonstone House. A nervous energy coursed through my body, like lightning was constantly striking all of my nerves. I wasn't weak but I trembled as we walked. When we finally reached the River Moonstone house, Aliona and Julia were already waiting for us there. Asher, he was in my head! The words tumbled out of my mouth in a jumbled mess. He was just there, and then his voice, it was like, wow, just, I don't even know. I sighed as the turbulent lightning inside of me finally settled once I was surrounded by the moonstone and marble walls. You heard Asher inside of your head? Julia asked as she stepped toward me and concern lined her face. It was only for a split second at first. I looked down at my hands as I remembered the miasma that tortured and controlled Asher. But as I kept touching the dragon's blood, his voice slowly became stronger. Was he saying anything? Aliona asked as she pressed a cool cloth to my forehead and stroked my hair. I leaned into the princess's soothing touch, and my turbulent spiritual sea began to settle even more with each gentle stroke of my hair. No. I shook my head and frowned as I tried to explain what I had heard. It wasn't Asher speaking to me, but more like something inside of him? N no. Like I was sensing his thoughts inside of me. Or maybe his feelings. Is this making any sense, or am I just rambling? How strange this all is, Julia murmured as she paced in front of us and tapped her cheek with her fan. And it started when you touched the dragon's blood? Evan already tried to reach Asher once, Ruslan interjected from where he leaned against a wall. The link has already been established, so anything could trigger or create a stronger connection between the two of them. Maybe it's the purifying essence of the dragon's blood. Aliona's brow was furrowed as she continued stroking my hair. Since the dragon's blood protects and purifies everything it surrounds, and it's currently being planted within and around the city, its power is reaching Asher. Aliona's words made sense to me, but then wouldn't they have happened earlier? The dragon's blood had been planted inside of the city for some time now, unless it was because I needed to be in direct contact with the dragon's blood. Even though he's inside of my spiritual sea? I tilted my head back in order to look at Aliona. Can it reach that far? Yes, Aliona nodded as she plucked the cool cloth from my head and placed it on the table. Perhaps you should spend more time meditating in the River Moonstone house. Julia glanced over at Ruslan as she frowned. He's going to have to spend more time meditating than we thought. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. I winced as I realized just how hectic my schedule was about to become. I need to get this under control, and if I can talk to Asher, we could get so much information from him. 
As it is, it's too late for us to continue any proper lessons. Julia sighed as she stopped pacing behind me. Then she stooped to press a kiss on my forehead before she headed for the door. Wait, where are you going? I blinked in surprise at the elder's actions and turned to face her. To speak with Moskal and Maxim. Julia smiled as she placed her hand on the door. They may know more about the dragon's blood interaction with the miasma and other herbs that may help you and Asher. She was right. Maxim and Moskal were both herbalists, and the former had come from the village where the dragon's blood was once protected. They would be able to find out more about why the plant caused that strange reaction between Asher and me. Thank you for everything. I couldn't call Julia mother, not yet, but she was still family, and I hoped she knew that. Of course. You are my precious son now. Julia's expression softened, and she started to slip through the door, but not before she called one last thing over her shoulder. Don't forget to eat. Now, come along, Rustlin. Wait, but... Rustlin began just as Julia yanked him along behind her. The door closed behind the two elders, and I slumped to the ground as I felt the River Moonstone house continue to settle my nerves. What a day it had been, and it was still pretty early considering everything that happened. It was barely afternoon, and I was already exhausted. I sighed and glanced over to see what Aliona was doing. The priestess was deep in thought as she sat across from me. A sigh left Aliona's perfectly painted lips, and she rested her head in her hand. Suddenly, I wondered if Aliona knew why Lyca was avoiding me. The two of them were close friends, and even if the wolf demihuman was avoiding me, I doubted she would avoid Aliona. Lyca was always a bit like an overprotective puppy when it came to the Divine Princess, and it always brought a smile to my face to watch them interact. Is there something on your mind, Evan? Aliona asked as she glanced up at me and pushed a strand of hair behind her ear. You're thinking quite loudly over there. I couldn't help but blink at her words. Honestly, I really wouldn't be surprised if she could read minds. But I kind of hoped she wasn't able to. I really didn't want to think she knew how desperately I desired her and everything I wanted to do to her just from reading my mind. Honestly, I'd much prefer to show her. Still, I had to get my mind out of the gutter because that wasn't what I wanted to do at the moment. Aliona, do you know why Lyca has been avoiding me? I frowned as I rested my weight on my elbows. Lyca admires you greatly. You must know this. Aliona tilted her head as she considered me. Really? I furrowed my brow. Because I think she hates me. She has to. I don't understand why she would act like this otherwise. I think I may know what troubles her. Aliona said quietly as her gemstone eyes grew melancholic. Lyca is quite the honorable warrior, and her emotions have snowballed. From the shame of what occurred with the prisoners to the desires of her own heart, she thinks denying herself is the only right thing to do. Denying herself? I glanced up at Aliona and wondered what she meant by that. Come now, Evan. Aliona shook her head, and the golden flower ornaments in her hair chimed delicately. Don't be purposefully obtuse. Just as you've stolen my heart, you've stolen hers. Maybe things would have been different if I hadn't allowed my own heart to take control instead of my head. You and Lyca could have been happily in bed right now. Really, this was my fault to begin with. I didn't take into consideration her own desires. If I hadn't have loved you, maybe Lyca would still be smiling. I stood the moment I heard her words and knelt in front of her. My instincts raged to comfort her, and the sight of her tears worried me. Aliona, none of this is your fault. I reached out to wipe away the tears on the princess's face, and then my mind blanked for a moment at her words. Wait, did you just say you love me? I do. I love you so much. It hurts. Aliona put her hand over mine and placed it over her heart. But I am not the only one hurting. Lyca has become the sister of my heart. And I wish for my happiness to be hers as well. Does she have a place in your heart? Do I? My heart skipped a beat and then took off at a gallop. She loved me. It wasn't a one-time thing between us, and everything I felt about the beautiful princess was reciprocated. Aliona loved me. 
The beast in my chest preened and roared in triumph, and I had to stifle the urge to shred Aliona's dress to pieces and take her on the floor of the River Moonstone House. Not only was I a dragon with awesome powers in a new world, but now a princess loved me. This was a fucking dream come true. Aliona, I love you too, I said as I pressed my forehead against hers and moved her hand to my heart. And I do have feelings for Laika, but... Evan, I do not think we are on the same page. A small laugh fell from Aliona's lips as she kissed me. In your world, are there no seraglios? Seraglios? I frowned at the word and then promptly blushed as I realized what she said. A harem? I swallowed heavily as I remembered how the Dryad sisters had teased me. So, harems were actually a thing in Anati. Forget just falling into an amazing fantasy world. This was like I was in a legit game or show. Fuck! How was I supposed to wrap my head around all of this? Aunt Emma never raised me to have more than one girlfriend. That wasn't something socially acceptable back on Earth anymore. But, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? And I was a dragon. Dragons did hoard treasure. And what was a more valuable treasure than beautiful women? Yes. Aliona purred as she leaned back with a wry smile on her face. One of the nobles of the sword is said to have over four hundred consorts in her harem, and even his eminence has a harem full of wives. My eyes widened at the thought of having four hundred lovers. There was no way that was even feasible. How would anyone even have time to sleep with all of them? But hey, I was a dragon, and I did seem to have supernaturally improved stamina. I need a moment to take this in. I looked up at the ceiling of the room and drew in a breath. What are you telling me exactly? You're okay with this? With Laika? Perhaps we are rushing, but I don't care. Aliona nuzzled my chin as she slipped into my lap. I want Laika to be happy, and more importantly, for you to be happy. Aliona shifted in my lap and moved so she could wrap her legs around my waist. Then she let out a small gasp as my clothed cock grazed the apex of her thighs. How am I going to talk to her, though? My hands drifted down the deliciously bare flesh of Aliona's thighs, and I absentmindedly dragged my fingers in circles. She keeps avoiding me, and abducting her won't exactly make her feel better. I looked down to where Aliona was wrapped around me, and the thin fabric of her silk dress shifted to reveal her bare pussy. My blood thudded furiously in my ears and into my cock at the sight. I didn't know why a princess was always so consistently improper, but I could happily live with her never covering her swollen lips. That just meant I could easily slip inside of her whenever and wherever I wanted to. I can solve that. Aliona slipped away and stood in front of me with a grin. Give me your hand. A soft groan left me as her delicious warmth and sexy body disappeared from my arms. I liked where this was going, and after the teasing from the three Dryad sisters earlier today, I had a lot of stress pent up. Maybe she was going to show me a magic trick, like making all of her clothes disappear in the blink of an eye. What are you doing? I tilted my head in curiosity as I stood and grabbed her soft hand. The priestess smirked at me, but didn't answer. Then, a moment later, a wave of purity washed over me as she summoned her magic. Make a path to the distant place in my memory. Transcend both time and space. Aliona murmured, and her hands and eyes glowed silver. And make both places the same. Everything became silver as the world around us shifted, and we tumbled through time and space. It was strangely similar to how I'd ended up in Anati, but instead of a new world, we suddenly stood in front of Laika. It was Laika's room, and she stared at us in confusion as she stood from her pillow-covered bed in the wood-paneled chamber. Off to the side, a pair of curtained French doors led off to a balcony. I could see armor neatly stacked on shelves along one of the walls, and an array of weapons were scattered in neat piles all over the room. A gleaming sword was stretched out on a desk, and most of the tables in the room, if they weren't covered in weapons, had books on them. Milady, what are you doing here? Laika blinked in shock as she saw me standing behind Aliona. My lord, I don't know what I did to deserve a visit, 
If it's about the prisoners from the Green Glass Sect, I can assure you none have been mistreated, and the guards are following your orders perfectly. The wolf demi-human was still dressed in her usual skin-tight leather outfit, but her bracers and gorget had been removed. The leather laces that kept her clothing tightly on were loose, and I caught glimpses of her olive skin peeking through. Laika. Power dripped from Aliona's voice, and it filled the room with seductive energy and want. Dear, darling Laika. My cock twitched at the sound of Aliona's purring voice, and I bit back a strangled groan. I wanted to bury my cock into one of the two gorgeous women in the room, preferably both at the same time. Yes, milady. Laika's ears cocked forward as she took a step closer to us. Would you grant me a wish? Aliona asked as she opened her arms to Laika and smiled gently. Anything. I'll do anything for you. Laika rasped as she buried her face in Aliona's neck and inhaled deeply. Anything that milady commands. I gritted my teeth at the sight and blinked away the seductive images that came to mind of Laika sucking on one of Aliona's breasts as I pounded into Laika's tight pussy. Then perhaps you'd grant me this very selfish wish, Aliona whispered into Laika's ear as she looked at me. Would you join me in Evan's bed and his heart? My eyes widened at what Aliona said, even though I knew what she'd been planning on doing. Still, it was one thing to talk about doing it, and another thing to see her actually do it. The princess shot me a wicked smile before she pressed a kiss to Laika's temple, and the wolf warrior's ears shot straight up. Milady! Laika looked up to stare at Aliona in shock. I wouldn't dare to dream of such a thing. I couldn't, wouldn't, try to slip between the two of you. I'm not asking you to step between us, but to join us. Aliona led Laika to where I stood quietly. Would you not become the sister of my heart? Do you... do you both mean this? Laika's ears flattened on her head as she looked between Aliona and myself. I am allowed to love you both. To love Evan as a woman. To love you as the sister of my heart. I give you both my blessing. Aliona pressed a kiss to Laika's cheek, and then mine as she placed Laika's hands in my own. Laika, you were the first person I saw when I came into this world. The words I'd held back tumbled from my lips, and I held tightly onto Laika's hands. You were like a goddess of war, and are one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. I couldn't not love the way you lived, the way you threw all of yourself into everything. Don't run away from me anymore. Be a part of my life, the same way Aliona is. Stay by my side, no matter what happens. Aliona winked at me as she stepped out of the room and closed the door behind her. Just before the door slid closed, I caught sight of a soft smile on the princess's beautiful face. Laika didn't respond to my words. Instead, she went up on tiptoe and pressed her lips against my mouth. I opened under the insistent pressure and her tongue was immediately wrapped around mine. She groaned into my mouth as I pulled her flush against my body. Then her fingers buried themselves in my thick hair, and she tugged on the strands to pull me closer. My fingers dug into the firm flesh of her ass, and her tail twitched happily. You have too many clothes on. Laika gasped as she pulled away to breathe. Her fingers trailed down the length of my chest, and they stopped just above my throbbing cock. Unless you want me to rip this off you, I suggest you strip, I growled as I glanced down at Laika's leather-clad body and raised an eyebrow at her. That goes for you as well. Laika's hot gaze dropped down to my crotch as she untied the laces of her clothing. You aren't the only one with claws here. I grinned at Laika as I shrugged off my robes and watched as every inch of her olive skin came to view. Where Aliona was soft and delicate, Laika was toned muscle. The countless hours she'd put into training were clearly visible, and I'd let myself drink in the sight of her beautifully naked body. Her perky breasts were full, smaller than Aliona's, but still larger than most of the other women I'd seen. My eyes trailed further down to the gray tuft of curls that covered her pussy, and my eyes widened at the sight that waited for me there. She was already dripping wet, and I'd barely even touched her. 
A wide smile crossed my face as I picked up the wolf warrior in my arms and jumped into the bed with her. No need for foreplay. Sex with Eleona had been gentle and soft, but it was entirely different with Laika. She was almost feral as I slammed into her pussy, and her hips tried to keep up with my frantic pace. We were on her bed, and she was on all fours in front of me. My hands dug into her waist as I pulled her closer to my hips, and I reached even deeper. She mewled loudly each time my thick cock slid into her, and she tried to shove back against me to force it deeper. More, please. Laika whimpered underneath me as she grasped onto the pale blue bedsheets desperately. Don't, don't stop. I need you deep in me, Evan. I reached down around her to tease her swollen breasts, and a strangled shriek left her mouth. What's wrong? I murmured as I nibbled on her ear. Don't tell me you're close already. Slowly I slid out of Laika until only the head of my cock remained inside her, and then I paused for a moment as she whimpered wordlessly underneath me. Her whole body trembled as she tried to remain upright on the bed, and she continued to clench her walls around me. Then I slammed as deep as I could into her just as I tweaked her already sensitive nipples. Oh, gods! Evan! Laika's pussy clamped down around my cock and tightened like a vice as she convulsed and came. I can't! Oh, Evan! Please! She slumped forward on the bed in a satisfied puddle, but I was still hard and I wasn't done with her. I slid in and out of Laika at a faster speed, her glistening lips spread around my slick shaft with each thrust, and a strangled whimper left her each time the tip of my swollen cock hit her womb. Fill me! Fill me up! Please, Evan! My lord! I need your seed! Make me yours! Her tail twitched rapidly and brushed over my stomach as she let out another strangled shriek into the bed. Yes! I growled as I slammed as deep as I could into Laika. You are mine now! I stayed buried deep inside of her as I shot out load after load of my cum into her womb. Laika came again and her pussy tried to squeeze me dry as she tightened even more around me. Then we were both finished and we gasped out lungfuls of air as if we had just emerged from swimming in the deepest of waters. The wolf demi-human couldn't even speak. She only growled softly as I pulled out. Then I dropped onto the bed next to her, and she rolled over to bury her face into my chest. My hands tightened around her ass as I pulled her close to me, and I nuzzled the back of her neck. But then her body twitched sporadically from the aftermath of her intense orgasms. For a moment, I thought about working up to another passionate session of lovemaking. But it had been a long day, and the wolf warrior was barely conscious. It was better to give her some time to recover, and we could continue exploring each other's bodies another day. Laika somehow managed to cuddle closer, and she slung one of her legs over my hip so she was as close to me as she could possibly be. My hands trailed to her firm ass, and I hummed in satisfaction. Laika's breasts were pressed tightly against my chest, and my cock was pressed right up against her stomach. Just like that, the two of us fell asleep as our exhaustion took over. When I woke up, it was late at night, and I had the sudden urge to see the night sky, so I left Laika asleep and walked out of the Blue Tree Guild airship. Once I was out under the open sky, all of the stars glittered proudly and illuminated the city of Hatra. I stood there and just looked at the glimmering stars and three pale moons for a while. I almost couldn't believe what had happened today. From meeting a god to becoming nobility and then having a princess confess her love to me? Not to mention, I had somehow ended up in a three-way relationship with two beautiful women, and that was somehow normal in this world I'd ended up in. I really needed to thank whoever was looking out for me in heaven. With a single thought, I shifted from my human form and into my dragon body. My muscles grew, and scales slithered over my skin as I turned into a black dragon. It was surprising how much more comfortable I felt in this form, but then again, I was actually a dragon pretending to be a human now. Or was I a human turned dragon trying to be a human again? Maybe I was something else entirely. Without waiting for a moment to pass, I launched myself into the air, spread my wings, soared over the city of Hatra, and then higher into the air over the walls. 
The buildings disappeared quickly from view as I reached the desert and followed the river in a languid flight. I was sure to avoid the Crimson Canyons, though, since I didn't want to run into the Crimson Dragon tonight. But there was something strange in the air that made my nose and senses twinge in discomfort. It was something dark and cruel, followed by the familiar scent of putrid blood. The strange sensation was almost like the miasma I'd encountered before in Hatra, and later on in my spiritual sea. But there was something more to it. It wasn't just a corruptive presence that wanted to taint and destroy everything good and living in Anati, but something that tasted of pure madness. The loneliness of regret and bone-chilling hatred reached out to me from where I sensed the dark cruelness, and I bared my fangs in a silent snarl. I had to go and see what it was. I couldn't let such a possible huge threat exist near my home like that. What if it was a horde of corrupted corpses, or demons just waiting to savor and feast upon the life growing inside of Hatra once again? With that resolve in mind, I angled my wings toward this new threat and braced myself for what I would find. Chapter 9 I soared over the newly renovated aqueduct system, along the river that fed Hatra and followed the strange presence that made my blood run cold. Around me, the temperature in the air plummeted as well, and a chill settled in my mighty bones. The presence lurked just ahead and shifted with the air currents as it taunted me. It smelled vaguely of fresh blood and rotting flesh tinged with the acrid scent of brimstone and ash. With my powerful wings, I made quick work of crossing the distance, and I leaned near the entrance of the Crimson Canyon. I narrowed my eyes at the entrance of the canyon and made a mental note to keep an ear out for the Red Dragon. This was only a scouting mission, I didn't want to fight with anyone, and I definitely did not have the time to spare for it. I was just out here following a hunch in order to prove it wrong. Hopefully, I'd find nothing and head back to Hatra. Once there, I'd crawl back into Laika's bed, bury my face into her breasts, and fall asleep until morning. Once the two of us woke up, I planned to bury my cock deep within her tight pussy for a second and third round. That was my plan, and I didn't want anything to deviate from it. The vaguely familiar corruptive presence didn't continue on into the canyon, but stopped right outside of it. I followed the strange presence to a rock wall right outside of the Crimson Dragon's territory. I couldn't see anything wrong at first, but then I noticed the sand close to the rock face seemed mottled, almost as if it had been bruised somehow. Black and purple spots tinged the golden sand and made it seem as if the area was rotting away. Just as I flew closer to it, Asher's panicked voice echoed in my mind. Get away! Get away from that! Don't get any closer! Fly, fly now, as far away as you can! What's wrong, Asher? I spoke aloud and hoped the man would be able to hear me inside of my spiritual sea. What is it? Why are you so afraid of a rock face? Suddenly, the air in front of the rock shifted, like how an airport tarmac would distort from the heat of an airplane while you were looking at it. Hatred emanated from where the rock face shimmered, and I heard the cracking of stone. Darkness and death, a portal to the netherworld ruled by the demon kings. Demons, demons will come through that rift and lay waste to everything you have ever known and loved. Memories that weren't mine bombarded my mind, and I faltered in my flight as the images flickered behind my eyes. I saw a small village in the mountains, full of stone houses with mossy roofs, burn in the night as lightning struck all around it. The lightning fell in crimson strikes, and everywhere it fell, the land shattered and rotted away as if it was a putrid disease. There was a rift in the ground, like someone had dragged a giant claw and torn up the earth, and from that rift wafted clouds of the malevolent miasma. Screams echoed through the village, just as I noticed the hideous monsters that trailed out of the rift in a steady flow. I hadn't noticed them before because of the miasma, but now there was no way I could miss their misshapen bodies and clawed limbs as they dragged along the ground. They looked like mutated insects, with too many eyes and limbs as their scaled bodies reflected the lightning. Jagged spikes extended from their backs, and blood dripped from their fangs as they sniffed the air. There was only one thing they could be. These were the demons that sought to destroy the world of Anati. 
Just as the demons were about to reach the village, the memories fled from my mind, and I was conscious of suddenly standing in front of the rock face. Asher? I spoke softly to the tormented man. Were those your memories? Who knows? It has been so long. That could have been my home or a village that fell victim to the whims of fate. Either way, there's no escape from the demons once they start rampaging. All you can do is die. I didn't know how I was able to suddenly speak to the man without having to claw my way through my spiritual sea to reach him. But it didn't matter right now. He'd become part of my pack, even if it was in a weird way, and I was going to prove I was strong enough to take care of everyone. The Demon Gate would never destroy Hatra. It wouldn't be like the village in the memories Asher had shown me. We would fight, and we would live. No, we won't lay down and die. My claws tore up the ground underneath me as I crouched. We know about the Demon Gate, and we can do something about it before the demons begin to pour out of it. None of us will die. So you say. So you think. You can't defeat the demons. Yeah, that's what you said about your army. I rolled my eyes as I flapped my wings and rose into the air. And look who came out on top. We did. Not to mention, no miasma has attacked the city at all recently. We're stronger than you think. And the demons are not as weak as you believe. They are stronger than everything you've faced. Perhaps even stronger than behemoths. Nothing in this world was meant to face them in battle. They are death and corruption. You cannot defeat death. I shook my head at Asher's words and knew he was wrong. Hatra and I were slowly but surely getting stronger, and besides, I had been an EMT studying to be a doctor back on Earth. Defeating death used to be my day job, and I had no problem signing up for that again. I flew back to Hatra and swiftly glided closer to the ground as I reached the walls. My best bet was to find Ruslan and summon the council so we could figure out what to do and how demon gates could even be closed. Damn it! Everything had deviated from the fucking plan. I doubted anyone would be getting any sleep tonight, and not in the fun way. I landed near the infirmary, and then I shifted quickly back into my human form as I ran toward the building that housed my immediate family and Aliona. The building had been a clever idea on my part. Six of the seven floors were a separate suite of rooms, and the bottom floor served as a sort of common area. I'd constructed the building before the first council meeting, but maybe it would serve well enough for a meeting space. I ran up the stairs to the second floor and skidded to a stop in front of the mahogany door. Pops! I pounded on the heavy door and hoped to God he had a plan for dealing with demon gates. Pops! Wake up! It's an emergency! Eh? Pops! Rusland opened the door and stumbled out of the room with bleary eyes. Evan! What's wrong? Behind him came Julia as she tightened the belt on her loose robe. Her light brown hair was in a disheveled braid, and she pushed her messy hair over her shoulder. Oh, what's all this racket about? Julia yawned as she leaned on Ruslan's shoulder. Such a ruckus isn't befitting of a lord, especially so late at night. Somehow, my new mother was able to send out disapproving vibes and be a formidable sight while being sleepily disheveled. I'd have to figure out how she did that one day. There's no time for any of that. I shook my head as the hair on the back of my neck stood up at the memory of the demon gate. We need the council right now. There's a rift near the canyons, and my asthma is leaking out of it. Every sign of sleepiness vanished from Ruslan and Julia's bodies as they stiffened and their eyes widened. They shared one look before Julia moved past me and headed up the staircase. I'll wake my lady and bring her down. Julia's back was ramrod straight, and she gracefully but quickly disappeared up the stone staircase. I'll send a message to the others about the demon gate, Ruslan said as he ran his hand through his hair and frowned. Let's get down there. In his free hand, an orb of crimson flames came to life and split into even tinier orbs. Then the orbs darted away in different directions and easily passed through the stone walls. We went down the staircase and stood in the darkened common area. Ruslan snapped his fingers and the crystal lamps on the walls lit up. Then he leaned against the wall instead of taking a seat at the table in the room. I glanced from his hand to my own and wondered if I could eventually do something like that. It would definitely be useful in sending messages. The Blue Tree Guild had their gorgets and Aliona her spirits, but I had no way of contacting anyone. 
Can I learn to do that? I asked as I pulled out a chair and sat down at the table. It's pretty useful, and how can I be a dragon if I can't breathe fire? I remember how confused Ruslan was when he found out I couldn't breathe fire, and it had turned into a bit of a joke between us. It only became funnier after the adoption since my father was a fox and I was a dragon. Of course, Ruslan smirked at me as he stepped closer and ruffled my already messy hair. You're my son, after all. Out of the corner of my senses, I felt an intense spike of power and glanced over to the entrance of the room. It was like a star had descended to earth and was coming closer to us. I blinked, and the room grew brighter just as Aliona came barreling in. Her white nightdress fluttered behind her and almost seemed to blend in with her hair. A demon gate? The divine princess demanded as she came to a stop in front of me, and her chest heaved. Are you sure? There's no doubt about it. I winced as I remembered the rift and its disgusting presence. How did you find it? Aliona's amethyst eyes were tinged with silver as she slammed her hands down on the table, and her power rolled off her in worried waves. I caught a scent of it on the wind, I explained. Then I flew into the desert toward it. Asher started screaming inside of my head the moment I got close. Julia and Moskal came into the room just then, and Moskal took a seat at the table. His sister walked over to where Ruslan stood and entwined her hand with his. How far from the city was the demon gate? Julia asked, and her voice was thoughtful as she glanced over to the room's entrance. The advisors from the Blue Tree Guild and Laika had arrived, and they were all just as disheveled as the elders were. Laika immediately walked over to where Aliona stood and rubbed reassuring circles on her back. What on earth is all this about a demon gate? Pyotr's eyes were sharp as he glanced between Ruslan and me. Did I hear that message right? And we have another battle on our hands, or did this old man miss here? There's a demon gate close to the entrance of the Crimson Canyons. I folded my arms across my chest as I leaned back in my chair. Nearly right in it. My asthma was leaking out of it and swirling in the air. Has there ever been anything like that before? No, never. Julia's reply was immediate. Even back when the city was still standing a thousand years ago, there was never a demon gate in the area. Then someone had to have opened it. A sour taste settled into my mouth, and I frowned. What kind of power would a person need to have in order to do something like that? A lot of power. Aliona answered as she sank into a chair, and her face paled. They would have to be on the level of a sage or a saint. Or they did something else if they didn't have enough power within themselves. The silver-tinged anger didn't leave her eyes, and it only grew as she clenched her fists tightly. Whatever she was thinking about, it wasn't something that made her particularly pleased. Something else, Pyotr echoed and looked at Aliona with curiosity. What do you mean? If there's enough bloodshed in an area, Aliona said bitterly as she covered her eyes with her hand. And if the proper rites are performed, the fabric of time and space can be ripped apart to open a gate to the netherworld. It didn't take any of us long to realize what Aliona meant by bloodshed. You're talking about sacrifices. I hadn't been in this world for a very long time, but I could guess enough from what I knew about magic thanks to games and Aunt Emma's predilection toward the supernatural. Sacrificing people in order to rip open a gate to hell. Blood magic. Aliona uncovered her eyes and sighed as she ran her hands through her hair. They took the lives of others and used their pain and suffering to charge themselves up enough so they could open the rift. I've read reports about rifts having been opened up in this manner, but I never thought I'd see one. Did you smell any fresh blood? Everyone looked at me, and the tension in the room was so thick I could barely breathe. No, none at all. I shook my head as I remembered how the area had smelled. It just smelled like fire and rot. Then we're dealing with a sage or a saint. Aliona sighed in relief, and most of the tension left her body. Hopefully not the latter. What's the difference between the two? I leaned forward as I tried to remember if I'd read anything about them. A saint has a body blessed either by the heavens or by hell. Aliona drew in a deep breath as she let her hands fall in her lap. They can withstand the cruelties of time and their strength is close to the gods. They have transcended the boundary between mortality and immortality. A sage's body is far weaker, and although their lifespan is often long, they are only mortals. Rot and decay will eventually take them to their graves if they are not slain on the battlefield. A sage? 
Somehow that sounded vaguely familiar to me. I needed to try and think back to when and where I'd heard the word mentioned. Maybe I should even try to talk to Asher later and see what he knew about sages. I got the feeling Asher was far older than he seemed, and there was no knowing what secrets he had inside of his head. Hopefully they would be secrets that would help me protect Hatra. Your Highness, Pyotr interrupted as he turned to face Eliona. Can you close it? With your divine power, surely this won't be something impossible to ask of you. I can. Aliona stood from the table and glanced at her hands for a moment before she looked up again. But I would need time. How much time? Like a frown as she stood behind Aliona. I've never seen a demon gate being closed, but I've heard it takes a large amount of power to be able to do so. I'm not sure. Aliona pushed her hair from her face and pulled it back up into a high tail that remained in place with a barely visible string of power. I'd have to see the rift first so I can know how strong it is, and then I'd be able to place a temporary seal on it. Just temporary? I stood and paced angrily. We need to make sure the gate is closed and nothing can get out of it. What if demons attack Hatra, or even someone else? Travelers and merchants going around the canyons? I couldn't get the memory of the destroyed village out of my mind even though the memory didn't belong to me. All I kept seeing was the faces of my people overlapping with those villagers. The fear that something like that could happen to my people fueled my anger even though I normally wouldn't have snapped at Aliona. I need time. Aliona's gemstone eyes glowed fiercely as she walked over to me and placed her hands on my shoulders. Time to study the rift in order to know which spell is the correct one to use for sealing it closed for all eternity. Time in order to recover my strength so the spell doesn't collapse while I'm in the midst of sealing the rift. Time is the most important thing, but we never have enough of it. Even so, you found the demon gate before any demonic horde left it. You've won us a great amount of time to fight back and find a solution. Then let's go. I grabbed Aliona's hands and led her to the entrance of the common area. I'll take you there now. I'll go with you. Laika followed behind the two of us with a determined expression on her face. It's better to have another pair of eyes while Milady is sealing the demon gate. I couldn't imagine a better person to have by our side. I grinned at the wolf demi-human and reached out a hand to her. Thank you, my lord. Laika grasped my hand tightly and let out a small smile as she looked between Aliona and me. We'll have a meal ready for your return, Julia promised as she tiredly took a seat. May the gods watch over you and carry you back to Hotra safely. I led the two women out of the common area and out of the building. The three moons of Inati shone beautifully above, but I couldn't help the shudder of anger and fear that went down my spine. We'd fought so hard for Hatra to finally have some semblance of peace, but it seemed fate wouldn't allow that. No matter what, it was just one thing after another, as if we were being tested by some otherworldly power. We probably were being tested by the gods of this world or by fate. I didn't know which. Honestly, I didn't care who it was. All I knew was I would prove them wrong and protect Hatra. Even if it meant amassing an army and tearing destiny apart with my own two hands. The shift back into my dragon form was seamless and smooth. Then Aliona climbed gracefully onto my back, and Laika followed after her. We're ready, Aliona said, as she held onto one of the spikes that lined my back. We won't fall off. Just get us there as quickly as you can. A pity this is our first flight together, I growled back to them as I launched into the air. There was no time for us to enjoy the flight to the canyon's entrance. We needed to get there as quickly as we could. In almost no time at all, we'd flown over the river and desert to reach the demon gate. It was just as I'd left it, a mottled rock face surrounded by sand that seemed to be rotting away. Aliona slid off my back quickly, and as she stepped closer to the rock face, the air shifted around her. Wind rushed out from the rock face as what looked like black blood seeped out of it and onto the ground. Where the black blood fell, the sand bubbled like acid, and it grew close to Aliona's bare feet. Aliona, get away from that! I hissed as my claws tore up the ground beneath me. Asher had been silent this entire time, and I took that as a warning for things to come. Whatever the black blood was, it couldn't be anything good. All I wanted was for Aliona to get away from the rock face. I'll be fine, Aliona said as she stepped into the acidic blood, and it sizzled angrily. 
I half expected the smell of burning flesh, but there was nothing. Milady, your feet! Laika gasped as she jumped off my back and placed her hand on my foreleg. How are you not harmed? Suddenly, a silver glow overtook the princess's divine body, and the acid sizzled and disappeared into the air as the glow spread to her surroundings. The power that surrounded her was strange and not unlike the power that emanated from her when she'd summoned the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens. It easily pushed away all the rot and malice that had seeped out of the Demon Gate. What a foolish Demon Gate, thinking such a thing can harm me. Aliona muttered as she placed her hand on the rock face. I vow to shut the door to evil destinies and open the right paths of humans, gods, and that of the heavens. There was an explosion of silver light and purity, and it stifled the malice seeping through the demon gate. Even though the light blinded me, I felt as if a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. Is it done? I blinked furiously as my vision went back to normal, and a magical array glowed silver in front of the rock face. If anything wishes to truly come out of this, I'm afraid it will. Aliona took a step back from the rock face and nearly stumbled. That seal will have to do for now. How long will the temporary seal last? I brought my nose close to where the magical array glowed and sniffed, but I couldn't detect any miasma or malice emanating from the rift. Is it going to buy us enough time? It will last long enough for me to prepare a way to properly seal it. Aliona swayed on her feet, and there was a pale tinge underneath her tanned skin. It'll have to. Milady! Laika caught the exhausted princess in her arms right before she fell to the ground. I'm fine. I just need to rest. Aliona replied weakly as she stifled a laugh. The adoption ceremony used up more of my power than I thought it would. If the Dark Lady hadn't insisted on being there, maybe I wouldn't feel so tired. A muscle twitched in my jaw as I once again cursed the shitty timing of all of this. It really was Murphy's Law, the worst possible thing happening at the worst possible time. Just as I was about to shift into my dragon form, there was a startled cry behind me, and I turned to see Aliona even paler than before. An ashen color had settled under her tanned skin, and her power sparked around her nervously. What happened? I demanded as my heart skipped a beat. Usually, a light danced within Aliona's gemstone eyes, but it was gone now. Her eyes were faint, as if someone had doused the fire inside of her and left nothing but a shell. A demonic horde is attempting to break through. Aliona shuddered as sweat dripped from her forehead, and she seemed to be in physical pain. I felt them. There are thousands of them pushing against the seal. I can't hold them for long. We have to go back to Hatra. War is coming, and we need more numbers. Suddenly, Asher's melancholic voice echoed in my mind with a morbid warning. I told you, you're all going to die. There's nothing you can do to stop this. Chapter 10 I thought we would have more time to prepare for the seal breaking, but that wasn't the case. And to have thousands of demons pouring out of it? What if they headed to Hatra and rampaged, destroying the city like it had been destroyed a thousand years ago? There was no way in hell I was going to let that happen. Laika, Aliona, and I made it back to the city at dawn, and a group of warriors were waiting for us at the main gate. Laika helped Aliona off my back, and while Aliona's shuddering had lessened throughout the flight back, her face was even paler than it was before. Find Natalia, I ordered the warriors who surrounded us as I lowered my head to their height. Tell her you need the Orichalum armor and weapons she made in order to fight the demons who are threatening the city. Once you're armored, head to the entrance of the Crimson Canyons. You won't be able to miss it. I hid the bitterness I felt as I gave them their orders. I was their lord, and I needed to show just how capable I was, even in this sort of horrible situation. In all likelihood, they probably thought I'd ordered them to their deaths. There was no way in hell I'd let that happen, though. I'd heal every single one of them before they died. There was no way we were going to lose. I just had to believe we wouldn't even if it was thousands of demons against us. Find one of the elders and pass on the message to them, Laika added as Aliona leaned on her. Tell them to prepare for any eventuality. Get all the women and children on board and have the airship ready to leave at a moment's notice. If we fail, there won't be a Hatra left for us to come back to. 
The warriors from the Blue Tree Guild nodded sternly, already used to the fickleness of fate when it came to life or death situations. They spread out quickly, and they called out separate orders as they prepared for the battle against the incoming demonic horde. Just how much shittier could our luck get? If we failed in stopping the demons, Hatra would be destroyed again. The Azuras would become refugees once more, and my people would have lost all hope again. This time without anything to nurture for the future. While the once crumbling walls of the city now stood strong, there was hope for the future and a new day. But the Demon Gate had cast a shadow of doubt on that dream. It all came down to timing. If the Demon Gate had appeared later, even by a week or two, we might have been able to be far more prepared. As it was, we didn't even have any oracalcum in the walls of the city, or even the gates. The only fully trained soldiers we had were those from the Blue Tree Guild, and even then I doubted they would be enough against thousands of demons. We could not fail in stopping the demonic horde, though. Even if it meant giving up our everything, we would stop the rampaging demons. I wasn't going to let them harm a single one of my people, even if that meant traveling to the netherworld and dethroning every single demon king there was. I was startled out of my dark thoughts when I felt Aliona's cool hands on my scales. Aliona, what are you doing? I reared my head back around to look at the princess. You should stay. If the worst happens and we can't hold back the demons, you need to live. You're in no condition to be fighting. If you fall while fighting, that's going to put the whole country, maybe even the world, in danger. You should be evacuating on the airship. You're too important to everyone to risk. Determination dripped from Aliona's voice as she climbed up onto my back. As the Princess of Rama and heir to the seat of the White Jade Sect, it is my duty to live my life for my people. Every drop of blood I have in my body is for Rama. I exist solely to shoulder whatever pain and misfortune threatens my people. How can I run away and hide? I let out a soft sigh at her words, and I knew there was nothing I could do to convince Aliona to stay behind. And while all I wanted was for her to be safe from danger, this passion to protect others was one of the reasons I'd fallen in love with her. She wasn't a damsel in distress just because she wore a metaphorical crown. She would fight alongside Laika and me to protect everything important to us. Milady, you can barely sit up, Laika argued, and her eyes were full of worry as she stared up at Aliona. You can't fight in this condition. Laika was right. Aliona had slumped forward and was barely keeping her hold on the spikes on my back. Her cheek was flush against my scales, and I could feel her harsh pants. I wished there was something I could do to help Aliona, something to alleviate the pain that had spread throughout her body and sapped her of her strength. It doesn't matter if I can't fight. Aliona strengthened her grip on my spikes and pushed herself back into a sitting position. I must fight. Besides, how will you defeat the demons without me? There had to be something I could do, even if it wasn't a physical injury causing her pain. Maybe my healing abilities would be able to soothe her. I pulled forth my healing power and focused it on soothing Aliona. In my mind, I kept the image of everything that calmed me down and whatever could calm anyone down. From hot baths to chamomile tea to lazy summer days, that was what I poured into my healing power. Laika, get on, I ordered as I crouched low to the ground. I knew the moment I was in the air, I needed to let loose the healing power so Aliona wouldn't slip off during takeoff, or even worse, mid-flight. The wolf demi-human jumped onto my back quickly and had her arms wrapped around Aliona in no time. Then in one swift movement, I rose into the air as I poured my magic into Aliona. Just as I swung my head around to face her, my healing power rose up through my scales and surrounded Aliona in a pearlescent and glittering glow. Then my sparkling power settled on her hair and skin as it began to fade into her body. Almost immediately, I could feel as Aliona straightened on my back and her grip on one of my spikes tightened. I hadn't needed to breathe my healing power on her. I was able to direct it right into her. Did that mean my control was finally getting better? Evan, what did you do? Aliona patted my scales in curiosity as she raised her voice. The agony from the shattered seal went away. I just tried to heal you of the pain, I called out as relief coursed through me. You couldn't fight in that condition, so I wanted to see if I could do something to help you recover faster. Well, it worked. Aliona laughed joyfully, but then she gasped 
and I felt her teeter on my back. Milady! Lyca shouted in concern. What's wrong? The seal. The princess rasped. It's been broken. A savage snarl slipped from my maw, and I pumped my wings faster. Conversation quickly died off as we rose higher into the sky, and we could see the evidence of the demon gate. It was far worse than when I'd first found it. We could pinpoint its exact location all the way from Hatra. Pure malice and cruelty seeped into the air and dyed the early morning sky with its darkness. I could see the countless dark clouds that swirled above the canyons right where I had found the demon gate. Somehow, I expected the strange lightning from the memories Asher showed me to rain down from the sky. Almost as if I'd summoned him, Asher's voice echoed through my head. Get away! Get away or you'll die! You'll all die! You can't stop them! They are death and malice incarnate! I won't know until I try! I growled back in my mind to Asher. I can't just let them do whatever they want! What if they go after Hatra, or are going after a city? I know the nearest one is miles away, but I can't let a threat like this exist when I can do something about it. You'll die. You will all die. You cannot stop them. Why are you saying that? I demanded in my thoughts. Is it your fear? Because of the miasma that's kept you prisoner your entire life? Is that why you think we're going to fail? Because we aren't. It may not be instantly, but we will win. We'll see. I'll help you as much as I can, though I doubt it'll be of any use against anyone you can't take down. You did defeat me, after all. I frowned at Asher's words and wondered what he meant by helping. He was stuck inside of my spiritual sea. How would he be of any help other than providing me with some potentially annoying commentary? Whatever. If the strange and slightly depressive swordsman would be able to help me take down a demonic army, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. They aren't heading to the city? Laika's voice traveled down to my ears and caught my attention. I looked down to see what she meant and realized there was no horde of bloodthirsty demons heading toward Hatra. We should have come upon some by now if they were. This was strange. Instead of heading in the direction of Hatra, the demons had traveled into the canyons instead. We followed their trampled path by air as we noticed burned and twisted bodies littered the canyon below us. Something attacked the demons. Could it have been the Crimson Dragon living in the canyon? Carefully, we followed the trail of burnt demonic corpses further into the canyon. If this was the work of the Crimson Dragon, then she'd easily halved the demon horde. A carpet of corpses covered the canyon floor, and I couldn't even see any pebbles or stone. Everything was covered in blood and ash. What awaited us further inside of the canyon was an even more horrible sight. The Crimson Dragon was curled protectively around an egg as the same monsters I'd seen in Asher's memories clamored around her. Dark blood seeped from deep wounds along her tail and body, and she snarled and roared in agony each time she was struck. Somehow, the demons had dragged her down from the skies, or they'd attacked the egg she so desperately protected. Dragon of Hatra! The wounded dragon called out to us through the fray of battle. You owe nothing to me, but I ask for your help. Help me protect this little one. A demon swiped at the egg, and the dragon broke off her plea to snarl and snap at the attack. The demon met a swift death between her fangs, and then she curled up even tighter around the egg as more demons bombarded her. Even if she hadn't asked me to help her, I would, and I knew the women on my back would as well. Not to mention, there was no way I was going to leave a dragon egg to be devoured by demons. If we could buy enough time until the Blue Tree Guild warriors got here, I could land next to the Crimson Dragon after blowing away as many demons as I could with my wings. Then I'd heal her enough so Aliona could create a portal to take the other dragon and her egg back to safety in Hatra. But there was something wrong with the situation. The demons almost seemed to be celebrating. I didn't know much about demons and their ways, but I knew how someone looked when they thought they had won a fight. Even our presence didn't seem to bother them. Aliona! I called out to the princess on my back. What are they doing? They've done something to her. Aliona's power curled protectively around us, and a tendril of it reached down to the fallen dragon. There's a curse running through her veins. Fuck! I gnashed my fangs and glared down at the demons. Can you break it down from up here? I can't from here. 
Determination dripped from Aliona's melodic voice as her hands tightened their grip on my spikes. I can do something, but I have to be closer to her. We have to get to her now, or she and the egg will die. I growled in frustration as I kept my eyes on the demons below us. Touching down opened up the possibility of being swarmed by the demons just as the corrupted corpses had done to me once. I needed to be careful, and it was too dangerous to use my earth powers against the demons while the wounded dragon was in the way of danger. Only when she was out of the way and healed would I be able to rampage. Maybe, just maybe, if I could get close enough but still out of reach, one of us could grab the egg, but I wouldn't be able to carry the wounded dragon out of reach. Then I realized that I didn't have to carry her. I could lift her out of reach on a stone platform using my powers, and Aliona would be able to purify all the demons around her. Evan! Laika's voice was confident as she shifted on my back. We can reach them together. Set down away from the demons, and we'll fight our way through. No, it'll be too late. Agony dripped from Aliona's voice as her power spiked out around her desperately. We have to get to them now. My platform idea was the only solution I could see where the wounded dragon and her egg would be out of the way of the fighting. It also had the added benefit of keeping Aliona out of the way of the battle, and she'd be able to focus on dealing with whatever was wrong with the wounded dragon without having to worry about being attacked. This is going to sound crazy, I called out to the two women on my back. But if I create a stone platform and push her up, can you form a barrier and purge the demons close to her? If you have to be inside of the barriers, I can fly as close as possible to the platform. What are you saying? Laika cried out in confusion and shifted on my back. You want Milady to jump down there? Into the midst of all those demons? I can do it, Aliona declared, and confidence and courage filled her melodic voice. I can jump down and purify the demons around her. A fall from this distance won't be able to harm me, and the moment the demons touch me, well, they won't live long enough to regret it. Once you jump, I'll pull up a platform, I growled as I swooped as close as I could to the ground without being within the reach of the demons. Then I pooled my power together and focused my senses on the earth underneath the wounded dragon. I'm going to aim for the moment you touch down so we'll get as many of those fuckers out in one blow. I'm ready, Aliona shouted as she stood up on my back. I'll clear out as many as I can for you. Aliona, I called out as I twisted my neck around to stare at her. No matter what happens, only those demons will die today. Aliona smirked. I can't die, remember? Then, with those words, the priestess let herself fall off my back and into the demonic horde. Chapter 11 a pale blue barrier exploded all around Aliona, and light pulsed in her hands as she plummeted through the air. The barrier expanded in the form of an orb, and it glittered in the sunlight as if it had been cut from pure crystal. As Aliona fell through the air, my power raced underneath the wounded dragon and formed a circular platform around her. Then I forced the platform upward so it would meet the falling princess and catch her. The giant, insect-like demons had finally noticed us, but they were focused on the falling Aliona. They clamored and chittered loudly, almost like cicadas in summer, as they climbed on top of the fallen dragon to try and reach the priestess. It was as if they were moths, and she was the fire that would burn them to ashes. Her purity, while serving as a beacon for their repugnant appetite for destruction, was the very thing that would lead to their death. I knew the moment she made contact, or even just her power made contact with them, they would turn into nothing but ashes. It would be like how the miasma was powerless against her barrier. Aliona swiveled in the air as the pale blue barrier around her shifted to silver. She was just within reach of the clamoring demons now, and Laika let out a stifled scream when one of the insect-like creatures wrapped their pincers around Aliona's bare leg. But I bared my fangs in a grin when he met his doom. Ashes were all that remained of the demon a moment later, and as Aliona continued her descent, her barrier expanded until the Crimson Dragon was completely enveloped by it. All of the demons that had been both attacking the dragon and using her as a step stool were turned into nothing more than dark ash. 
Then Aliona landed beside the crimson dragon, right as rain, and a victorious growl resounded in my chest as the ash of the demons fluttered through the air. It was almost a pitiful demise. They stood no chance against Aliona's purity magic, and a visceral sort of pride coursed through me. Watching this only made me want Aliona more, but it also made me want more power. I needed power, some sort of ability that wouldn't cause such widespread damage as my control over stone would. Something that, while it was deadly accurate and precise, would still have an immense amount of power behind it. A power that would allow me to stand side by side with Aliona as we fought. Suddenly, Asher's voice echoed through my head. Power? Is that what you want? Power to protect the people closest to you? Yes! I exclaimed. I told you I'd lend you my power. You will be borrowing it this time, so don't worry about it. I am of little use, chained by the miasma as I am, but this, I can do this. I will guide this power of mine through you. Suddenly, lightning crackled all along my scales, and a rush of burning ice ran up my throat. I opened my maw and let out a deafening roar. Just as my roar echoed around me, black lightning fell down from the skies in jagged strikes that killed some of the demons along the perimeter of Aliona's barrier. While she had managed to kill the hundreds that had been directly torturing the fallen dragon, there were still easily a thousand more demons on the outside of her barrier. They were just waiting for her barrier to falter so they could rush in and consume both her and the dragon. Not like we'd give them that chance. Laika, are you ready? Lightning crackled all around us as I steadied myself for the dive. My lord, I was born ready. Laika's determined voice reached my ears as she tightened her grip around one of my spikes. These foul beasts will regret tainting our world with their presence. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I laughed viciously as I prepared my body for the dive down into the barrier Aliona had created. Let's make these bastards regret their entire existences. Together, we dove down through the lightning strikes, and the exhilarating descent brought us inside the silver barrier. Then I touched down lightly, almost perfectly, next to the crimson dragon. I was getting better at this dragon-flying stuff. Laika slid off my back quickly, and there was a sword in each of her hands before I could even blink. Once again, spatial magic was incredible, and I truly needed to learn it or at least have an object that would let me use it. The demons hissed and shrieked at us from outside of the barrier. They really were much more hideous this close up. Some of them looked as if they were decaying, with pieces and bits of their bodies falling off with their movements. Others had black slime dripping from their eye sockets and their mouths as they moved strangely. Their movements were almost robotic, but not exactly. I shook my head at the sight. There was no point in paying that much attention to them right now. Aliona's barrier would hold for however long we needed. My lord, Lyca said with her hand on her gorget. Daya is leading the Blue Tree Guild's entire force here. Good, I huffed as I walked toward Aliona. How long till they get here? Five minutes at least. Lyca's ears were erect as her eyes darted from demon to demon. Ten minutes at most. Plenty of time to leisurely examine a dragon, I laughed sarcastically to myself as I sat back on my haunches next to Aliona. The princess knelt by the crimson dragon's head and put her hand right above the dragon's snout. A silver glow tinged with black flickered around her hand as she flinched and hissed. The crimson dragon was just as immense as I remembered, several times my size, and with scales that gleamed like blood. She was curled around an egg the size of a dog, and it was covered in crimson scales speckled with splotches of gold. A sudden spike of anger rose inside of me as a single thought pumped through my mind. I had to protect that egg. What's wrong? I brought my head near Aliona's and stared up at the crimson dragon. What's the black stuff in her blood? It stinks like... like death. But it was impossible for the dragon's body to have started to decay while she was still alive. It couldn't have been more than half an hour since the demons poured out from the rift. And even if they'd somehow managed to kill her, that wasn't enough time for a body the size of hers to start decomposing. It was a curse. Aliona's amethyst eyes darkened with anger as she turned to face me. But there's no one in this horde with the power necessary for it. 
I don't understand how they accomplished such a thing. These are all low-level demons. For low-level demons, they sure packed a punch. I whistled lowly as I looked over all the wounds on the Crimson Dragon. Can you break the curse? I wasn't a veterinarian, but I knew without the use of my strange analyzing skill that most of her bones were broken, and her skin had actually been pierced through by whatever tried to kill her. My healing power always bubbled under the surface of my skin, and I pulled it out so it would stretch over the Crimson Dragon. Sparkling glitter settled over her scales until she almost looked like a ruby dropped in the sand. The torn skin sealed up and new scales grew in the same areas that had been removed, probably by the demons when they'd attacked her. I knew how hard dragon scales were, so it was worrying to know just how badly the demons outside of the barrier had wounded the other dragon. I glanced down the line of the dragon's body, and relief went through me when her breathing eased. This is beyond me, and we don't have enough time. Aliona shook her head as she pulled her hand back from the crimson dragon's snout. We never have enough time. I never could have imagined that of all things, there would have been someone strong enough to fell a creature as mighty as the crimson dragon. What do you mean, not enough time? I asked as the scales on my forehead contracted with a frown. What is this curse? My experience with curses was pretty much limited to games and, once again, my Aunt Emma's predilection for the supernatural and cursed antiques. She will die when the three moons are no longer full, Aliona explained, and sorrow dripped from her voice. It is a death curse laid on her by a demon lord, but there were none present in that horde. They targeted her right off the bat, I growled, and one of the muscles in my neck twitched. That's why the demon gate was right at the entrance of the canyon. We have to get her back to Hatra. Aliona stood from where she knelt and dusted off her pale dress. There might be something in the archives, some forgotten spell that can break this curse. Let me die here, a rumbling voice announced, and the crimson dragon cracked open one great amber eye to stare at us morosely. Let me die under the open sky where I can see the stars and the three moons. We won't let you die, I growled resolutely. You're going to live, Crimson Dragon. Whether you knew it or not, you saved the people of my city by drawing the demons here and fighting them. Valera. I was once known as Valera. The Crimson Dragon blinked languidly as she shifted her body into a more comfortable position. Remember that name. Remember that name to the stars and to the three moons when I pass, and give my body to the sky. Let no scavengers and poachers tear me to pieces. There will be no need for that, Aliona murmured as she gently stroked Valera's scales. Dear dragon, you shall live. Can you swear this to me? Valera looked down at Aliona with critical amber eyes. Swear to me on the lives of everyone here? I cannot. Aliona shook her head as she folded her hands in her lap. I dare to swear only on my own life, and not involve the lives of another, though, if that is acceptable, dear dragon. <laughs> Just as I thought. Valera seemed pleased by Aliona's answer, because she closed her amber eyes again and sighed peacefully. Just swear to me, you will honor me when I die. She won't swear it, drama queen, I laughed at the other dragon, because you're not going to die. You are a stubborn one, aren't you? <laughs> Valera chuckled lightly as she opened her amber eyes again. Such a stubborn little dragon. No wonder I wasn't able to kill you. You'll be surprised at how stubborn I am, I replied dryly. And the name's Evan, not Little Dragon. There's no way in hell I'm going to let you die on my watch. You're going to live for at least another three thousand years. Little surprises me anymore. Valera bared her teeth in tired amusement as she curled tightly around the egg. Life is the same monotone color. Even now, it is dyed in nothing but the same crimson that did nothing but bore and taunt me. Then let us take you back to Hatra, Aliona said as she leaned against Valera's scales. Let us show you new colors, new worlds in which you can spread your wings and soar. Valera glanced at the divine princess and hummed lightly. Hatra? There was confusion evident in Valera's voice as she glanced in the direction of Hatra. The city of mortals? 
Wasn't it destroyed? Well, not anymore. I bared my fangs in a feral smile as my tail swished behind me. We're building it back up, bigger and better. Hatra will never again be destroyed, not by anyone. Fine. Valera huffed as she tucked the dragon egg under her cheek. I will go with you to this Hatra that you say will never fall. Perhaps this child will have a far better future in your city than she would have in these canyons. Dear dragon, Aliona said gently as she stroked Valera's crimson scales, Can you bear to change forms? I'm afraid we have no room large enough for you in Hatra. Ah? Valera blinked for a moment before her lips lifted in a wry smile. Yes, perhaps that will be easier. Valera let out an exhale, and her body shifted in both shape and size. She became smaller and smaller until she was in the same human body I had seen her in once before. Crimson hair hung down her back in long locks that barely protected her modesty, and her skin was perfectly pale, if covered in ash and dirt. This is familiar. The dragon smirked at me, and one of her ivory-white fangs peeked out over her lips. Soon, you'll need to tell me how you escaped from the cave the night we met. You'll have to live if you want to know, I replied to her as I glanced over at the raucous demons outside the barrier. Aliona, you need to get out of here now. Those demons are going to head to Hatra if we don't take care of them soon. The priestess nodded and then took a deep breath. Make a path to the distant place in my memory. Transcend both time and space. Aliona lifted her hands as her eyes glowed silver. And make both places the same. Aliona's words formed a magical circle in the air that glowed a bright silver as she linked the canyon to Hatra. What a clever girl. Valera stood with my help and carried the crimson dragon egg in her arms gently. Hold my hand and I'll lead the way for us. Aliona said as she offered her glowing hand up to Valera. The screeching of the demons reached an ear-splitting crescendo as they threw themselves furiously against the princess's barrier. Aliona, go! I snarled as I bared my teeth at my opponents. Daya and the others should be here soon. Laika's ears twitched as she shifted her grip on her dual swords. We will be fine, milady. Aliona nodded at both of us before she looked at Valera again, and the crimson dragon smiled sardonically as she wrapped one clawed hand around Aliona's delicate one. Then they stepped through the portal together, and the magical circle disappeared with them. But the barrier didn't disappear, it remained just where Aliona left it, and I couldn't help the way my lips curled up in a fierce smile. My princess was pretty awesome, even if her savior complex was worrisome. When Daya arrived with the warriors from the Blue Tree Guild, we were a fierce group. Together, we ripped the demons apart until their numbers started to dwindle. Since the demons were disgusting and decomposing, I did my best not to sink my teeth into their bodies as Asher's lightning continued to fall from the sky and burn the ground. We fought for hours, and even as I continually healed my comrades during the battle, the demons were ravenous beasts with an almost unstoppable energy. No matter how many of their bones we broke, the demons kept fighting until their heads were lopped off their bodies. But as I fought, I couldn't help the niggling fear that had settled in my chest. There was something wrong, but I wasn't sure what. It was like a siren blaring inside of me, and it was telling me to get back to the city and check on Aliona. But I couldn't just leave the battlefield. We were fighting to protect Hatra, and I served as both sword and shield. So I buckled down and focused on tearing the demons to bloody shreds. When we returned tired but victorious to the city hours later, the citizens were waiting with food ready for us to feast on after the battle. Even though I was famished, I made some careful hellos to everyone who had been waiting for us until I realized Aliona was nowhere to be found. Laika and I exchanged worried glances as she slid off my back. We had assumed the Divine Princess would have been waiting for us. My lord, I'll go speak to the council. Laika said, as she wiped off some of the black demon blood that dripped from her face. I'll go find Aliona and the dragon. I brushed my snout against Laika's shoulder as I checked her for any wounds I may have missed earlier. Laika pressed her forehead against my snout before she darted off toward the tent we had the first council meeting in. Faintly, I could hear raised voices from the tent, but that didn't matter to me right now. I needed to know Aliona and Valera were safe. I shifted out of my dragon form and into my human form. 
Thankfully, my clothing wasn't covered in demon guts and blood as I'd feared. Where are they? I asked the first person I saw, and it turned out to be little Afra from the farms. Aliona and the other dragon. My lady hath taken the crimson dragon into her room, the fox demi-human replied as she carried a basket of food in her arms. Thank you, I muttered before I spun around and began to march toward Aliona's quarters. Wait, my lord, Afra called out behind me. The young master was asking about you. Maybe it was rude, but I didn't stop. I just kept going until I darted up the staircase and into Aliona's room. It was there I found Aliona, Valera, and the dragon egg. Valera was curled up in Aliona's bed. I could see she'd been lent some clothes by the princess, and they fit nicely on the dragon. The sleeveless cerulean robe perfectly showed off Valera's toned arms and the iron muscles beneath her skin. The dragon egg was wrapped up in blankets next to the dragon, and on the edge of the bed was my princess. Aliona had one glowing hand on Valera's forehead as she used her other hand to write in a notebook with a charcoal pencil. There were smudges of charcoal on her cheeks and the very tip of her nose. My heart finally slowed to a steady beat. I hadn't even noticed that it had been about to burst out of my chest. Just seeing Aliona was enough to reassure me after such a large battle. I just needed to know she hadn't disappeared when she'd gone through the portal, that the curse hadn't swallowed up both Valera and her. Aliona, how is she? I pressed my forehead to the princesses and sighed. Do you know anything more about the curse? She's stable for now, Aliona said as she pulled her forehead away from mine and glanced at the prone dragon. But I don't know what more I can do. The curse is eating away at her heart and power until there's nothing left. The other dragon was so deeply asleep in the bed, I would have thought she was in a coma. In fact, she probably was in a magical coma induced by Aliona so the priestess could try and break the curse, or at least slow its progression while she studied it. Can't we pour more power into her? I frowned as I sat down on the bed next to the two women. No. Aliona shook her head briefly before her shoulders tensed. I attempted that already, and the curse tried to latch on to me. What? My eyes widened, and panic bloomed in my chest. What do you mean it tried to latch on to you? Do you remember how the miasma is capable of spreading its corruption? Aliona drew in a deep breath as she straightened and kept my gaze. Yeah? I gritted my teeth as I looked the priestess all over. Evan, don't worry. Aliona leaned forward and kissed me before she stood up. I'm perfectly fine, but it was strange. Just like the miasma, the curse attempted to drain my power and life. It wasn't like it was hopping from host to host, but as if it had been set up to contaminate anyone who tried to break the curse. Aliona did a small twirl, and I saw that while her bare legs were covered in somewhat sparkly ash, there were no bruises or cuts on her body. Promise me you'll be careful. I grasped Aliona's hand and pulled her close to me so I could bury my face into her waist. I don't know what I would do if anything happens to you. I promise. Aliona ran her fingers through my hair as she bent to press a kiss to my forehead. Will you watch over her while I go and bring us some food? Aliona took a step back and I reluctantly let go of her soft body. She tilted her head at me and I nodded. Then I had to bite back a smile as I realized that, through all of this, Aliona was still in her nightgown. She followed my line of sight, and a dark blush spread across her beautiful face. For a moment, Aliona's gemstone eyes darted over to the dragon behind me, but she let out a small sigh of relief. Then a mischievous expression came to life behind her eyes, and just as Aliona stepped backwards through the doorway, she lifted her nightgown. I breathed in sharply as my eyes drank in Aliona's naked body before she let the fabric fall and cover it once more. She giggled as the door closed gently behind her, and all I could do was rub the bridge of my nose and draw in a deep breath to maintain my control. I had no idea if that was supposed to be a reward or some sort of punishment. All I knew was that it was both, and I really hated the fact I had agreed to stay and watch over Valera. All I wanted to do was chase after Aliona and pin her down, maybe in the baths, as I showed her just exactly what I wanted to do with that gorgeous body of hers. Suddenly, the hairs on the back of my neck prickled, and I could feel Valera's gaze on my back. I so hoped she didn't see Aliona flashing me, and technically her as well. I thought you were in a coma, I remarked as I turned to face Valera. 
The Crimson Dragon's mouth twitched in a smirk. Your princess might be powerful, but I am far older than she is. I know some magic she does not. I opened my mouth to reply, but then she held out the Crimson Dragon Egg to me. Take the egg. Valera's amber eyes glittered fiercely as she gently placed the egg on my lap. I can't protect this child anymore. The dragon egg was warm in my hands, like inside of it was a ball of fire just waiting to emerge. Is it yours? I asked as I looked from the egg to the other dragon. <laughs> Perhaps that can be said, black dragon. Valera gritted her teeth as she slowly sat up in the bed. This egg is all that remains of my family. I have watched over her for thousands of years, waiting for her to emerge from the egg. Now I will never see her. Ironic, isn't it? You were keeping everyone out of the canyon to protect this egg. I looked at Valera with newfound respect as I realized how deep her dedication to her family ran. Everything you've done is to protect this child, am I right? Yes. Valera's lips twitched upward into a smile, but it faded from her face quickly. But my watch is over. I can no longer protect this child. No, it isn't, I promised as I set the dragon egg back down beside her. We'll break this curse on you. Just you wait. You'll be able to watch her hatch and grow into a powerful dragon. You speak such bold words for such a young dragon. <laughs> Valera laughed as she tapped my cheek with a clawed hand. Perhaps I shouldn't have attacked you the day you came into the canyon. Perhaps things would have been different, and the two of us would have been able to lay waste to the demonic horde. I regret we will no longer be able to talk atop the waterfall. Just focus on saving your strength. I placed my hand over hers and hoped she would focus on living. We'll have all the time in the world to talk when we get your curse broken. There is no when, Evan. Valera sighed as she pulled her hand away. There is not even an if. I have lived all that wretched fate has decreed I live. You're fine with dying? Anger crept into my voice, and I stood to pace in front of the bed. Just giving up and not even trying? Nay. Valera sighed as she closed her amber eyes. But even I know what shall come to pass is inevitable. Like the waxing and waning of the three moons of this world, I too shall come to an end. With those words, Valera closed her eyes and slipped into a restless sleep. There was nothing more I could say or do. Hours later, I sat in my bedroom with a plate of goat stew and bread laying untouched on the table in front of me. Truth be told, I had lost all appetite since Valera lay awaiting death in one of the rooms above me. There had to be a way to break the curse. Aliona was searching in the archives and through her own literature, but she didn't have the advantage of having a former enemy sleeping in her spiritual sea. Quite conveniently, I just so happened to have one. Asher, do you know anything about breaking demonic curses? I asked out loud as I stretched back onto my bed. Did you ever come across something like that during your time with the Green Glass sect? Nothing. Asher's voice was sardonic as he replied, like he had assumed I knew better than to ask him something like that. As if we would be allowed to know such a thing. Are you sure? I sighed as I ran my hand through my hair. Not even a hint or a clue? What about how they're cast or something? Anything you can give me will help. Come on, dig into your memory. There has to be something there that can help us. I can tell you it was a demon lord who cast the curse on the crimson dragon, and that the princess is right. The dragon will die by the night the three moons of Anati are no longer full. Even now her heart is beginning to wither away and turn to ash. A pity. She's existed for even longer than I can remember. This wasn't telling me anything I didn't already know. Aliona had already told me she believed it was a demon lord who'd cast the curse, or at least provided the power for it, since there was no one among the attacking demons who had such power. Why would a demon lord curse a dragon? I frowned as I thought over the different reasons. Wouldn't they want a dragon on their side if they wanted to destroy all of Anati? Strategically speaking, it doesn't make sense. 
Valera was already killing anyone who even entered her canyon. Why didn't they tell her killing the rest of the world would keep her egg safe? I mean, that's what I would do if I wanted to get her on my side. Outright attacking Valera would be too risky. There's no way of knowing how she'll react. And if they were threatening her egg, well, they were just creating their own worst enemy. Who is to say they didn't make her that offer? But perhaps she was content to remain in her canyon. I frowned. So she was cursed because she wouldn't join forces with them? Perhaps. I do not pretend to know the inner workings of a demon lord's mind. Why would any demon lord waste so much of their forces to bring her down? I asked. I feel like it would have been better to have her as a neutral player in the game. Is Valera that big of a threat to them, or is the dragon egg that valuable? The former is quite important. Valera has existed for over 3,000 years. There is no knowing how much power she's amassed in her body. Those who have died at her claws are countless. Many heroes entered her canyon, but none have ever returned. Has the White Jade Sect ever gone against her? I sat up in my bed at the thought and tilted my head as I considered the possibility. No, there is no knowledge of that within my memory. It's been a rumor for centuries that the king is actually fond of the Crimson Dragon. Otherwise, why would he allow such a massive threat to continue existing in Rama? Huh. Maybe there's an agreement between them. I stood from the bed and walked over to the food on the table. How big of a threat is Valera to the world? Even if I didn't have an appetite, I had to eat in order to maintain my body, and talking to Asher would serve as a pretty good distraction. Also, I didn't have to worry about being rude with him. Excluding the king from the ranking of threats? Yeah. I tore off a chunk of bread and dipped it into the stew. Just how powerful is the king, by the way? I think you're the only one I've ever heard call him king. Everyone else says lord or his eminence or the seat. Valera is ranked at catastrophic. With her power, she could possibly level an entire city in one night. Maybe even less time than that. I let out a low whistle at that. Valera was really quite impressive, and I was definitely lucky to have escaped her wrath that night in the canyon. And the king? I rested my chin in my hand as I imagined some sort of godly warrior. He has to be impressive since he managed to unite Rama into one nation, and he's been holding the demons back from entering this world for thousands of years. No one knows his true strength. It's said that even an army of 500,000 cultivators, mages, and warriors is no match for him. He is a cataclysmic existence. He alone has been sealing the breach for thousands of years by himself. It's said he is at the pinnacle of existence, a god come down from the high heavens to bless the world of Anati. That sounds like a lonely existence to me, I replied quietly as I imagined the breach. Then a thought occurred to me. Wait, if he's alone sealing the breach, how does he rule Rama? Through a council and stewards. But he never leaves the breach, right? I frowned as I wondered how useless or corrupt the council was. There have to be things happening he won't know about. Like Aliona escaping from the Mihareti Mountains in the first place. She just slipped out of there and traveled so far south to Hatra. Does the council keep information like that from the king? There might be even a traitor in the council. How else would the princess have managed to escape from the cave of a thousand sages? Wheels have been moving since before you arrived in this world. And you've only moved the cogs of war faster. What do you mean, a traitor? I sat straight up at Asher's implication. I only have fragmented memories, but my knowledge of such a thing is incomplete. All I know for sure is that corruption has taken root in this world, and not even the White Jade Sect is exempt from it. So, whoever the representative that came from the White Jade Sect was, I wasn't going to trust them. I needed to be prepared for any eventuality from them, including the idea that they would try to turn on Hatra and make it seem we'd somehow kidnapped Aliona. Hey, by the way, I slumped in my chair as another thought struck me, that lightning power of yours, thanks for helping. I know how difficult that must have been for you. Would you like to learn how to use it? You're a dragon, after all. What, you mean I can learn it? I straightened in my chair at the offer. 
But I thought predation only worked when I killed. How can I use your lightning again? I don't see why you won't be able to use it. It is my power, and I am inside of your spiritual sea. Therefore, it is your power as well. I couldn't help the smirk that crossed my face at that. I'd wanted a deadly and precise ability so I would be able to fight in tighter spaces. Now, Asher had so generously just provided me with one on a silver platter. Chapter 12 A crystal lamp glowed faintly in front of me as I sat cross-legged on the floor before my bed. A gentle breeze drifted in from an open window, and it brought the smell of morning dew into my room. Just breathe. Asher's voice echoed in my mind as I worked on falling into a state of absolute calm. He was teaching me how to call upon his lightning and make it my own, but so far it wasn't the easiest of things to do. I am breathing, I gritted out as I kept my eyes squeezed shut. Do you think I'm not breathing? I don't know about you, but I still need to breathe. A stray thought crossed my mind, and I had to swallow a nervous chuckle. Why was I trying to summon lightning while indoors? Why hadn't I gone outside and far away from the city? Right, because there was a dragon cursed to die, and I couldn't just leave for no reason, even if it was practicing a new power. Less stressful. You're thinking too hard about electrocuting yourself. Somehow, I heard more than a bit of exasperated amusement in Asher's voice. It's a very valid concern, okay? I scrunched up my face in a frown as I let myself fall on my back. I've never done this before. There were a million things I hadn't done in Anahi, and there was so much for me to catch up on and learn how to do. I had a running start for most of it thanks to my dragon and fighting instincts backing me up in dangerous moments, and my gaming knowledge would help, but only for so much. I'd been blessed with talents and gifts that others didn't have, but that didn't mean I could slack off. I had to be a genius and work my ass off in order to reach my goals. Just trust me. That was easier said than done. How do I know you're not going to try and roast me? I asked. You aren't the one in danger of becoming an overdone lizard. I, for one, am not looking forward to that and would greatly appreciate it if that could be avoided. Also, what if this entire time you've just been trying to build up my trust so you can kill me and take over my body? Then you'll deliver it to your Dark Master and you'll take over the world using my body and my power. You've got quite the imagination there, don't you? I could almost see Asher's forehead scrunch up as he spoke. I do, thank you. I sighed as I opened my eyes and stared up at the unpainted ceiling. You didn't answer the question, though. Don't think I didn't notice. This is a very valid concern. That's because it was a foolish question I didn't think needed answering. I'm trapped inside of your spiritual sea and unable to move due to the miasma poisoning my body. Even if I would want to be a dishonorable louse and betray you, I am incapable of it. Asher sounded so sure he wouldn't be able to betray me, no matter what happened, and maybe he was right. After all, when it came down to it, he'd begged for me to set him free of the darkness controlling him. In the back of my mind, I could feel how my power worked to free him of the dark threads of miasma that had encroached onto his heart. Even now, days after it all happened, my power had not found a cure or possible relief for him. The only option was to continue slowly unraveling the threads of miasma and cutting back any new growth. You can't betray me at all because of that? I asked with a snort. And here I thought we were becoming friends or something. Friends? You really think that? Well, yeah, I responded as I sat up and ran my hand through my hair. I mean, you've been helping me out, and you're just as snarky, if not more so, than me. And I thought we've been getting along now that you're not trying to kill me. I could almost feel the way shock went through Asher. He definitely wasn't expecting that answer from me, even though he was inside of my mind. I suppose I can be gracious enough and allow your delusion to continue. Sure, buddy, I snickered into my hand, as I tried not to fall on my back again. Don't hurt yourself there. Ha! <laughs> For hours, I continued practicing inside of my room as Asher watched over me. Under his guidance, I managed to create a small orb of lightning in my hands. It was small, about the size of a teapot, but it was pure energy that crackled between my palms. 
Asher wanted me to keep the orb of lightning in my hands for as long as I could, but it was easier said than done. I kept managing to burn the tips of my fingers because, right as I gained control of the lightning, it would fall apart. Through some miracle, I managed not to singe or burn anything else in my room. That would have been difficult to explain away to the elders, but since no one had come into my room, no one seemed to realize I was playing around with lightning. I frowned at the blackened tips of my fingers and watched as the burnt flesh healed. This would have been rather difficult if I didn't have any healing abilities. I wouldn't have been able to rush through my training otherwise. The amount of times I damaged the nerves in my hands were countless, and the damage was beyond anything that could be fixed back on Earth. But with my healing ability, my nerves were repaired in seconds. There was something odd, though. Every time I burned my fingers, it was like it took more and more lightning to cause the same amount of damage, like my hands were becoming tougher or something. Your problem doesn't stem from a lack of power. You have more than enough of it that we can continue on practicing without worrying about your well-being. Rather, it's your control. You aren't used to channeling any sort of magic. Even with your healing, I've noticed you just throw power at the problem and hope everything is solved like that. I winced at Asher's observation, even though I knew it was true. In my defense, I hadn't grown up with all of this power and trained in how to use it like almost everyone else in the world of Inati. I was pretty much playing the most intense game of catch-up ever, with the cards stacked against me. I was never one to back down from a challenge, though, and living in this world was the most adrenaline-inducing challenge I'd ever met. So what do you suggest? I asked as I stood and stretched my arms. How do I minimize the amount of power I use? You're a waterfall at the moment, completely raging and out of control. You've done what you can to stem the flow, and I doubt building a dam would be of any help. Your power would end up stagnating and building up until it would explode out of control. You may even die from it. That doesn't exactly inspire any confidence in me. I rolled my eyes as I walked to the end of my suite. You suck at pep talks. I walked toward the balcony and realized it was morning again. I'd spent all of yesterday afternoon and the entire night practicing my control over lightning. Hmm. <clears throat> I simply require time to come up with a solution. Yeah, you do that. I rubbed my hand along the aching muscles of my neck and turned to head out of my room. Right as I passed my bed, I stopped and walked over to the dresser. The two oracalum daggers I'd meant to give to Ilya and Ilyushina were still there, and I decided I would give the blades to them today. The sudden appearance of the Demon Gate had proved I could take no chances in regards to the dangers in this world. While there were no definite enemies of Hatra, aside from the Green Glass Sect and whoever destroyed Hatra a thousand years ago, I couldn't let my guard down. I closed my eyes as I grabbed the two daggers and slipped them into my inner robe for safekeeping. My senses spread out through the building, and while I could sense Valera and the Dragon Egg, the only other person I found was Julia. There wasn't anyone else in the building, and I found it odd the two children weren't in bed still. Maybe it was later than I thought it was. With a sigh, I left my room and made my way down to the common area to check in with Julia. She would probably know where everyone was and give me an update on everything that had happened while I'd been practicing. The wafting scent of food hit me before I even reached the common area, and I wondered what kind of spread had been laid out. There was a large wheel of goat cheese as well as various cured meats spread out on the table when I entered the room. Both pickled and fresh vegetables were displayed on low dishes while there were baskets of bread in between the cured meats. I noticed there were also ceramic jars filled with what looked like jams and honey. I didn't realize there were bees in Hatra, unless the honey was brought in by the Blue Tree Guild. Either way, even with the increase in population, it didn't look like we would have to ration our food if there was this much left after everyone had eaten. I found Julia at the far end of the table, surrounded by a pile of books and scrolls. Sunlight came in from the window behind her and made her light brown hair glow as if it were molten gold. She looked up from the book her nose was buried in and smiled at me. Evan, good morning. Julia closed the book she'd been reading and took a sip from her teacup. I thought you would spend the rest of the day practicing your lightning. You felt that? I asked. Of course. <laughs> Julia laughed lightly as she set down her teacup. We'd have to be blind to miss that amount of power. In the future, I'd ask you to practice outside. 
I smiled sheepishly as I nodded after being busted by my new mother. Hey, have you seen Ilya and Ilyushina anywhere? My stomach rumbled at the sight of the food on the table, and I sat down next to Julia. I'm looking for them, but they weren't in their room. Ilyushina said she wanted to pick some flowers for Valera and the poor girl you saved from the interrogation. Julia slid a plate in my direction before she leaned back in her chair. Ilya went with her to make sure she didn't get into any of the rubble. I loaded up the plate with cured meats and some of the bread, but steered away from the pickled vegetables in favor of the fresh ones. I'd noticed that with my enhanced senses, I was a bit sensitive to vinegar and didn't want to have to deal with the taste after having spent the past day or so electrocuting myself. Did they say which gardens they were going to? I glanced up at Julia as I worked on putting together a sandwich. Yes. Julia replied as she plucked some bread from the nearby basket. The gardens of the Lunar Palace. I told them to stay in the outer gardens because I'm worried about the stability of the walls in one of the inner courtyards. What happened? My eyes widened at those words, and my heart sped up. Did anyone get hurt? This was exactly the reason why I'd been pushing myself to finish all the repairs in the city, and why we'd kept most of the city off-limits. I didn't want there to be a tragedy because of the crumbling walls. And while I knew those who had grown up in Hatra knew which areas to avoid, the Azuran children didn't know. Just the thought of them being hurt put me on edge, and the scales on my arms rippled as a fierce anger rose up inside of me. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Julia said gently as she placed a calming hand on my arm. Leon finished examining the foundations of the palace and all the load-bearing walls. There isn't as much damage as we thought there would be, but it's still not safe for anyone to wander in, especially for children. It took a moment for the anger inside of me to calm down, but I'd lost my appetite. I just wanted to see the children with my own eyes to know they were safe and nothing bad had happened to them. I'll keep that in mind. I shoved the plate of food away from me and glanced at the pile of scrolls. Hey, did Leon write down all of that or what? He did make a written report with sketches. Julia tapped one of the scrolls at the top of the pile and tilted her head. There'll be a copy ready for you with my suggestions when you come back with the children. I stood up from my chair, hesitated, and then grabbed my sandwich. Even if I had no appetite, I needed to try and eat something in order to keep my body functioning. Thanks, I called out as I walked out of the common area. You're the best. Damn right I am. <laughs> Julia chuckled as she returned to her book. I almost choked on air at the highly improper reply from my mother, but instead I choked on my laughter. Maybe I should have expected that from her eventually. After all, she did grow up with Ruslan and traded with bandits for centuries. Getting to the Lunar Palace wasn't an issue if I set a brisk pace, and a sniff of the air let me know there wasn't anyone to stop me on my way there. Everyone was either in the archives, training, or in the farms. There were a few others scattered throughout the city, though. They were probably Leon's group as they identified the structures that needed the most attention. I finished my sandwich just as I was passing through the gates to the Lunar Palace, and I sniffed the air again to figure out which garden the children were in. Their scents were, for lack of better description, bright and clean. It was just like smelling freshly fallen snow, a crisp and pure scent untainted by the world around it. Their scent led me to a garden full of a multitude of flowers that had grown over many of the statues and walls inside of it. There was so much lavender within the garden, it looked as if someone had laid down a purple carpet of it, and the scent of it was heady and calming as I walked toward the two Azurin children. Stalks of lavender swayed over the sleeping Ilya, and Ilyushina sat next to him as she braided together a flower crown. Their silver-blue hair seemed to glow in the daylight, in contrast to their azure robes. Dragons were embroidered throughout the hems of their clothing, and I wondered if that was going to be a recurring motif in everyone's clothes now. Ilyushina didn't notice me until I was almost next to her, but then she shot me a shy smile as she showed me the crown of flowers she'd braided together. Hey, kiddo! I crouched down next to Ilyushina and patted her head. What do you have there? Flower crowns for the pretty ladies. Ilyushina pointed at the crown she'd already finished and waved the other one in the air. So they won't be sad when they wake up. Yeah? I sniffed at the flowers and pretended not to know what they were. What is that, lavender? Mm-hmm. Ilyushina grinned as she stood and placed a stalk of lavender in my hair. To help them sleep better and so the monsters won't go into their dreams. 
You're a good kid, you know that? I ruffled her hair as I smiled softly. Don't ever change, okay? I was happy there didn't seem to be any trauma from surviving the slaughter of her people and village, but I knew I needed to keep a watch out for it. Ilyushina might just be repressing her negative emotions and burying everything inside of herself so no one would be worried. Okay. <laughs> Ilyushina giggled as she handed me one of the flowers from her pile. Ilyushina promises to stay the same. Where's your brother? I asked as I pretended not to see Ilya asleep under the swaying stalks of lavender. Is he here with you? Ilya is sleeping over there. <laughs> Ilyushina giggled into one hand as she pointed to her brother. Can't you see him, silly? Ah, must have missed him. I had to bite my tongue to stop from laughing, but I couldn't stop my smile. Want to wake him up for me? Ilyushina nodded quickly as she stood up and practically bounced over to where her brother slept. Ilya! Ilya! Ilyushina tugged at her brother's hair and patted his face. Wake up! Our dragon is here to see us. Ilyushina, stop it! Ilya rubbed at his groggy eyes and blinked blearily at his sister. I've told you to stop pulling on my hair like that. But Ilya, you were asleep. Ilyushina innocently replied as she pointed at me. He asked Ilyushina to wake you up. Ilya tilted his head and blinked in confusion until he caught sight of me among the flowers. Master Evan, I, I mean, Lord Evan? Ilya jumped to his feet and rushed out a bow. Don't worry about that. I waved him over so I could ruffle his hair. You're a lord too, but before that, you're just a kid. Don't worry about all that proper stuff. There's time later for you guys to study and take classes. Just be kids and have fun. Leave all the worrying to all us adults. But I want to help. Ilya frowned in confusion as he sat down on the ground next to me. You're a lord now, and I don't know how to thank you or the princess. I had to bite back a sigh as I realized Ilya was more like me than I'd realized. He was driven by duty and honor to do the right thing. I was going to have a bit of trouble convincing him to be a kid and leave everything to the adults. If I wasn't careful, Ilya would develop a savior complex and he'd end up risking his life at every opportunity. That wasn't something I would ever allow to happen. Ilya and his sister were going to enjoy a peaceful childhood and I would do everything I could to protect them from the cruelties of this world. The two of you just need to be healthy and happy, I glanced between the two siblings to see if they understood what I was saying. That's the best way to thank all of us. Really? Ilya blinked up at me, and his gold eyes glowed as they caught the sunlight. The boy looked half convinced, but I could see a weight had been taken off his shoulders with my words. Yeah, it is, I ruffled his hair as I grinned widely. Now, I have a present for the two of you, but you have to promise me you won't use it unless there's an adult supervising you, or it's an absolute emergency. Do you promise? Ilyushina plopped down in front of us and nodded her head quickly. Her golden eyes glowed with curiosity as she crawled into my lap. We promise, Ilya replied quickly, and his voice was full of barely contained excitement. What is it? <laughs> Ilyushina giggled as she tugged on my sleeve impatiently. Oracalum daggers! I reached into my inner robe and pulled out the two blades I'd stashed away. One for each of you. They're so pretty! Ilyushina stood up the moment she saw the two daggers, and she leaned her head against my shoulder. It's like they're made out of starlight! Both children smiled at the sight of the beautifully made blades in my hands. I was pleased to see, even though they oohed and awed over the weapons, they didn't touch them. That eased some of the doubts I had over giving such young children daggers, but then again, they'd lived harsher lives than most children back on Earth. I knew I could trust them with these. Ilyushina sighed into my shoulder as she tucked her hands behind her back. It was clear she wanted to touch the shiny metal, but she was going to wait as patiently as she could until I gave her permission. Natalia made these. Ilya leaned in closely to trace the designs on the blades with his eyes. They look like her work. I was impressed Ilya was able to identify her work so quickly. But then again, he'd grown up in the same village with her. He'd probably seen more of her work than I had so far. Yeah, she did. I nodded as I handed Ilya one of the daggers. They're made from the holy metal your people have protected for ages. It's only right the two of you have one to protect you. 
I don't expect anything to get inside of the city and hurt you, but I don't want to take any risks where you are concerned. Our Lord, Father told us about the Orichalum, Ilya said, and he handled the dagger with reverence as he stared at it. He said it was just for us to protect, that we were never to use it. Yeah, and that's why I'm giving it to the two of you, I replied as I let Ilyushina hold on to the other dagger. I never want either of you to have to use it. I'm just hoping the power in this holy metal will protect the two of you long enough so I can get to where you guys are. Ilyushina tied the dagger onto the sash at her waist, and I nodded in approval. You will always save us? Ilyushina asked as she held tightly to the fabric of her skirt and fidgeted. Of course, I promised as I pressed my forehead against hers. No matter what, wherever the two of you are, I will always come and save you. Ilyushina wants to always stay with her dragon. The Azura wrapped her arms as far around me as she could and buried her face in my chest. Can she? We can stay? Ilya asked as he shuffled closer to me and blinked back tears from his golden eyes. Even if we're weak? This isn't a question of being weak or strong. I didn't hesitate as I pulled Ilya into the hug I shared with Ilyushina. You both are kids, and kids aren't meant to worry about these kinds of things. You're supposed to be happy and laughing, just having fun and running through the gardens, playing pranks on all of us, and sneaking away sweets from the cooks in the kitchen. Leave all the worrying to me. Ilyushina doesn't want to lose her family again. The young girl whispered against me softly, and her small body trembled in my arms. She's scared of that. Really scared. I see, I murmured. I'd been so worried about Ilya's solemnity that I hadn't thought of how Ilyushina would feel. Since she was always so cheerful and happy, I'd thought she hadn't been as traumatized by the slaughter as I feared she'd been. I'd obviously been a bit too hopeful about how fast children recovered. No one is going to disappear anymore, I said softly as I held the two Azurean children in my arms. I promise you. You're really going to promise such an impossible thing to these children? Asher's voice loomed in my mind, but I ignored him. I had to if I wanted to keep my dreams for the future and stay on the right path. I wasn't going to let doubt cripple me. My promise to Ilyushina wasn't going to be broken by anyone or anything. We stayed like that for a while, and Ilyushina sniffled sporadically against my chest as Ilya remained quiet. Want to come to the infirmary with me? I asked as I looked down at the two children in my arms, and a thrum of contentment went through me. The infirmary? Ilyushina tilted her head and blinked up at me with confusion in her golden eyes. Why? Ilyushina isn't sick. Well, didn't you want to bring those flowers to the pretty ladies? I nodded toward the flower crowns and the piles of lavender. The snake girl is in the infirmary, and the other dragon is in Aliona's room. We can stop by the infirmary first. Those words chased away the melancholy inside of the small Azurin girl, and her molten gold eyes lit up with excitement. Her brother also giggled behind his hands as he snuggled closer to me. Ilyushina almost forgot! The young girl exclaimed as she scrambled out of my arms and nearly ended up face first in the lavender. Don't worry about that, I laughed and tweaked her nose. You ended up remembering, didn't you? Because you asked. The little girl pouted as she crossed her arms over her chest. Ilyushina would have forgotten till it was night. And then Ilyushina would have to wait until tomorrow. And then what if she forgot again? I'm sure you wouldn't have, I reassured her as I let go of her brother so I could stand up. And if you didn't remember, Ilya would have reminded you, isn't that right? Next to me, Ilya nodded solemnly as he latched onto my hand. I couldn't get over how adorable they both were. And while I'd always had a soft spot for children, being a dragon seemed to make it just that much stronger. In reality, I was feeling everything so much stronger than when I was only a normal human guy back on Earth. I could feel every sway of the flowers around me and the way the wind rose in the air above us in languid sweeps. I was so deeply aware of the world in a way I never could have imagined if I'd never put on the dragon mask back in my aunt's antique store. Ilyushina tugged on my free hand, and I looked down at the little Azurin girl. It was obvious to me what she wanted, so I leaned down for her to clamber up onto my arm while she carried the gifts for the two injured women. Let's go! Ilyushina called out from her place on my hip. 
I grinned as we set out for the infirmary and wondered just how the snake girl was doing. Julia had told me the girl would be having daily baths in order to heal her mental wounds, and while I doubted Ilyushina's flowers would have any effect, they would be a welcome sight to wake up to. Just as we were about to reach the infirmary, though, a suffocating power buffeted the city. It was like an invisible tidal wave had come out of nowhere and slammed into my chest with the force of a freight train. The two children with me whined desperately, and I struggled to remain upright, but I was forced gasping to my knees. I held on tightly to the two children and kept them pressed to my chest. My senses were in overdrive trying to find the obvious threat. I'd never felt so much pure power, not even when the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens was summoned by Aliona. That had been an actual goddess, so what kind of entity did this overwhelming power belong to? I desperately looked around me, but I only saw my people gasping on the ground. Even the warriors from the Blue Tree Guild were overwhelmed to the point that they could barely rise to their knees. Then I looked up, and my jaw fell slack. The overwhelming power came from a white-haired man on a small cloud high above the city. Stay down! You can't fight him! He can wipe you from existence with a single sigh. He isn't someone you can challenge. Asher's scream echoed through my mind as I tried to gather my power around me, but it kept dissipating. If this was someone Asher feared, then they had to be an enemy, and I needed to protect my people. Who is that? I managed to growl out from underneath the rolling waves of power. Is he from the Green Glass Sect? Your master? No, he is the king and founder of Rama, Rodion. He is the seat of the White Jade Sect. My eyes widened in shock as the king's cold gaze settled on me. Why was he here? Wasn't he supposed to be guarding the breach? Why did he come instead of a representative from the White Jade Sect? Suddenly, a whirl of purity rose up in the distance, and I could tell it was Aliona. She was running toward us from the archives, and I felt how she gained speed with every step she took. Somehow, this power wasn't affecting her like it did us, and I wondered if it had to do with her immortal body and her power. I almost wanted to scream at her to leave, for her to run away from this suffocating presence, but the king's cold gaze kept me silent, and I realized something about the power that had forced me to my knees. Even though his power was overwhelming to the point that I questioned my existence, there was no malice in his power, not even a hint of displeasure. It was like a force of nature without judgment or bias. His power simply was. Instead of fear, awe filled me, and I vowed to myself that one day I would stand equal to him, and then surpass him. Chapter 13 I felt Aliona's purity swirl around me, and its effect counteracted the floating man's powers. I was able to stand, and I saw the rest of my people on the street also came to their feet as Aliona's power affected them, too. I turned my head and saw her as she ran. Her white hair fanned out behind her, and she came to a stop beside me. The cloud that carried the King of Rama drifted lower until it touched the cobblestones, and then it dissipated into a fine mist that swirled around his feet. He didn't look like an ancient and all-powerful being. The king looked like he could be even younger than me, as if he was in his early twenties. His long silvery hair was tied back in a high tail, and long bangs almost hid his strange eyes from view. They were a swirl of amethyst and sapphire hues that glittered in the same manner Aliona's eyes did. In fact, there was a startling resemblance between him and Aliona. Then the cold gaze shifted from me to the princess at my side, and the king lifted one eyebrow. This child respectfully greets his eminence, the glorious son of Rama. Aliona murmured as she dropped to one knee and clasped her hands in front of her. May the gods continue to bless and grace the sun that protects us all from the darkness. The king of Rama stepped forward and went on one knee in front of Aliona. Can you imagine my surprise? The king reached out one hand and tilted Aliona's chin upward. Receiving word first that the divine maiden of our country had been kidnapped by a demonic dragon to the fallen city of Hatra al-Shamash. 
So very strange, because my daughter was meant to be safe and sound, deep within the Mihireti Mountains, secluded within the cave of one thousand sages as she continued her studies. Daughter? Aliona was the child of this almost inhuman creature? I knew she was the princess of Rama and heir to the White Jade sect, but I'd assumed she'd been selected as heir because of her power and immortal body. But it was the opposite. Her power and immortality came from being the daughter of this immortal and almighty king. And I was fucking her. Father, this one can explain. Aliona clenched her clasped hands tightly as she looked up at the king. This child left the cave of one thousand sages in order to follow the oath of the White Jade sect. Yes, do explain to me how this all happened. The king hummed as he lifted his hand to his daughter's head, but then he suddenly frowned. Aliona, where's the hairpin I gave you? This child respectfully begs your forgiveness, the princess replied mournfully as she looked away from her father. This child was attacked by miasma, and the hairpin given to her was taken. The temperature all around us suddenly plummeted the moment Aliona said she'd been attacked by the miasma. Attacked? King Rodion frowned as mist swirled around his feet angrily. Miasma? I had an inkling the same overwhelming power from before was about to slam into us, and I needed to do something to stop it. So I put the two children down and stepped forward. This one respectfully greets his eminence, the glorious son of Rama, I said as I clasped my hands in front of me and dropped to one knee. May the gods continue to bless and grace the sun that protects us all from the darkness. And who are you? Rodion took a step toward me as he stared at me oddly. There's something strange about you, almost as if you are not from this world. If I knew the king better, I would say it was shock and recognition I saw in his gemstone eyes. I am Evan of the house of Hatra el Shamash, I replied as I remained on one knee and avoided the truth about where I came from. Son of Ruslan, lord of Hatra el Shamash, and Lady Julia, Hatra's keeper of knowledge. Ruslan, lord of Hatra, Rodion echoed as he turned from me to face my father, who had just ran up to my side, and curiosity dripped from his voice. Tell me, how is it possible for a fox and a human to have a dragon as their heir? As far as I can remember, there is no dragon blood within your line. Your eminence, he is our son. Ruslan also dropped to one knee and clasped his hands before him. He was not born of our flesh, but all the proper rites were followed to make him one of our blood. Your own daughter graciously oversaw the adoption ceremony and ensured nothing went awry. I did hear of a dragon calling himself a son of this city, Rodion murmured as his brow furrowed, but I never imagined this would be the reality. Honestly, it seems rumors never truly live up to reality. Then those unsettling eyes flickered from Ruslan to me. Although it is quite convenient you've become the son of a ruling house, albeit a fallen one. Convenient, your eminence? I glanced between the king and the still silent Aliona. May you enlighten us as to what you mean? It is I who should be enlightened, Rodion replied smoothly as he paced in front of us. Unless the ridiculous rumors were true, and my child was kidnapped by heathens who worship a demonic dragon. I see little evidence of the power of demons in you, so such a thing cannot be true. Yes, I am a dragon. I stood and pushed back my sleeves to reveal the black scales on my arms. But I will never do anything to harm Hatra el Shamash or the people who call this city their home. I will do anything and everything in my power in order to continue protecting the city against anyone who would harm her. A dragon protect mortals? Rodion tilted his head in amusement as he bit back a laugh. That hasn't happened in eons. Why are you any different than all those who have come before you? I'm different because I have saved the people of this city time and time again, I replied as I tried to rein in my anger. This was the same shit I had to go through with the adventurers from the Green Glass sect. What have you done for Hatra? I don't know your reasons, but I know Hatra hasn't received a single iota of help from you or the White Jade sect. Aliona is the one who brought the Blue Tree Guild here. She's the reason why I even ended up in Hatra. Evan! 
Julia whispered as she placed her hand on my shoulder. What are you doing? I'm saying what has to be said. I almost growled at my own mother, and I turned to glare at the king. Nothing has been done for Hatra. She was abandoned by this country. I understand you were forced to pick between Hatra and the world, but that choice isn't in front of you now. Will you do something now? Will you do your duty as the king of this country and close the demon gate that threatens this city? Will you lift the death curse on the Crimson Dragon Valera? Will you help me heal the broken? Will you protect Hatra El Shamash? There was an audible gasp at my words from the people around me, and a heavy pressure filled the air. It wasn't powerful enough to force any of us back onto the ground, but it was like all the air in the world had disappeared. Out of the corner of my eyes, I could see Ruslan and Julia glancing frantically between Rodion and me. I knew they were worried about how the king would react, but I kept my chin raised and my eyes locked on Rodion's. Maybe I had gone too far with the king, but somebody needed to say this to his face. Finally, after what felt like eons, King Rodion cracked an amused smile. You're a brave one! Rodion's voice was almost fond as he shook his head at me. It's not that you're a fool. You do have fear in you, but you persevere on regardless. No matter the cost to yourself, you will keep pushing on forward to protect that which you consider yours. You, Evan, are a proper dragon, if I've ever met one. The heavy pressure disappeared, and my family visibly relaxed. Julia's white-knuckled grip on her fan slackened, and she slumped against Ruslan in relief. Thank you? I wasn't quite sure if he was insulting me or praising me. Does that mean you'll help us? I will, Rodion smiled as he raised one finger, on one condition. What condition? I asked immediately. I didn't care what he would ask for as long as he helped my people. You must find the lost sword of Hatra El Shamash. Melancholy shifted behind Rodion's gemstone eyes, and he almost seemed to wilt. It was lost when the city was attacked by demons a thousand years ago, and has never been seen since by any living being. I didn't know why the king wanted me to find a lost sword. I mean, I could understand it being an emblem of the city and using it to raise morale, but we didn't need a weapon or something that would harm. What we needed was something that could break the death curse on Valera. But if finding a fucking sword made King Rodion happy, then fine, I'd find it. And if I find the sword, you'll keep your promise? I asked. Somehow I knew King Rodion was a man of his word, but I wanted to make sure. In a show of good faith, King Rodion replied as he placed his hand over his heart, I will even go and seal the demon gate. Father, what are you planning? Aliona asked as she glanced between us, and confusion glimmered in her eyes. Nothing, dear child. Rodion's eyes softened as he turned to face his daughter. This is merely a show of good faith. I have the highest of hopes for your dragon meeting my every expectation. Now, tell me, where is this demon gate you speak of, and why has the crimson dragon been cursed? A demon gate opened by her canyon, and she was attacked, I explained quickly. I think she was targeted, and a demon lord was attempting to turn her to their cause. The Crimson Dragon has always been ruthless in the defense of her territory, King Rodion explained as he tilted his head in thought. It would stand to reason her refusal of such an alliance. So will you help her? I asked with a frown. Valera's viciousness has never been without reason, King Rodion continued, half to himself. And she has never once attempted to expand her domain beyond the walls of the canyon. He paused, and then finally gave a decisive nod. Take me to her. His sudden command made me blink, but I guess there really was no time to waste when it came to this situation. Follow me, your majesty, I replied as I led King Rodion to Aliona's room where Valera and the dragon egg were resting. Aliona and the elders followed behind the quiet pair the king and I made, but while the elders stood off to the side, Aliona stood right next to the king. Valera was asleep as she was examined by Rodion, her eyes fluttered beneath her eyelids restlessly, and her breath came in short pants. Now let's see this death curse. A white glow emanated from Rodion's hand as he placed it on Valera's forehead, and he hummed thoughtfully. Evan, you were the one who healed her. Tell me, how did you find her? 
The demons had begun to rip her apart by the time we arrived. I stepped forward and motioned at Valera's body. Aliona reached Valera first and was working on containing the curse before I started to heal her wounds. There was something weird about her blood, though. There were black chunks in it, and her body smelled as if she was already dead and beginning to decay. This was all while she was still conscious and before I healed her. Reporting like this was something natural to me. It was just like the end of an EMT shift back on Earth, and the familiarity of it was soothing. I see, Rodion turned from Valera and looked at me. What about the egg? What condition was it in? The egg was fine, I replied as I moved closer to the bed. Valera protected the egg with her life, and nothing happened to it. I doubt the demons were even able to think of touching it. Sounds just like her, <laughs> Rodion chuckled as he lifted his hand from Valera's forehead. Father, Aliona smoothly interrupted as she stepped forward. There is still the matter of the demon gate. You said you would seal it. True, Rodion sighed as he ran his hand through his hair. That does take precedence at the moment. There is no point wasting time studying this death curse if another demonic horde pours out through that gate. Well, then let's close that rift, I declared before I turned to the priestess beside me. Aliona, can you take us there? Of course. Aliona replied sweetly as silver light covered her hands. Then the princess opened a portal for all of us to travel to the demon gate, and the moment we stepped through it, King Rodion frowned at the sight before him. The gateway to the demon world was like a scar on the face of a cliff, a festering wound from which seeped out poisonous miasma and tendrils of darkness. Black and purple spots were painted over the golden sands, and the dark colors had spread out farther since I'd last seen the demon gate. Aliona's seal was partially intact, but there was a large hole in the bottom of it, like something had forced its way out. I thought back to the numbers of demons we'd encountered in the canyon and winced more like a lot of somethings. The King of Rama walked to the demon gate and tilted his head as he stared at it. A faint glow emanated from his body, but the glow was gone when I blinked. Laika held onto my hand tightly as she stood at my side, and her fur bristled as a cold wind rushed out of the demon gate. She huddled closer to me, and I squeezed her hand gently in order to reassure the wolf demi-human, but the fur of her tail refused to smooth over. The air seeping out of the demon gate was full of malice and cruelty, similar to the way the miasma would cause despair to take over its victims before they died. I drew in a breath, concentrated on drawing forth my healing power, and a sheen of glitter gently fell on everyone around me like a cloak. I focused my power on the sole thought of protecting everyone from the negativity of the demon gate, to heal my friends and family from the darkness that threatened to taint them. Interesting! You didn't just throw your power at everyone this time. I ignored Asher's comment as I zeroed in on the strange and toxic power that surrounded the demon gate. It was like the rift had doubled or tripled in strength overnight. I wouldn't be surprised if miasma started seeping out of it even while we were in front of it. But although we were strong enough to fight it now, subduing the miasma wasn't something we could afford to waste our time and energy on. We had to completely eradicate the demon gate, not just put a band-aid on the issue. Oh, this is a bit of a nasty one indeed. Rodion leaned forward and tapped a finger on the tattered magical array in front of him. Come here, Aliona. Father? The princess stepped forward with a furrowed brow. You placed a temporary seal on this. Rodion glanced at his daughter as he kept his finger on the tattered array in front of him. Why did you not use the Sutra of the Forty-Four Seals instead of a common seal? Aliona tensed at his question and clasped her hands behind her back. She seemed disappointed with herself, as if she knew more had been expected of her, but she'd fallen short. I knew that was exactly what was going through her mind, because Aliona was just like me. She held herself up to strict standards and would accept nothing less than perfection from herself. Clearly, so did her father. Forgive me, father. Aliona's inner glow dimmed as she met Rodion's gaze. The Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens had come through me earlier that day, and I did not have enough power to manage even one of the Forty-Four Seals, or any other sealing spell. I see, Rodion sighed as he glanced from Aliona's face to mine. What a pity you were incapable of placing even one of those seals. So much could have been averted. Though, the blame isn't on you, dear child. 
Managing even a basic seal after summoning the Dark Lady is a feat in and of itself. Thank you, Father. Aliona almost vibrated with relief at not being blamed. I was taught well by my masters. A tenseness left my shoulders, and I was relieved the blame hadn't been laid at my princess's feet. I knew I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut if her father started to berate her for it. Though I do wonder, Rodion hummed as he turned his gaze to the demon gate, at the timing of it all and why one even appeared so far away from the other cities. It doesn't make sense to attack Valera after all of this time. What is it that they were trying to accomplish? I tilted my head and realized he did have a point. If the demon lords wanted to turn Valera to their side, why hadn't they done that before? A thousand years had passed since Hatra's fall, and they had all of that time to kill her or kidnap her. In fact, if it was me trying to wipe her off the map after she turned down my offer of alliance, I would have killed her the same night Hatra was destroyed. No one would have been surprised by the timing, and no one would have been able to find her in time to even try and break the death curse. Father? Aliona asked as she tilted her head. Are you going to use the Sutra of the Forty-Four Seals for this? The king had begun to draw a multi-layered magical array on top of Aliona's tattered one, but then he glanced over at his daughter. What? Rodion paused, and confusion slid through his dual-colored eyes before he cleared his throat. Ah, yes. This would be a good opportunity for you to learn. You're going to teach me? Aliona's inner glow had dimmed before, but now it was like someone cranked up the dial. Truly? A soft laugh bubbled out of my throat, and I coughed in order to hide it. From the exasperated glance Julia shot me, I knew I hadn't fooled anyone with my fake cough, but Lyca smirked next to me and squeezed my hand. What could I say? I had a weakness for Aliona's enthusiasm, and it was contagious. Thankfully, the two immortals in front of us apparently hadn't noticed my faux pas because they forged on in their discussion. You have memorized the Sutra of the Forty-Four Seals, have you not? Rodion asked his daughter as a smirk slid onto his face. Otherwise, how would you have gotten out of that cave? A bright blush I was very familiar with spread across Aliona's cheeks and ears as her eyes darted downward. Yes, father. Aliona murmured as she fidgeted with the fabric of her dress. I've memorized all the sutras and literature that lay within the cave of one thousand sages. Hmm. Rodion nodded as he reached out to tuck a stray strand of hair behind Aliona's ear. I would expect no less from my daughter. I let go of Lyca's hand and moved toward Julia. What are they talking about? I whispered as I nodded toward the two immortals. The Sutra of the Forty-Four Seals? Aren't sutras just prayers? They are scriptures handed down by gods from their palaces in the high heavens. Julia's knuckles were blanched bone white as she fanned herself nervously. Many of them can be used to seal away evil or for miracles, especially for when demons emerge from rifts. Miracles? A shudder went down my spine, and my eyes darted back to the demon gate. What kind of miracles? It said they can give up their bodies to the gods. Julia's eyes narrowed as she snapped her fan shut. That for no price they can have the power of gods and even bring back the dead. But that's a lie. There's always a price. You can't have that sort of power without a price being paid for it. A price? I echoed with a frown. I heard a legend of a mage who practiced the sacred scriptures and attempted to conquer both the high heavens and the netherworld. He was cursed by the high heavens for his arrogance and fell from grace. Asher quietly whispered into my mind what he heard as a child, but all I could think was of Aliona falling into deviation again and that terrible stillness taking over her body. It's too late to stop them, Ruslan said softly as he pointed toward the two immortals. They've already started. I turned, and my heart almost stopped at the incredible sight in front of me. Aliona and Rodion stood next to each other while a golden magical array encircled them. Then, Rodion reached out and grasped one of Aliona's hands in his as he lifted his free hand. This wasn't the first time I'd seen magic, and I'd seen it plenty of times since I'd come to Inati. But this? This was just like the night Aliona had banished all the miasma from Hatra, and there had been a galaxy full of stars around her. 
Aliona's exhilarating purity was entwined with a cool serenity I realized came from Rodion's power. The mixture of energy embraced all of us gently, and my own power rose up in curiosity. It was so strange, but so familiar at the same time, like I'd been meant to be here at this very moment. Something inside of me clamored to rise to the surface, and I could feel my spiritual sea sing in excitement. Suddenly, Aliona and Rodion's power rushed upward as an invisible wind lifted their hair. Evil may choose to rear its head and spit venom toward the high heavens. Rodion's free hand glowed gold as runic circles surrounded the demon gate. And yet, instead of reaching the heavens, the venom will return and descend upon the evil one. Virtue cannot be destroyed, while evil inevitably will destroy itself. Eleven magical arrays surrounded the demon gate and shifted rapidly as they glowed a brilliant gold. What looked like snowflakes descended from the magical arrays, and as they fell onto the ground, the corruption that had slithered out of the demon gate disappeared. The sorrows of mortals come from their longings and desires. Aliona's voice echoed as she lifted her free hand and pointed at the demon gate. From these sorrows and desires, fear comes. If freedom from these desires are gained, what cause for grief and fear will remain? Eleven more magical arrays encircled the demon gate, except this time they glowed a bright silver as stars floated down from their outer edges. Those who allow themselves to fall to longings and desires, Rodion intoned as he drew another circle in the air, they are like men who walk in the wind while carrying a torch. Inevitably, they will be consumed by the flames and fall to their own wicked desires. The eleven magical arrays that appeared around the demon gate this time were pitch black, and smoke curled out gently from them. Aliona's stars only glowed that much brighter because of the darker arrays, and their beauty could truly be appreciated. Those who follow the truth as set down by the high heavens, they are like one who has fought ten thousand and will fight ten thousand more. Aliona slashed her free hand downwards, as if it were a sword, and the magical arrays tightened. Those who follow the truth as set down by the high heavens, they are like one who has fought ten thousand and will fight ten thousand more. The fourth and last batch of magical arrays were still eleven in number, but they were a dark crimson reminiscent of fresh blood. What looked like flames licked at their edges and flickered upward to the beat of a drum I could barely hear. They were like the drums of war, and my body tensed in preparation for the culmination of this ceiling. Thus is the truth perceived at last, it is thus. Rodion's echoing voice brought the beating drums to silence as he lowered his free hand. Just as when one enters into a darkened cave, one enters with a torch, and the darkness dissipates. Only light remains to guide the way, and the brilliance of it will lead to the formation of the heavens and earth. The forty-four magical arrays spun around the demon gate so quickly I couldn't even pick them apart by color. They merged into one massive array, and then they engulfed the entirety of the demon gate. Cease! Aliona called out, and the arrays spun to a sudden stop. I call you to cease! And thus, said Rodion in a low voice as he closed his eyes, will the darkness leave. Just like that, the magical arrays and the demon gate disappeared. There was nothing in the air I could smell or sense, nothing left behind to even hint that there was once a hole in the fabric of the world here. It is done. Aliona slumped against her father as their hair slowly fell back into place and the blinding glow that had surrounded them settled back inside of them. And now, Lord Evan, Rodion said as he turned to me, it is time for you to uphold your end of the bargain. I'll find the sword, I nodded as my spiritual sea came to a standstill inside of me. And when I do, you'll break Valera's death curse. Then we'll talk about the future of my city and what you plan to do for Hatra. King Rodion only smiled mysteriously in response as he supported the tired Aliona. Then he opened a portal that brought us back to the city, and I quickly made my way to the underground archives. 
The sword of Hatra hadn't been seen in a thousand years, so it stood to reason my best bet at finding a clue about the sword was heading somewhere that had been untouched for a thousand years. I needed to find it, and I wouldn't fail. Valera's life was on the line, and I wasn't going to let her die. From what I'd been told by Aliona and Julia, the swords of the noble houses were divine objects that not just anyone can possess or even wield. Even having noble or royal blood wouldn't guarantee one would be able to wield it. You had to be a hero recognized by the high heavens themselves. I'd saved lives before and risked my own in the process, but I didn't know if that made me a hero or not. Still, that didn't really matter in this situation, because all King Rodion asked of me was to find the Sword of Hatra, not be able to wield it. Still, there was something about the Sword of Hatra I was sure I wasn't remembering right almost like I'd heard about it or even seen it before. It had moonstones in the shape of a crescent moon on the hilt, I murmured to myself as I walked down one of the hallways of the underground library, and the blade looked like it was made out of pure crystal. I blinked and wondered where on earth I'd seen that just as my head throbbed painfully. Then everything around me went dark as an ice-cold pain lanced through my temples and brought me to my knees. The pain passed after a few moments, and I groaned as I stood up carefully and used the wall as a support. The fuck was that? I rubbed my temples as I blinked rapidly. The sudden chime of a bell startled me, and I glanced around the hallway. As far as I knew, there were no bells down in the archives at all. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of white, and I turned to see a child dressed all in white and with white hair. Hey, kid, come back! I called out to the child and ran after them. You shouldn't be down here all alone. We haven't explored all of it yet. The kid remained just around every corner from me as I chased them through the underground library. I barely noticed that we'd left the already explored areas and gone further into uncharted territory. I didn't understand how the strange child was able to stay ahead of me because I was stronger and faster than I'd been as a human. There was no way a kid, even if they weren't human, would be able to outrun me. This went on for what felt like hours in the windowless complex. I had no way of knowing exactly how long I chased after him, or even where in the underground library I was. All I knew was that I was in front of a giant set of doors I'd never seen before, and something inside of it was calling to me. I'd seen the kid slip inside, but I didn't know what was waiting for me behind those doors. The doors were unlike the rest of the library. They were carved out of a dark blue stone I was sure was marble, and not the blue stone the city had been built from. There were even carvings of moons and stars along the entirety of the doors, and a dragon hidden behind the celestial imagery. My instincts took over, and the moment I placed my hand on the doors, they swung open for me, and I passed through them. The doors shut closed behind me, but I wasn't scared. Somehow, I felt like I was home, and there was nothing for me to be worried about here. Nothing in Hatra would ever harm me, because the city knew I belonged to her. I couldn't see the kid anymore, but what I did see knocked the breath from my lungs. It was a great but dusty hall made out of a dark blue marble that glimmered as if thousands of stars were embedded in the stone. On either side of the cavernous hall were life-size statues in moonstone alcoves that gave them an ethereal glow, and the statues all wore crowns and held a stone sword in their hands. I stepped closer to one of the statues and realized the stone sword was exactly how I'd thought to myself the Sword of Hatra looked like. Carved on the hilt was a crescent moon made up of smaller carved stones I knew were in the place of moonstones. Dust covered the carved plate at the foot of the statue, so I bent and wiped the grime away with my hand. Tristan, Lord of Hatra El Shamash. I read out the name on the carved plate and looked up at the statue. Tristan was a handsome fox demi-human, but his features were familiar, like I'd seen him in person before. But there was no way that was possible, because he had to have lived more than a thousand years ago. Where have I heard your name? I tilted my head as I tried to remember. Lord Tristan. Did Pops talk about you, or did I hear about you during one of Lady Julia's lectures about Hatra's history? 
I suddenly remembered the genealogies of the lords of Hatra I'd looked through on the first day of my lessons with Julia. Ruslan was the current lord of Hatra, and he'd inherited that title from his father who had passed years after the attack on the city. He'd even inherited part of his name from his father, since it was tradition for the Anne to be present in the name of every lord and heir to Hatra. This wasn't just the statue of some random ancestor of Ruslan. This was his father and my grandfather. This was the statue of the last proper lord of Hatra and the last man known to wield the sword of Hatra. He was the grandfather I never had the chance to meet. In fact, I never met any of my grandparents back on Earth. My mom back on Earth and Aunt Emma told me they died because of some medical condition long before I was born. And I never questioned it because people died all the time from illnesses. But that wasn't the case with Tristan and Ruslan's mother. They died some time after Hatra had been attacked by demons, demons who wanted nothing more than the total destruction of the city. Then the corruptive miasma engulfed the city in deathly waves for centuries. My father grew up an orphan in a broken city, with the mantle of Lord on his shoulders, all because some demon lords plotted and wreaked havoc. And now an ancient dragon was about to die because of those very demon lords, unless I was able to find the sword. The magnitude of everything hit me at once, and I couldn't help the righteous anger that coursed through me because, once again, my family had been taken away from me before I even had the chance to meet them. I promise you I will protect our people. I bit out angrily as I looked up at my grandfather's statue. Hatra will never again suffer the way she did. I will find our lost sword and use it to rebuild our city. You will be able to rest in peace. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to calm my anger before I glanced back to Tristan's marble face. You know, I wish I could have met you, I murmured as I bent and trailed my fingers over the carved nameplate. How would you have reacted to Ruslan adopting me, to all of this? Just as my fingers slid off the carved plate, I heard the peal of a bell and looked around me to find the source of the sound. But I quickly froze, and the breath stilled in my lungs. The old abandoned hall had suddenly shifted and changed into a pristine chamber without a single speck of dust. And most importantly, the tip of an extremely sharp sword now dug into my back, and the heat of a wild flame lurked around me even though I couldn't see any fire. Who are you, and how did you get down here? It was a man's voice, all cool and controlled, that echoed in the hall around us. My heart skipped a beat as I slowly raised my arms in the air. Chapter 14 Take it easy, I said, as my mind raced a million miles an hour. I was just paying my respects. These are the sacred catacombs of the lords of Hatra el Shamash, the man snapped. Not just anyone can be in here, so I will ask again. Who are you, and how did you get in here? I chewed on my lips as I tried to figure out what the fuck was going on. There had been no one inside of the hall when I'd come in, not even the strange kid I'd been chasing. The dust had been piled up on all of the statues, and it smelled like no one had been in here for centuries. So how did this guy get the drop on me? And who the fuck was he? I could ask you the same thing, I replied as I tried to glance over my shoulder, but the tip of the sword dug an inch deeper into my back. You said this is a sacred place, so why are you here waving around a sword? Obviously because there's an intruder, the man replied in an icy cold tone. I was alone, and then you appeared out of thin air. How do I know you're not a threat to my city, especially when you refuse to answer such a basic question? I came here through the doors, I replied. Honesty was the best option since I was being threatened with a sword at my back. I was just following a kid dressed all in white. That's impossible. The man took a step forward, and the tip of the sword pressed further into my spine. Only those who carry the blood of Hatra el Shamash, or a sigil allowing them passage, may enter through those doors. I do carry that blood, I said calmly. I am of the bloodline of Hatra el Shamash, and have promised my future to her glory. The sword tip dug a fraction deeper into my shirt, and I suppressed a sigh. Again, that is impossible. 
The heat in the room rose as the man snarled, and the crackling of flames trailed behind his words. There is no one carrying Hatra's blood I do not know of, and all of the sons and daughters of this city are accounted for. Unless you've stolen that blood for some nefarious reason, in which case you will be brought to trial. Well, fuck. Listen, this is some sort of misunderstanding, I began as I started to slowly turn around, but I trailed off once I saw the man at my back. There was no way this was possible. The man before me was Tristan, alive and well. He looked just like his statue and just like Ruslan, with brilliant crimson hair and eyes so green they were like emeralds. Crimson ears twitched atop his head, and an equally red tail was slung languidly over his shoulder. His robes were a dark azure, like the ones I was wearing, but they were trimmed with stars and moons along the hems. In his hand was the sword I'd seen in my dreams once before, and the very sword Tristan held in his statue. It was the Sword of Hatra, and it was just as beautiful as I'd known it would be. The blade gleamed as if it were ice, and it was like the light of a thousand stars was trapped inside of it. Maybe I was hallucinating, or I had slipped and hit my head on the floor. I will ask once more. Tristan growled with the sword pointed at me, and his face twisted into a scowl. Who are you, and how did you get in here? Isn't it polite to introduce yourself first before you ask for someone's name? I replied in an attempt to buy some time and see if this man really was my grandfather. The man blinked for a moment before he smirked at me. I am Tristan, he declared confidently as the sword in his hand glowed with power. I am Lord of Hatra el Shamash. Now I'll ask again, who are you, and how did you come to be here? Shit. This was either an elaborate dream, or I had somehow ended up in the past. If it was the first option, I wasn't sure how it would have happened, unless the dust in the hall was capable of making people hallucinate. So, the second was more likely, however crazy that seemed. No less crazy than being transported to another world and turned into a dragon, though. I'd been rolling with the punches ever since I came to Anati, so this was another one just to go along with. But if I'd actually ended up in the past, that made things a little tricky. Mostly because I didn't know how my actions would change the future, and my present. Ugh, time travel was such a mindfuck. I shook my head and refocused on the man in front of me, one thing at a time. My name is Evan, I said with a dip of my head. It is a pleasure to meet you, Lord Tristan. Well met, Evan, my grandfather replied formally, but he hadn't dropped his sword, and his eyes were still narrowed in suspicion. Do not think I have not noticed you evaded my second question. This is the last chance I'm given you to answer. How did you enter the sacred catacombs? I opened my mouth to respond, but then bit my lip. What could I possibly say? The truth? Was that allowed? No one had prepped me on the proper etiquette of time travel. Would I change the past and irrevocably fuck up the future? Unless, and this was a long shot, maybe I got thrown back into the past for a reason, and maybe my presence here wouldn't be that much of an issue. I'd ended up in the world of Anadi for a reason, so I needed to think I was back in the past for a reason too. I just had to remember to be careful with my words so I wouldn't change anything in the future. But was that the right choice? I could possibly save lives by being here, all depending on how far back in time I was. That's because I'm from the future, I finally blurted when I realized my thoughts were going in circles. I don't know what happened, and I don't have any answers for you, but I can promise you I am not your enemy, nor the enemy of Hatra. I carry the blood of Hatra el Shamash, just as you do. This is my home. From the future? Tristan lowered the sword and tilted his head as he looked at me. I'd believe that of a sage, but you don't look anything like one, nor do you seem to have a talisman that would allow you to travel through time. Well, that was fair. I didn't want to look like an eccentric old hermit anyways, and I probably looked like a random young lord. It wasn't my power, I shrugged as I wondered what brought me back in time a thousand years. I was searching for something, and then power swirled all around me. The next thing I knew, I had a sword point in my back. Tristan stared at me for several long moments before all wariness disappeared from his face and stance. Perhaps you triggered a spell by accident, 
Tristan sighed as he rubbed the bridge of his nose. How far into the future? I was a little surprised at how readily my grandfather accepted what I said, but then I remembered this was a world of magic. A little time travel was probably mundane for him. So I tried to think of a point of reference, but unfortunately timeliness hadn't been discussed in my meager one-time lesson. I hadn't been too worried about that since time travel had obviously not been on my schedule, but there had to be some point of reference I could use to figure out just how far back I was. Wait a minute. I knew how long Valera had been in the Crimson Canyons. The Crimson Dragon has lived in the canyons for over 3,000 years, I replied carefully as I watched Tristan's face for a reaction. 3,000 years? Tristan's brow furrowed and a muscle in his jaw twitched. The Crimson Dragon has only been in the canyons for 2,000 years, so that must mean you're from at least a 1,000 years in the future. Did you say a 1,000 years? My blood pounded in my ears as my claws dug into the palms of my hands. I'm back in time a thousand years? War drums echoed inside of me as I realized I'd been thrown back to before Hatra was destroyed by demons. I didn't know how much time I had before the city was ravaged, if it was hours or if we had days to prepare. There was no way I was just going to sit around and wait for my city to be destroyed, though. Fuck the timeline. I didn't care what kind of temporal loop I might end up stuck in if I messed with the past. My city and my people were more important. You look pale, as if you've seen a ghost. Tristan slipped the sword into his sheath and placed his hand on my shoulder. You have no idea, I muttered as I could feel the hint of a stress headache forming behind my eyes, and I couldn't help the bitter laugh that escaped me. There was some cosmic irony at play here. Tristan wondered if I'd seen a ghost. But he was the ghost to me. He was long dead, along with most of the city of Hatra and my people. Tell me, how is Hatra in the future? Tristan smiled as his eyes glittered with curiosity. How great has our city become? What of the Azuras in the forest? Have they finally come out of seclusion and shared their smithing talents with the world? I flattened at the excitement I saw in Tristan's face. How could I tell him Hatra fell? And while the Azuras did come out of the forest, it was only after they'd been massacred. Hatra has lost all... I trailed off and tried to find the words to explain the tragedy and what happened. What do you mean, Hatra lost? Lost all what? Tristan asked as his brow furrowed in confusion. What happened to our city? Hatra was destroyed by demons. I growled as the drums of war still echoed inside of my head, and my blood pounded furiously. They destroyed everything within the city, leaving only ruins and crumbling walls. For a thousand years, Miasma attacked the survivors until only a hundred or so of our people remained. That couldn't have happened, Tristan protested with a shake of his head, even as shock grew in his emerald eyes. Hatra's protected by the blessings of the Moon Princess— there's no way demons would have been able to even breach the city's barrier, let alone make it to the walls. And yet it did happen. I gritted my teeth in anger as I remembered the first time I'd seen my city in its ruined state. The walls of Hatra fell, and it was only just now in my present that the city has started to rebuild. If the walls of Hatra fell, Tristan muttered slowly as he paced in front of me, then that means the attacking force must have been a legion— or possibly worse. How much worse? I hadn't considered the amount of demons that would have attacked Hatra or their level. A legion of demons would be devastating alone. You don't know what happened that day? Tristan asked in surprise as he stopped pacing to lean against a nearby wall. Were there no records left of the attack? What about those who survived the attack? Only stories passed down by the elders, I shook my head and rubbed the back of my neck. There was no one living from that night. I'd pretty much just told Tristan that, even if he survived the demon's attack, he wouldn't be alive a thousand years from now. Ruslan was an even 800, so the longest Tristan would have survived after Hatra's fall was 200 years. What about the memories of the sword? Tristan motioned to the sword on his hip, and then to the statues all around us. If the bloodline of Hatra has continued on through you, then the memories would have been in the sword. The sword of Hatra carries the memories and experiences of all the lords and ladies who have borne the burden of ruling our city. As an heir to this bloodline, you must have some knowledge of what happened if you or one of your parents wielded the sword. 
The sword has never been seen since that night, I replied, as I thought about how useful the knowledge inside of the sword would have been for all of us. I was searching the archives for some sort of clue as to what happened to it, and then I was here, back in time a thousand years. From terrible to worse, Tristan groaned as he covered his face with his hands. To think our Hatra will fall within my lifetime. He shook his head and then looked up at me with a spark of hope in his emerald eyes. Still, you are proof there is still hope. Even if Hatra falls as you say she will, our people will still survive. I will do whatever it takes to lessen the casualties. It was a promise that while it would be difficult to keep, I would push myself to the limit to fulfill. I got thrown back in time for a reason. It wasn't just a fluke. Then we must start preparing. Tristan stepped forward to the center of the hall and motioned for me to stand next to him. Watch carefully in case you never learned this. Learned what? I asked as I joined him and tilted my head in curiosity. How to send messages using your power? Tristan extended his hand, and white flames flickered into existence. Focus your power in your hand. Don't give it any shape yet. Just let it exist outside of you without any command being given to it. Any power is fine? I asked as I glanced between Tristan's white fire and my empty palm. Does it have to be fire, or can it be something else? No, it doesn't have to be, Tristan mused, but then he considered me curiously. Am I right to assume you haven't been taught how to control fire? Not yet, <laughs> I laughed. My pops hasn't had time to teach me. There's been a lot going on. As I focused on drawing up my healing power, I realized it had trouble rising to the surface. But I didn't know why. What I wouldn't give for a magical search engine that would make learning about this new world a breeze, and maybe the royalties could bring in a nice income for Hatra. Not that we would need the money with all of the treasures buried underneath the city. Hmm, how much would dragon scales sell for, too? They had to be pretty rare, if not legendary items, and would have the appropriate price tag. Pops, Tristan echoed as he pulled me from my dragon hoarding thoughts. How old are you, Evan? I'm twenty-five, I replied. A bit young, probably, compared to almost everyone, but I'm a blooded warrior. I've already fought and bled to protect Hatra. I would do it again in an instant, too. You're so young! Pain flashed in Tristan's emerald eyes before they shifted to melancholy. You have an entire lifetime ahead of you. I wish I would be able to see how much glory you'll bring to our people. Our city will rise up again so long as the essence and blood of Hatra exists, and that is in you. I won't let you down. A glittering swirl of power rose up in my hand as I smirked. Hatra fell once, but she will never fall again. I will hold you to that. Tristan smirked back as the white flames in his hands jumped to the floor. Focus on a form, the one most comfortable for your mind, and let your power take that shape. Loosen your control over it, and your power will mold itself and follow your wishes. A small fox made entirely out of white fire appeared in front of us and bowed its head before it sat on the marble floor. I could hear the hum of magic and power that ran through the small beast of flame. If I kept my eyes on the point just behind it and let my vision go out of focus, I could see the way magic coursed through the fox and the way it had been molded to bring the creature to life. I glanced back at my own hand and smirked. The shape my messenger would take was obvious. It was going to be a dragon. How could it be anything else? I loosened my control over my power and just let it flow through me. Then I focused on the idea of my power serving as a messenger for me. It would be my voice and spread the information I wanted. A moment later, my magic surged through me, and I inhaled sharply at the result. Right before my eyes formed a crystalline and glimmering kaleidoscope dragon that sniffed at the white fox. Ha! I did it! I exclaimed with a broad grin. How curious! Tristan tilted his head as he looked between the tiny dragon and my face. The messengers are almost always foxes, though that isn't the rule. But there has never been a dragon to my knowledge. I was right to think there's more than meets the eye with you, Evan. I really like dragons and the idea of flying. I lifted my shoulders in a casual shrug as I bit down on my cheek. So what's the message, and who are you going to send it to? I trusted Tristan, 
but I didn't think he would take my being a dragon so easily. I was worried he would think I was a threat instead. To the members of my council, Tristan said as he turned his eyes from me to the small white fox. The city needs to be put on full alert immediately and prepare for an attack at any notice. Not to mention, I need to warn his eminence. I released my control over the kaleidoscopic dragon and let it fade away since Tristan was going to take care of informing everyone. Besides, they would probably be weirded out by seeing a tiny dragon out of nowhere sent from someone they didn't know. Why warn? I furrowed my brow at the thought and remembered Hatra had received no aid the night the city had been destroyed. Are you going to ask the king for aid? Would they even reach the city in time? Tristan looked at me oddly for a moment before understanding filled his bright emerald eyes. He turned back to look at the white fox and nodded at it before it went running off through the walls. As a noble of the sword, Tristan explained as he walked toward the doors, it is my duty to warn the king of any dangers. I exist to protect both Hatra and Rama. If there's something dangerous heading toward our city, if I cannot stop it and aid will not arrive in time, then it is my duty to contain it, no matter the price to me. It stops at Hatra, I followed after Tristan, and anger coursed through me as I understood his words. Whatever the danger, it cannot spread to the rest of Rama. Exactly, Tristan nodded as he opened the doors. Now, let us head to the Lunar Palace. My council will have already begun preparations for the impending battle. How strong are Hatra's armies? I asked as I followed my grandfather out of the catacombs. How much of an onslaught can they withstand? Hatra's armies are a hundred thousand strong, Tristan replied as he led me through the hallways of the underground archive easily. With time, we could probably muster another 50,000 from the forces stationed at our nearby vassal villages, but I doubt any of them would be able to make it in time. They are more than a day's ride from the city walls. I felt silent at that because I'd heard no mention of those vassal villages in my future. It was obvious they'd been slaughtered and stood no chance against the demons. Even if they survived the initial attack, they would have even less of a chance surviving the attacks from the miasma over the next thousand years. Unless, and this was a bit of a stretch, the descendants of those villages were the bandits who had traded with Hatra before they were manipulated by the miasma. Their twisted sort of loyalty to the city, and the way they'd attacked traveling caravans and other villages as a way to get back at the country that had seemingly abandoned them, would make sense. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see scholars walking through the archives with scrolls in hand as they whispered to each other. I could pick up their discussions easily with my enhanced hearing, but their conversations went over my head. They were talking about things like self-maintaining temporal loops and shrinking the power constraints of multi-layered runic circles. Don't fall behind now, Tristan laughed as he looked over his shoulder at me. It's a maze down here. I once got lost down here for days as a child, all because I was hiding from my tutors. Yeah, I can believe that. A deep sigh left my lips as I remembered just how confusing the setup of the underground library was. This place is immense. It's been a month since we found it in my time, and we still haven't been able to fully map it out. We found the catalog that listed all of the books and a majority of the artifacts stored in the cavernous space, but my mother's team keeps finding more rooms and artifacts. The archives have many secrets, Tristan grinned slyly at me before he nodded further down the passageway one of which we're heading to. If we had more time and Hatra wasn't about to be attacked, I'd show you more of them. We picked up the pace, and we quickly arrived at an archway embedded in the halls of the library and made out of pure moonstone. A glittering golden magical array drifted within the doorway it made. Do you remember the path here? Tristan tapped his finger on the hilt of his sword as he looked at me. This archway is just like the entrance to the catacombs. Only those who bear our sigil or the blood of Hatra may pass through here. Yeah, photographic memory, I smirked as I tapped the side of my head. Once I see something, I never forget it. Tristan hummed in thought for a moment before he smiled at me. That is quite useful. Now let's go. We stepped through the archway, and as the power in the air all around me sang in delight, I could feel as my own magic rose up to meet it. That was amazing! I laughed as I turned to look at the archway we had stepped through. It felt like I was being welcomed home or something. You are home, 
Tristan replied as he continued walking. The Lunar Palace has always been the home of the Lords of Hatra. This is your home. In front of me was a long hallway with exquisitely carved windows along one wall that looked out onto a courtyard. Beyond the courtyard, I could see carefully kept gardens and more ornate buildings. Something pricked my senses, and I carefully glanced around to see what it was that reached out to me. It was as if I'd been asleep in a garden, and a ray of light had gently caressed my forehead. That was the only way I could explain it. Then I saw her. A woman walking down a different hallway that intersected with the same hall we were walking down. The woman who approached us was richly dressed in pale blue silks that clung to the generous curves of her body and complemented her golden skin. Her pale pink hair fell in thick waves down her back, and large diamonds glimmered at her temples. More jewels dripped from her fox ears and along her slender neck. The wealth of Hatra was obviously displayed on this beautiful woman, and I knew she wasn't just some pretty face we'd run into. Well met, Lord Evan. The finely dressed woman smiled gently at me as she curtsied to me gracefully. I am Lady Sarnai, wife of Lord Tristan. Sarnai had been the name next to Tristan's in the genealogy I'd read. This was the woman who raised Ruslan to be the wise leader he'd turned into. Well met, Lady Sarnai. I bowed back to her and smiled at the woman I knew to be my grandmother. It is a pleasure to meet such a gorgeous woman as you are. Moy, you are a charmer. Sarnai laughed pleasantly as she brought up a slender hand to hide her full lips. I can see my lord's blood run strongly through you. I don't know if that was a compliment or not, Tristan snorted as he offered his arm to his wife, and she joined us as we walked down the hallway. How did you know my name? I asked as I kept an easy pace next to the two foxes. My lord sent me a message, Sarnai explained as she brushed a stray lock of hair away from her face. He informed me we had an important guest present today. Of course, I rushed as quickly as I could in order to meet this time-traveling son of Hotra. Ah, the message fox from earlier probably found her, or split off into two foxes. Partway down the hall, I started looking at the paintings that adorned the wall and stopped in front of one of a woman in a moonlit garden. She was eerily beautiful, with full brows above her large eyes and even fuller lips set in a half-smile. Her eyes were strange, though, and they shifted between pink and purple as the light fell on her painting. She's beautiful. I stared at the oddly familiar woman in the painting and tried to remember where I'd seen her. Who is she? The Lady Asan. Sarnai answered as she stopped next to me. She was sent to his eminence as a bride five years ago from the house of Hotra. He'd stopped accepting concubines, but he brought her into his harem, and she was elevated to the status of consort. Is that odd? I asked as I tore my eyes away from the painting and looked at Sarnai. For someone who hasn't accepted a new bride in over two thousand years or even had a consort? Sarnai sighed as she placed one hand on the dark frame of the painting. Yes, it was quite the strange event. She became our queen, but at great cost to herself. I was surprised by that tidbit. That meant the woman in the painting could be Aliona's mother by birth, or one of her mothers by marriage. But there was something more to her. The expression on her face almost reminded me of the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens. What happened? I questioned as I turned back to Sarnai and Tristan. Did she die or fall sick? Tristan glanced between his wife and me for a moment before he seemed to come to a decision. His face was set in stubborn determination as he looked back at the painting, and I wondered if he'd grown up with the Lady Isan and knew her well. This is a secret known only to the nobles of the sword. Tristan said as he led us away from Lady Isan's painting. Lady Isan is with child, but she has been asleep for one hundred years already. No one knows when or if the child will even be born. If she ever gives birth, the child will inherit all of Rama and the White Jade sect. That child would be the first one born to his eminence. That explained it. The Lady Isan had to be Aliona's mother. She was the only child of King Rodion and had been declared as heiress to the kingdom before she'd even been born. But Julia mentioned helping Aliona's mother give birth to her even though she should have been in the Mahiredi Mountains. 
Something strange was going on with the White Jade sect, and I had a feeling it had to do with the corruption Aliona hinted at. A fierce anger rose up inside of my chest as I decided I would wipe all the corruption from Rama for Aliona, and I would make my princess a throne from their corpses. Malarts, if you will excuse me. Sarnai dipped into a graceful curtsy, and the diamonds in her hair sparkled as they caught the light. I must see to the organization of supplies if you are to survive this impending attack. May the gods bless you both and guide you. I blinked at her words before I dropped into a quick bow. My bloodthirsty thoughts and anger had taken over my mind, and I hadn't even noticed we'd come to a large door carved with moons. Sarnai walked away gracefully, and I placed my hand on the carved doors. There was something inside of the room that thrummed with a brilliant power, similar to Aliona's pristine purity. You sense the power, don't you? Tristan looked at me with half a smile on his face. There's a mirror inside that room created by his eminence and gifted to Hatra so her lords may reach him at any moment. So it was King Rodion's power I was feeling and not Aliona's. It didn't matter. Aliona wasn't born yet, and she was waiting for me in the future. I had to save my city from the demons and find my way back to her and Laika. Then, let us speak to him. I pushed on the doors, and they swung open easily underneath my hands. Hatra's survival depends on us and whatever happens in there. Chapter 15 When you said mirror, I didn't think it would be this large, I muttered to Tristan as I walked into the room. Well, our gracious ruler doesn't do things by halves, Tristan shrugged as he closed the doors behind us. Inconspicuous isn't a word in his vocabulary. You're telling me, I snorted as I looked back at the mirror. That thing's huge. I was expecting a hand mirror or something. The mirror inside of the room was large, larger than I could have ever imagined. It spanned the length of the entire back wall, and the surface was like aged silver. It didn't even look like there was an actual mirror inside of the dark bronze frame. It was more like a frosted window pane, but there was something about the mirror that made me think it wasn't just a mirror. A hand mirror would be convenient, Tristan admitted as he crossed his arms next to me. But this was built into the very foundations of the Lunar Palace, so changing it would not be simple. I have seen smaller mirrors before, though. Such would not be appropriate for communicating with his eminence. This one looks into his eminence's private study. I nodded absently as I stared at the mirror. On the surface was the frozen image of the very king I'd met just hours earlier, before I was thrown back in time by whatever magic was inside of the catacombs. I couldn't see any differences between this King Rodion from a thousand years ago and the King Rodion I'd met in the present day. He looked exactly the same, like he hadn't aged a single day. Do all the nobles of the sword have such grand mirrors? I asked as I glanced over at Tristan for a moment. Does his eminence trust them all with giving them a look into his life like this? I know many nobles of the sword have similar mirrors to this one, though none so grand. Tristan's eyes flickered over the surface of the mirror, and his emerald eyes darkened in thought. Few have been granted with such intimate trust, or so I've heard. The size of the mirror and its clarity shows how much the king values your house and your fealty to him. It said Hatra's mirror is one of the largest and clearest. So the king has an immense amount of trust in our house, I murmured half to myself as I tilted my head in thought. He does. Tristan ruffled my hair just like Ruslan would, and pride was evident in his voice. That's impressive, I hummed and looked back to the mirror. Then I noticed the king's image was dressed in gleaming armor made out of oracalum. So that meant the mirror was showing me an image of the king at the breach. There was no other place he would wear such powerful armor casually. But that did make me wonder how powerful the demons that poured out of the breach were. King Rodion's body was immortal, just like Aliona's, so it was impossible for his existence to disappear from this world. But did that mean the demons from the breach had enough power to cause even him to bleed? No one had been able to permanently seal the breach because of the sheer amount of demons constantly pushing against the magical array, even when powered by the almighty King Rodion. But that had been before I'd appeared in the world of Inati. 
Maybe I would be able to bring a fresh perspective to the situation. Who was I kidding? Invasion ideas were already half-forming inside of my head. All I wanted to do was lead a force into the demon world and massacre all the demons so they would never harm what was mine again. Complete annihilation was the only answer I could see. There was no way for demons and mortals to coexist. The scales had been wavering, only just maintaining their equilibrium, but they tipped the moment I came into this world. The demons would stand no chance against me when I brought an army to their doorstep. Who can go and fight at the breach? I asked, and ideas floated in my mind as I weighed my options. Are they drafted from the cities? There are volunteers who come from all over Rama, Tristan explained as his ears twitched. Warriors, mages, and cultivators who have pledged themselves to the protection of our world. Those are trained by His Eminence's generals and the nobles of the sword. Along with our duty of protecting our lands, we must also send warriors to fight at the breach. Then Tristan stepped forward, placed his hand on the frame of the mirror, and drew in a breath. As he exhaled, the surface of the mirror crystallized for the merest of moments before it disappeared, and then the image of the king shifted. King Rodion opened his eyes, and a somewhat tired expression appeared on his face. I was surprised someone so powerful and otherworldly could appear so human. I guessed guarding the breach was more tiring than I'd thought, and he trusted Tristan more than I'd realized. This lord respectfully greets his eminence, the glorious son of Rama. Tristan clasped his hands in front of him and bowed his head. May the gods continue to bless and grace the sun that protects us from all the darkness. Lord Tristan, the king greeted, but then his multicolored eyes shifted to me. And who is this? I did not know you had an heir already. My heart stilled in my chest. The look the king pinned me with wasn't as odd as the one he'd given me in the present, but it was like I was being stripped down to the bone and he was looking through my past. His terribly wise eyes glinted with a painted realization, and he closed them for a moment. I bit my tongue as I realized this reaction was why the King Rodion in my present had seemed to recognize me. He remembered me from this moment, and maybe he was even the reason why I was in the past. Suddenly, I released a breath I wasn't aware I was holding. It was like I'd forgotten air was necessary for my survival like something far older had been inside of my mind, and my body had already forgotten the bliss of living. This is a son of Hatra, who has yet to be presented to his eminence, Tristan replied, and his ears twitched as he glanced between King Rodion's face and my own. But that is not why I've contacted you. My king, Hatra will be attacked by demons. A demon attack? The king's curiosity shifted immediately toward seriousness as his body stiffened. Has a rift opened near the city? Not yet. The word slipped out of my mouth quickly as I interrupted the two men. But there will be an attack that will devastate Hatra el Shamash. What do you mean by yet? King Rodion tilted his head at me as his brow furrowed. Has there been a vision? I opened my mouth to reply, but then I hesitated. Faking a vision might help convince the king of the seriousness of the situation, and I could deal with whatever consequences there were afterward. If I even had to deal with them, I didn't know how long I would be stuck in the past anyway. I had a vision of Hatra's destruction, I declared with confidence as I met the king's eyes. Her walls will soon fall against the might of a demonic horde, and her people will be slaughtered. The city is already preparing for the attack— but I ask that his eminence send whatever soldiers and mages he can spare. Rodion's brow furrowed, but before he could respond, someone called his name. Through the mirror, I saw a young aide in black robes run into the room and stop in front of the king. Sweat dripped down the youth's forehead as he bowed quickly. My king! The aide panted as he tried to keep his composure. The cities of Atheson, Imunving, and Veta have been attacked by demons and black magic! I thought back to the map of Inadi I'd seen and remembered the placement of the cities the aid mentioned. They were three port cities on the northwesternmost point of Rama. The area was more of a peninsula than anything else, and there had been dozens of smaller villages around the outskirts of each city. What is it, demon gates or fallen mages? King Rodion asked, and the tiredness on his face disappeared and was replaced by determination. 
What have the marshals and the nobles of the sword reported? Surely someone must have felt something. Cities of such size couldn't have been attacked without someone seeing something. I don't care if it was an ill-omened wind or a dark cloud on the horizon. There is no possible way they could have been blindsided. Demon Gate, sire! The young aide gulped as his face only continued to pale. It was reported massive winds had begun to rampage over the cities, and the ocean waves have grown turbulent. Many boats were sunk before they realized what was behind the strange phenomena. A massive demon gate opened in the sky over the three cities, and an estimated force of 700,000 strong are to emerge, perhaps more. The demon gate continues to expand with every passing moment. To lead a force of demons that size would require a demon lord. King Rodion sat down in a nearby chair and rubbed his forehead. What are they after in those three cities? An army of demons seven hundred thousand strong. The people will be massacred. Tristan stiffened at my side, and suddenly a wave of epiphany washed over me. I already knew what Tristan was going to tell the king, and I realized there was nothing I could change. I was living a self-fulfilling prophecy. The only reason Hatra had been able to survive, few as they were, was because of my warning. The White Jade Sect would never have been able to save the city. It had been my traveling back in time that gave the city even a small fighting chance. My king, I ask that you protect Rama and all of Anati, Tristan intoned, and a muscle twitched in his jaw as he clenched his fists. Hatra will be honored to shed her blood for the good of the world. Tristan, Hatra's sacrifice will not be in vain. King Rodion bowed to the two of us as his image began to stiffen. Your people will be remembered as heroes who saved three cities. And that was it. The fate of my city was sealed. The image of the aid faded away from the mirror, and only the frozen visage of King Rodion remained on the silvery surface. Tristan and I walked out of the room in silence, and the heavy doors slammed shut behind us. I understood the king's logic, and knew he'd made the right choice in the long run of things. If those three cities fell to the demons, possibly millions would die compared to the thousands in Hatra, and those legions would spread throughout the country. A demon gate of that size had to be closed no matter what the cost. In this situation, the cost was Hatra but I would do everything in my power to minimize the casualties. So we're alone against the demons. Tristan brought up his hand to cover his eyes as he slumped against the door. This was a well-orchestrated attack on their side. We were all caught unaware. No, you aren't, I growled as I let lightning crackle threateningly on the surface of my hand. You have me, and I will bring them down. They will rue the day they decided to attack our city. You're right! Tristan shook his head as he smiled at me. I despaired for a moment, but even if Hatra falls to the demons, you'll be there to raise the city back up. I smiled back, and it was a violent smile that promised a deadly end for thousands of demons. The military preparations for battle took only a few hours, and the thousands of citizens within the city were already being evacuated into the underground safe houses. Soon, they would all be safe underneath the city. Tristan ordered for a page to bring armor for me, but I'd refused and told them to leave the armor for the soldiers. My refusal had earned me an odd look from the page, but Tristan only nodded with approval. I'd either earned points with my grandfather for my apparent courage, or he could sense my power level was enough that I wouldn't be easily harmed. I was standing next to Tristan on the rooftop of one of the city towers when the battle for Hatra began. We'd been going over the defense measures when an enormous magical array darkened the skies above our city. Even though we'd been watching and waiting for the demons to pour out of the sky, they were a nigh-unstoppable horde that covered Hatra's gleaming protective barrier. The demons that poured out from the enormous array were similar to the ones that attacked Valera. They were hideous creatures with disfigured limbs, and they dripped putrid blood from their gaping mouths with every movement. The droplets of blood sizzled as they fell against the city's protective barrier. Tristan had told me the barrier was one of the blessings left behind by the Moon Princess, and as long as the Sword of Hatra remained in the city, the barrier would never fall. 
Even so, the impressive glowing barrier was beginning to falter under the weight of the demons, and some of them had even managed to push through. Those few were immediately shot down by the soldiers of Hatra, though, and their bodies sizzled into gray ash. They're trying to break through, I murmured as I kept my eyes on the grotesque demons. They're sacrificing their own comrades to create a hole in the barrier. None of the soldiers around us flinched at the sight of the demons. They all had iron resolve and only kept their eyes on the threat above them. Those are foot soldiers, Tristan's eyes narrowed as his ears flicked forward. Essentially, wheat to the scythe, easily replaceable and perfect for overwhelming a stationary target, in this case our city. I wasn't able to reply to those words because a thunderous noise echoed across the sky. Above us, just beginning to emerge from the demonic array, was the largest behemoth I'd ever seen. The creature was larger even than the ones Asher summoned when he attacked Hatra. This reptilian beast was almost half the size of the city. If that thing managed to break through the barrier, everyone would be crushed. Of all the damned creatures to come through, Tristan cursed at the sight of the behemoth. That creature cannot reach the city, no matter what! Tristan turned to one of the soldiers beside us and motioned him over. I knew I could take down the behemoth, but I needed to get away from Tristan first. I still hadn't told him I was a dragon, and I had the feeling that suddenly transforming into one wouldn't be a great way to tell him. Also, in the chaos of battle, no one would notice an additional beast in the sky or infighting in the demon's ranks. I'm going to join the mages, I called out as I moved toward the stairs. I'll be more help with them. Tristan nodded sternly before he turned back to the soldier. I took that as my cue to dash away and found a secluded corner near the tower where I could safely transform. All eyes were on the demons outside of the barrier, and as long as I angled my flight right, no one would notice me until I was close to the behemoth. I shifted into my dragon form, and the barrier allowed me to pass through easily since the blood of Hatra ran through my veins. I had my sights on the behemoth, and nothing would stop me from getting to it. The demons didn't even notice me. They were just a mindless swarm intent on getting through the barrier. I'd almost reached the behemoth when the screeching of the demons intensified, and a bolt of black light suddenly shattered the city's barrier as it hit the tower Tristan was standing on. I watched in horror as the tower crumbled down, and the demons poured into the city. Hatra's soldiers charged forward as mages cast spell after spell in an attempt to stop the demons' advance. It was a cacophony of sound, and the bone-chilling shrieks of the demons merged with the clashing of swords. Part of me wanted to dive back down and join the fray, or go back and find Tristan, but I had to get rid of that behemoth and make sure it didn't land on the city, no matter what. Thankfully, the immense behemoth was slow-moving, and a majority of it was still on the other side of the demon gate. Lightning crackled all along my scales as I flew into the sky, and the demons around me screeched as they were electrocuted to a crisp. This was the opposite of how I'd fought the behemoth summoned by Asher. Back then, the behemoths fell to the ground, and I had the advantage of the high ground. Unfortunately, I couldn't let this behemoth make landfall, and I could see no weak points on the underside of the beast. It was all scaly armor and jagged spikes. But I did have an idea on how to fight this one. The mages from the Blue Tree Guild use ice against the behemoths and succeeded in weakening the creatures long enough for their warriors to land the finishing blows. While I didn't have any ice-based powers, I did have my lightning and stone abilities. Those two were perfect for what I had in mind. My stone spikes had managed to break through the armor of behemoths half the size of this one, and if I used my lightning to coat it, the spikes would hopefully work like a bastardized version of a railgun. I'd never used both powers at the same time, but what better time than now to try that out? Calling forth the stone was seamless. I'd already done it so many times before, it had become like breathing to me. Covering it with lightning was the difficult part. It was like trying to shove together magnets of the same polarity. The powers wanted to reject each other, to fall apart, but I wasn't going to let that happen. It was draining, and I felt like I was flying through mud. My vision flickered with every passing moment as I forced my lightning to wrap around the stone spikes, but I pushed on. There was only going to be one outcome, and I wasn't going to accept failure from my own power. 
I launched hundreds of razor-sharp spikes into the air, and lightning crackled all around and within them. They were like missiles as they raced through the air and pierced through the behemoth's armored flesh, and black blood was left in their wake as the demonic creature let out a guttural cry of pain. The behemoth was slammed back through the demon gate, and I could hear its dying cries echo back to me as the creature's black blood rained down. Since the biggest threat at the moment was taken care of, I turned my attention back to the crumbling tower. I flew down and shifted back into my human form as I landed in the rubble and debris of the tower. Then I searched through the jagged and broken stones for any hint of my grandfather and the soldiers who had been on the tower with him. Underneath the chaotic sounds of battle, I could just barely hear their still-beating hearts and their labored breathing. There was an enormous piece of stone rubble blocking my way, and I heaved it easily to the side. Underneath that piece of stone was my grandfather Tristan and his soldiers. Tristan was covered in dust, and blood splattered from his mouth with every breath he took. Blood also pooled underneath his left leg, and it dripped from his right arm. I could hear a slight whistling each time he drew in a breath, and I clenched my jaw. He had to have a ruptured lung, and I could tell two of his arteries were cut open. There was possibly more damage to his body, too. Hey, hey, Gramps, listen to me! I knelt next to Tristan and patted his cheeks. Don't close your eyes. Just stay awake. I hadn't even realized I'd called him Gramps. All I knew was I wouldn't let him die today, and I was full of anger for the demons. I looked down at his broken body, and a list of his injuries flickered in front of my eyes as I gathered my healing power. Classification Fox Demihuman Condition Fractured skull and severe concussion Shattered ribcage and internal bleeding detected Left lung ruptured by bone fragments Possible spinal injury Left femoral artery and right brachial artery ruptured Hypovolemia due to blood loss Priority Immediate healing required Danger. In danger of dying. Status. Critical. Death imminent. Fuck that. Tristan wasn't going to die tonight. My healing power erupted around us in a shower of kaleidoscopic light and glitter that seeped into the open wounds of all of the fallen soldiers around us. Flesh knitted back together and bones were set back into place as everyone's wounds were healed. I clenched my jaw as I staggered underneath the power drain, and my head thudded with every breath I took. My discomfort didn't matter, though. It wasn't as bad as the first time I'd healed a mass group, and I was getting better. Plus, this wouldn't be the last time I'd be healing during combat, not if I wanted to bring the fight to the demons. Evan? Tristan hazily blinked open his eyes as I helped him sit up. What are you doing? I thought you were fighting the behemoth. No. I was with the mages, I replied as I crouched down beside him. I told you I was going to be more help with them. You can't trick a fox's nose, Tristan smirked weakly. I knew you were a dragon from the moment I saw you in the catacombs. Why didn't you say— I began just as my grandfather slumped forward in my arms. Gramps, what's wrong? I shifted him to look into his face, and Tristan's emerald eyes, once bright with life and power— were now dull and dark. I frowned at his reaction and apparent weakness because I was sure I'd healed him. Was I running out of power because I was in the wrong time but right place? I glanced over his body again, but there were no wounds. Classification. Fox. Demihuman. Condition. None. Priority. None. Danger. None. Status. Healthy. Even the status check showed that there was nothing physically wrong with him. No, Gramps, don't close your eyes, I growled as I patted Tristan's cheeks again. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> Tristan laughed unsteadily as he unstrapped the sword from his hip. It was right in our faces the entire time, and no one realized. Figured out what? I poured more healing power into Tristan, and relief coursed through me as he seemed more awake. The sword was never missing. Tristan smiled in relief as he shoved the weapon into my hands. You had it all along. I gave it to you now. That's why it was never there in the present. Take the sword. It's meant to be in your hands. 
A rush of power, not unlike when I first touched the oracalum dagger made by Natalia, ran through my body. It was like I'd been plugged into a battery and had an unlimited amount of power running through my veins. Even my spiritual sea was humming with unmistakable power, and a maelstrom rose in time with every beat of my heart. Understanding flowed through me in that moment, and I knew why Tristan seemed so exhausted. He had handed over the symbol of Hatra to me, and it drained him of power because this was something overseen by the gods and spirits of this world. Suddenly, my power exploded all around me, and a wave of healing glitter spread throughout the city. My consciousness expanded with that wave of iridescent power until it covered every inch of Hatra, and I felt everyone within the city. I was everywhere my power was, and I could feel myself spread thinner and thinner until every sound and scent seemed faint. The world around me faded, and all of the fighting and the chaos that had surrounded me was gone. Instead of fighting against the demons invading my city, I was trapped inside a swirling void of nothingness. I gasped for air as I fell deep within the endless abyss that had dragged me away from the fighting, and I tried to hold on to anything that would stop my fall. My power bubbled underneath the surface of my skin, and it exploded all around me in a cascade of lightning and a kaleidoscope of colors. It was like I was being showered with gems and silver as I fell through time. Then everything stopped with the sudden peal of a bell, and the darkness faded away to reveal a familiar surrounding. I was back inside of the catacombs, and now I had the sword of Hatra in my hand. Chapter 16 There was something different about the catacombs this time around, but I couldn't place my finger on it. Somehow the air had changed, and it strangely smelled sweet like a spring breeze. But that couldn't be possible. We were deep underground, and there was no way for fresh air to travel through the catacombs. Still, it was strange. And where was all of the dust? When I'd first come in, everything had been covered in inches of dust, and I'd left footprints behind me as I walked. But now? Every stone statue was pristine and glimmered as if there were spotlights on them. What the fuck? I muttered. Then, the same kid I'd originally followed into the catacombs appeared out of thin air in front of Tristan's statue. Everything about him was ghost-like, from his pale hair to his pale eyes. They weren't gray, but they weren't white either. It was like he was a blank page just waiting for color to be splashed on him. How did you get in here? I asked as I stared at the kid, and I heard no heartbeat coming or sensed any scent from him. You're not alive, are you? Did you die when the demons attacked Hatra? I hadn't seen a ghost in this world yet, but there was a first time for anything in Anati. Still, he didn't seem like he was human to begin with, and his clothes weren't like any I'd seen in this world before. Even the clothing from a thousand years ago was pretty familiar, if not identical, to what was worn in the present day. But the kids' clothing? It looked far more fantastical than even Aliona's dresses. The fabric shimmered as if it were made out of spun metal thread and covered in shimmering beads. You have the sword! The child tilted his head and hid his mouth behind his sleeve. You saw Hatra! Do you know what you must do now? You're the kid who led me down here earlier. I glanced between the blade in my hand and the ghostly child. Are you connected to the sword? I am. The white-haired child nodded and took a step toward me. And I did it because you are my chosen one and the new wielder of the Sword of Healing. I had to take you to the right place so you could find me. I've been waiting quite a long time for you. Though perhaps it has not been quite so long after all if one considers the flow of time for your existence. Chosen one? I tilted my head in confusion as I crouched down to be at the child's eye level. Kid, who are you? There was some sort of immense power emanating from this child. It was a familiar power, and it reminded me of Ruslan and Tristan, as well as the Sword of Hatra. But in the little I'd heard and read of the sword, there had been no mention of a spirit being attached to the blade. I hadn't even thought of the possibility of objects being sentient, but this was a world where magic and mystery ruled. You may call me Mariah, 
The ghostly child smiled eerily at me as he clasped his hands behind his back. The Lord Prior may have given me to you, but I picked you to be my new lord. I wouldn't accept just anyone, even if they are a descendant of the Lord Prior. I blinked at Mariah's words as I understood what he meant. Mariah was the sword. He wasn't a ghost at all like I'd originally thought. He was the spirit of the sword, which was pretty cool. And Tristan's comment about inheriting knowledge via the sword made more sense now if the sword was a living entity and could talk about stuff. So you're the sword. I glanced between the sword in my hand to Mariah's small form. Why do you take the form of a kid? Are you the youngest of the swords or something? No. <laughs> a small giggle left Mariah as he tilted his head to the side again. I searched your mind and saw you have a fondness for beautiful women and children. I thought this form would make you less wary of me. I will find a more pleasing form for you. Mariah's body shimmered as if he was a mirage, and then his appearance changed. Instead of being a small child in pale robes, Mariah was now a beautiful woman. She was shorter than I was, and her robes put her ample cleavage on display. Her hair was still the same almost colorless white, but it pooled around her feet, and strands of it covered her face. Whoa! I breathed as I gaped at the beauty in front of me. Is this a more pleasing form for your eyes? Mariah tilted her head as she looked up at me and pressed her delicate fingers to her full lips. Yeah, yeah, I replied immediately. You look fantastic. I like this much better. Perfect. Mariah purred as she pushed back her hair from her face. I shook the lustful thoughts out of my head and tried to refocus on the situation. Mariah, are you inside of the sword all of the time? I asked as I strapped the sword to the fabric belt around my waist so it hung against my hip. Or do you exist outside of it? I didn't see you anywhere near Tristan unless you were invisible or something. Well, I can be outside of the sword. Mariah plopped down on the floor and sat cross-legged. It all really comes down to how much power my lord has, and if I want to be out of the sword. I usually stay inside of the sword for my own convenience to conserve power. Not that power will be an issue for you. It's practically overflowing from you like a waterfall. Definitely a top-notch lord, if I do say so myself. Thanks for that confidence in me. <laughs> I laughed as I shook my head. Things are bound to get interesting with you around now. Talking swords weren't a thing back in my old world. Mariah had a way of complimenting me in an offhand manner, as if she had the absolute confidence in my abilities. I mean, I was pretty awesome, but I didn't think she'd seen enough of me to be able to tell. Obviously. Mariah sniffed in a matter-of-fact tone. I am one of a kind and a sublime existence. No mere humans, even as advanced as the ones I saw in your memories, could even create a lesser copy of me. I am unique, and only someone powerful like you could command me. I see. I lifted an eyebrow at that. Mariah really had a high opinion of herself. But she also seemed to have a high opinion of me, so that was cool. If you will excuse me, my lord. Mariah yawned as she stood up. I am tired, and the Lord Prior wishes to speak with you. If you have any need of me, you only need to call my name. Mariah disappeared from view, but I could still sense her presence. Only, instead of being in the catacombs, it was as if she was inside of my spiritual sea as well as in the sword. Then another presence grew in the catacombs, and it was one I recognized. A moment later, Tristan suddenly appeared in front of me. He wasn't entirely solid. There was a bit of haziness to his appearance, and the outline of his body was smudged. This was the spirit of Tristan, and there was a tendril of power connecting the sword to Tristan's statue. Tristan! I exclaimed with a smile. I hadn't expected I would ever see him again, since I thought the sword only kept the knowledge of the previous wielders. Evan, you made it! Tristan grinned, and his tail even seemed to wag a bit. I'm so happy to see you again! You know, I never did apologize for putting the sword to your back, did I? Did you know the sword would take me back? I asked, 
and more questions just rushed out of my mouth. Was that why you gave it to me? Why didn't you keep it? You could have used it to save Hatra. You already saved us by letting us know the attack would come. Tristan clasped one hand on my shoulder as he positively glowed with pride. We would have been caught unawares otherwise. Perhaps no one would have survived, and you would never have been born. Neither would my son, Ruslan. I couldn't risk that happening when you're the living hope of our people. All I needed to do was stay alive long enough and guide my people on the path of survival. And I did my part. I'll make you proud, I promised Tristan as I pressed my forehead against his. Hatra's glory days are here again, and they will never leave. I believe you, Tristan stepped back with a grin. If you ever need me, I'll be in the sword, just like all the previous lords of Hatra. My grandfather faded away, and I was left alone in the catacombs. It felt like an eternity had passed since I'd first found the catacombs, but something told me it was still the same day. As much as I wanted to stay in here and talk to the previous rulers of Hatra and find out what they knew, there was work that needed to be done. I walked out of the catacombs and out of the underground archives with the sword of Hatra strapped to my waist. The king of Rama had demanded I find the sword, and I'd done it. This was proof that I had the right to lead the city of Hatra el Shamash, and that I wasn't evil like the rumors spread by the green glass sect said I was. I didn't need this sword to prove that to myself or to Hatra. Everyone here had already seen firsthand what I would do for this city, but having the sword was political maneuvering, and while I had no doubt there was a deep well of power in the sword, this was all just putting on a show for an audience who wasn't even present yet. Well, this isn't the first time I've been called a political tool. Mariah's voice echoed in my mind with an amused slant. I jerked to a stop because I hadn't been expecting Mariah's voice to ring out through my mind. Between her and Asher, I was starting to have way too many voices in my head that weren't mine. Evan, who is this? Asher's voice had more than a hint of annoyance and curiosity. You didn't tell me we were getting another roommate. I thought we had something special. She's the spirit of the Sword of Healing. I rubbed the side of my head as a bit of a headache seemed to start up. Speaking of... Where were you the last few hours? You didn't see the time travel or anything? Time travel? Asher asked curiously. What time travel? How did I miss out on something so interesting? And when did you have enough power to accomplish something like that? It wasn't my power, I replied dryly as I focused on healing my headache. It just happened. It's not my fault you were being lazy and sleeping during it. I resent that, Asher snarked back. You do resemble that comment, Mariah's voice replied smugly. If you're going to be useless, you can just stay sleeping. Evan has me now to help him. Listen here, you little brat. Hey! I growled out and sent a wave of displeasure through my spiritual sea. Both of you need to get along. I don't have the time to chaperone the two of you, so stop bickering like your kids. Both of them subsided into silence but I felt a nondistinct grumble come from Asher. As I started walking again, I could almost imagine the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens snickering at me. If this was a cosmic joke, I wouldn't be surprised at all if she had a hand in it. During the adoption ceremony, she'd struck me as the mischievous sort and the type of person who wouldn't take no for an answer. I meandered through the streets of Hatra, and I could sense some of my family and the king were in our living quarters. It was a bit late in the day, probably late evening considering how low the sun hung in the sky, so they were probably finishing up the evening meal. Either way, I was just in time to present the Sword of Hatra to the King of Rama. I picked up speed with a grin. As I ran to our living quarters, the blue stone walls of Hatra flashed past me, and the smell of roasted goat filled the air. My people bustled through the streets, and they called out cheerful greetings to me as they headed toward the communal dining area for dinner. "'Lord Evan!' Leon exclaimed as he brandished his arms full of scrolls at me. "'I found the documents you wanted about the Lunar Palace!' "'That's perfect!' I grinned at him and slowed my pace down. "'Those'll help a whole bunch with the rebuilding.' I'd already seen the Lunar Palace in its full glory, a striking building that seemed to be made out of pure crystal, and it made me want to just dive into rebuilding it already. 
I wanted my people to have their symbol back and for the glory of Hatra to be resplendent. Do you want me to take them to your rooms now? Leon asked as he shifted his burden from arm to arm. Or perhaps your study in the archives? Take it to my study, I replied quickly. I need to speak to the king now, but I'll take a look at them shortly. Leon nodded and bobbed a short bow before he dashed off in the direction of the underground library. An excited laugh left me as I started running again. Everything was falling into place for Hatra and me, and I couldn't wait to see what the future would bring for us. I slowed down just as I was nearing the entrance to our building and clamped down on my excitement to try and sneak in. Only the elders and King Rodion were in the common area on the first floor. Valera, Aliona, and the Dragon Egg were in her room on one of the upper floors. Other than them, I didn't sense anyone else in the building. I was about to step through the doorway when King Rodion shifted and faced me with a tiny smile. Fuck. Of course sneaking up on someone who was thousands of years old and nearly a deity wouldn't work. I'd get the jump on him one day, though. Look, Lord Ruslan, your son has returned to us. King Rodion hid his smile behind his wine cup as he nodded at me. Returned? Ruslan frowned as he set down his own wine cup. When did he leave? Ruslan turned around and blinked owlishly when he saw me standing in the doorway. Hundreds of questions burned in his eyes as he focused on the sword I carried. When did he indeed? King Rodion smiled openly this time as he set down his wine cup. That... That's the sword of Hatra. Julia's fan dropped from her hand as she stared at me. Evan, how did you find the sword? It's been lost for centuries. I smiled at the gaping elders and knew I had returned with more hope than they could have ever dreamed of. The sword of Hatra, or rather, the sword of healing, was the symbol of the city's power. This lord greets his eminence, the glorious son of Rama. I knelt in front of the king and offered the sword of Hatra to him. I have found the sword of Hatra el Shamash and brought it to the sun that protects us all from the darkness, as was requested of me. Chapter 17 King Rodion took the sword of Hatra from me and placed it in the middle of the table. The hilt of the sword gleamed, and while it was no longer in my hand, I could still feel a connection to the blade. Rise, Lord Evan! Power dripped from King Rodion's voice as he smirked. You have done as I asked. You retrieved the lost emblem of this city and proved yourself not only to your king, but to the gods in the high heavens. There is now no one who may doubt your devotion to the city of Hatra el Shamash, nor your right to rule the city. My devotion to my city has never been in question, I replied as I stood. Hatra is mine, and I will always protect what's mine. I would expect nothing less. King Rodion's smile only grew wider at my words. You are, after all, Hatra's guardian dragon. I took a seat at the table next to Julia. She immediately turned toward me and placed one of her hands on my cheek. Her brown eyes darted all over me, and worry was clearly painted all over her face. Evan, what happened? There was a slight crack in her voice as she glanced between me and the sword on the table. How did you find a sword that has been lost for a thousand years? And your power? There's something strange about it. It feels older somehow, as if you've aged years since I last saw you. It was strange to see the usually calm and cool Julia so shaken. Even the hand she had on my cheek trembled as she stared into my eyes. I glanced at the other two elders at the table and saw they were just as concerned as she was. I found the catacombs of the previous lords of Hatra, I said as I placed my hand on Julia's. I was following a kid, dressed all in white and running through the underground library at first. And then I ended up deeper than anyone's been yet, and I found the catacombs. The child you saw must have been the spirit of the sword, Ruslan murmured with awe, and he looked at me as if I was the sun. The child was the spirit, I confirmed, and I could see Tristan and Sarnai in Ruslan's features as I looked at him. Once they led me to the catacombs, I touched the statue of Lord Tristan, and I suddenly found myself a thousand years in the past. 
You what? Julia tightly squeezed my hand as her eyes widened. A thousand years? I know it sounds impossible, but I was there. I remembered how glorious Hatra looked a thousand years ago and smiled. Hatra was so beautiful. I promise you, Julia, you'll see Hatra the way I saw our city back then. I spent the next fifteen minutes telling the king and my parents about the glory days of Hatra. I waxed poetically about the beauty of the Lunar Palace, the defenses that our great city once had, and meeting Tristan and Sarnai. I can't believe it, Julia murmured in wonder, and hope glimmered in her pale blue eyes as she leaned closer to me. You were actually there, before the demons attacked. I was, I nodded, and my excitement dimmed as I shifted to a more serious topic. I arrived the day Hatra was attacked by the demons. I was able to warn Lord Tristan about the incoming attack, and he believed me. I fought against the demons and held back as many of them as I could, but I was sent back to the present before the battle ended. So, you fought for Hatra even back then? Ruslan began as his ears twitched and tears glimmered in his eyes. You fought alongside my father, your grandfather. You fought alongside my father, your grandfather, to give us the best chance for survival. I did, I replied as emotion swelled up inside of me. And I promised him Hatra would never fall again. To anyone. Gramps was a courageous man. And I see a lot of him in you, Pops. I'm glad I got to meet him. You're truly a gift from the gods to us. Ruslan's ears perked straight up as he smiled widely and wiped the tears from his eyes. It's as if they've chosen you to lead Hatra out of ruin. Hatra wouldn't have survived without you, without the warning you brought to this city. The gods knew what they were doing when they led you to this world. So it would seem, King Rodion hummed as he rested his chin on his hand, and a small smile was still present on his face. There is still the matter of the death curse, however. Our hero has brought the Sword of Healing, and I am now ready to shatter the curse of the Crimson Dragon. What are we waiting for, then? I grinned as I stood up and grabbed the sword. Let's go break a death curse! Suddenly, however, the ceiling spun, and my vision faltered. I grabbed onto the table to steady myself, but my legs felt like they turned to jelly, and every muscle in my body ached. The battle and time travel had caught up to me. While I didn't feel like I was about to pass out, it was like I'd run straight into a brick wall. Once all the adrenaline left me, it was difficult to catch my breath. I was a pretty active guy back on Earth, and I hadn't been slacking here in Anadi. Every day was just spent pushing my limits and becoming stronger. Even so, there would still be moments like right now until I was able to fully come into my power. No need to rush, King Rodion said softly as he steadied me. You need to rest. It would do us no good to have two dragons on the verge of death instead of one. I might have overdone it, I admitted as I thought back to the immense behemoth I'd killed in Tristan's time. That doesn't mean I won't push myself to heal Valera, not when we're so close. I just need to catch my breath. A sound plan, Lord Evan. King Rodion nodded as his power encased me. Take a moment to rest. I shall wipe away your exhaustion. It was like jump-starting a car battery as King Rodion's power ran through me and smoothed over my frazzled spiritual sea. Something inside of me cracked, and my power rushed through me again in a familiar wash of healing energy. My body was healing itself and regained strength with every passing moment. That's an awesome trick! I rolled my shoulders as I took a step back from the king, and my body immediately felt stronger. Quite useful, if I do say so myself, King Rodion smiled slightly as he crossed his arms behind his back. I nodded and memorized the way the king had poured power into me. It was like refilling a cup from a waterfall, but I knew I'd be able to do it with a bit of practice. Let's head up, I nodded toward the ceiling and moved to the doorway. We can't keep Valera waiting any longer. When we entered the room, Aliona's back was the first thing I saw. She was kneeling to the side of the bed and had a bowl of water next to her. Hold on. You're strong. Aliona's voice was clear and sure as she placed a wet towel on Valera's forehead. 
Evan will come back with the sword, and my father will break the death curse on you. You just have to hold on a little longer. Valera was curled up on her side with her clawed hands clutching the bedsheets tightly, and a wheeze rattled from her lungs as her chest rose and fell rapidly. The death curse was taking its toll on her, even though there we were supposed to have more time. We shall see, Valera rasped as her muscles spasmed. We shall see, little princess. I have but one regret in this long life of mine, and it is never seeing my sister's egg hatch. You will live to see her egg hatch, I said as I stepped forward and knelt beside Aliona. I have the sword, and the king is going to break the death curse on you now. Valera's amber eyes widened with shock as she loosened her grip on the bedsheets. She struggled to push herself upward and let out a low cry of pain as blood dribbled from her lips. Then her arms trembled and her grip slipped. Aliona and I moved in tandem to support Valera so she wouldn't fall back on the bed. The other dragon's hot breath ghosted over my neck, and the skin I touched was burning up. It was like there was a raging fire coursing through her body, and it was intent on consuming her alive. So, you've come back, Evan. <laughs> Valera let out a small laugh as she shuddered against us. I won't dare to hope. Do what you will. I gritted my teeth at Valera's words and knew only our actions would be able to convince her. She'd already given up and had no hope. A part of me could understand. There would be nothing to lose if she didn't hope. But if she did dare to hope and we failed, she'd be crushed even further. So we couldn't fail. King Rodion, I began as I settled Valera on her back. Just tell us what to do. It's time to break this death curse. Evan, concentrate on healing Valera's body, the king instructed as he moved to stand next to the bed and placed his hand on my shoulder. Pulling this death curse out will be painful for her. Aliona, maintain a barrier around the four of us. We cannot risk the death curse latching itself onto anyone else or attempting to return to Valera. I will remove the curse from her body. Got it. I placed my hand on one of Valera's and concentrated on healing her body. My power coalesced in my hands in a thick stream of kaleidoscopic glitter that poured into Valera. I directed every ounce of power and energy I had toward her and focused on healing her. The three of us each had an important job, and we wouldn't fail. I will augment your ability to heal. Mariah's voice echoed in my head just as the moonstone in the sword's hilt gleamed. I will ensure the curse does not escape. Aliona promised as her power encased us in a barrier. It will end here. It will have no chance against the three of us, King Rodion declared, and there was a hint of a laugh in his voice as power coalesced in his hands. A hush descended on the room as the three of us focused our combined power around Valera. I continuously pumped healing power through Valera's body while Aliona's barrier encased the four of us in condensed purity. Silver light glowed in Rodion's hands, and the light drove away all the shadows in the room. It was like standing before the face of a star from the night sky. The power was all-knowing, but it wasn't unforgiving. There was a stoic gentleness behind the energy, and I knew it was proof of how much Rodion cared for this world and for everyone who inhabited Inati. Everything was silent, until a terrible screeching filled the room, and it came from Valera's chest. Valera's amber eyes snapped shut, and her body spasmed on the bed as if she was being electrocuted. I instinctively knew it was the death curse being pulled from her body, and just as I poured more healing power into Valera, a black mass seeped out of her and into the air. The broken death curse was a mass of black energy that curled itself into a tangled sphere above Valera's body. It twitched and spasmed sporadically as King Rodion's power restrained the darkness, but then the darkness grew smaller and smaller until it disappeared into nothingness. At the same moment, Valera's breathing eased, and she let out a deep sigh, but her eyes remained closed, her muscles relaxed under my hand, and the scent of death vanished from her. It's over. Aliona sighed in relief as she sat on the bed next to Valera. She's free of it. Why hasn't she woken up? 
Ruslan asked from where he and the other two elders had been watching quietly. I glanced over Valera and summoned her status. I knew the death curse had been removed from her, but while the scent of death was gone, I wasn't sure if there was anything else ailing her. Classification? Dragon. Condition? Exhausted due to burden placed on body by death curse. Spiritual sea currently healing itself. Priority? None. Danger? Stable. Status? Healthy. She's fine. I breathed out as I felt the tension of the day drop off my back, like a ton of bricks. She's just sleeping. There was a lot of stress on her body. She's exhausted. Go and rest, King Rodion instructed as he sat down on the edge of the bed and glanced at me. I shall watch over her until her spiritual sea settles. There was no way I was going to say no to a free pass to my bed. So I staggered away and to my bedroom as I tried to figure out why King Rodion's power had been so familiar to me. There was still a large amount of the king's power in my spiritual sea, and it was a comforting presence to me. It was almost like I was standing in front of the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens again, but it wasn't an exact copy of her power, it was just the etherealness of it that was similar, almost as if I'd been blessed by some higher power. Well, whatever. The only thing I wanted to do was sleep, and we have a moment to relax. I stripped carelessly, but almost reverently placed the sword on the nearby dresser. Finally throwing myself into my bed had to be the happiest moment of my life. It had been a long day, especially if I considered the fact that I hadn't slept the previous night. I went straight from fighting demons to practicing lightning magic, and then to fighting demons all over again, not to mention traveling a thousand years back in time. Anyone would be exhausted, and I definitely was. I was almost asleep when the door to my room opened. There was the sound of shifting silk and the creak of leather, and it was clear just who had entered my room. I weighed my options. I could sit up and ask what they wanted, or I could wait and see. With a yawn, I rolled onto my back and carefully peeked out from under my lashes as the bed creaked. The sight that awaited me was a beautiful one. Laika and Aliona were both naked as they crawled toward me on the bed. There was no way I was going to pretend to be asleep, not when I knew what they wanted, and I was perfectly willing to give it to them. As desire and adrenaline surged through my veins, I sat up and yanked the two gorgeous women toward me. They let out matching yelps of surprise as they came face to face with my bare chest, but their surprise faded and matching expressions of desire took over. What? I began huskily as I raked my gaze over their bodies. Are you two lovely ladies doing, sneaking in here like this? Valera is still in my bed. Aliona replied in a breathy gasp, and she traced a languid pattern on my chest with her nails. Laika offered for me to sleep in her room, but the bed is rather lonely without you. Oh? I tilted my head to the side as I brought my hand down to firmly grip Laika's thigh. And that's why the two of you ended up here? Because you're feeling lonely and want to talk? We most definitely do not want to talk. Laika's lips fell into a pout as her tail shifted from side to side. If we wanted to talk, we would have stayed clothed. There's a lot of different ways we can talk. I dragged my hand along Laika's thigh until I brushed my fingers against the soft flesh between her thighs. If you don't want to talk, though, we can just go to sleep instead. No, please. Laika whined as she thrust her hips against me. Don't tease us like that. Evan, please. Aliona added as she grinded against me, too. I need you now. We both do. That was the breaking point for me, and I wasn't able to hold back. Not when both of these gorgeous women were so desperate for me to show them just how much I adored them and their bodies. I slanted my mouth over Aliona's bare breast as I applied pressure to Laika's slick entrance. Then I licked and suckled all over Aliona's sweet flesh and pulled out soft cries of pleasure from her. Laika bucked on my fingers as I pressed deeper and deeper inside of her. The warmth of her walls made it seem like I was wrapped in a molten vice of slick velvet, and she only got tighter the more I thrust my fingers into her. 
Our three bodies were entwined as passion ignited between us, and I buried myself into the two women. Aliona gasped, and Lyca panted as I brought them to the edge over and over again, until they were both trembling underneath me. I engraved their taste on my tongue and into my memory as I feasted on their euphoric love for me. Even as they gasped and pleaded for more, half mad with desire, I brought them in closer to myself. All I wanted to do was to keep the two of them in my arms, to bury myself into their soft flesh and sweet skin until even time ended. We were like that for hours, and we rediscovered each other's secret places even as the three moons rose high in the sky. Eventually, Lyca and Aliona collapsed, exhausted from our non-stop lovemaking, and filled with my dragon seed, and I was the only one left awake. I tried to follow them into the dark oblivion of sleep, but it eluded me, so I left the two sleeping beauties in my bed and got dressed quietly before I snuck out of my room. I ended up sitting on the doorstep of the building, and I was just quietly looking up at the stars when I realized I wasn't alone. I looked up, and King Rodion had appeared beside me with a quiet expression on his face. Come with me, Evan. Let us drink. King Rodion nodded in the direction of one of the empty tables in the town square. What are we drinking to? I asked as I followed behind the king, and we walked to the table closest to the nearby garden. We drink and celebrate the coming morning and everything that has been accomplished within the time you've lived in my country. Rodion sighed as he sat down at the table. His fingers twitched, and two small stemless cups appeared on the table. A slim ceramic jug appeared next to the cups as well, and when the king poured out the liquid from the jug into the cups, it was a shimmering crimson. I'll drink to that, I shrugged as I clinked my wine cup against the king's. I thought you would. A smile twitched on King Rodion's face as he drank from the cup. The lords of Hatra have ever been quite festive and quick to smile. You saw me that day. I didn't beat around the bush and just went straight to the point. When Hatra and the port cities were attacked by demons. I did. King Rodion set down the small cup and looked up at the sky. It was such a strange moment that it has stayed so clearly in my memory. It was a surprise to see a son of Hatra bear the blood of a dragon in his veins, but so much has happened that such a thought was shoved away. I never thought it would take a thousand years for my curiosity to be sated, but I am a patient man. Is that why you told me to go get the sword? I asked as I poured more wine into my cup to drink. Because you knew I would come back with the sword and minimize the casualties back then? There was a hum from the sword at my hip and a slight brush against my mind from Mariah. When I saw you through the mirror, the king began, I knew you would be the pebble that would send hundreds, if not thousands, of ripples throughout our world. You bring change, and you will tip the scales of power in Anati. Perhaps you'll be able to end this eternal war, or perhaps you'll fuel the flames of war. Either way, I've already made my choice. Yeah, I lifted my cup to drink again and wondered about this eternal war with the demons. And what choice did you make? To entwine my fate with yours. A fiery determination filled King Rodion's eyes as he looked at me. There is little I can do from the breach, but I am needed there, and those closest to my heart have suffered for it. Aliona and this country. This country, no, this world needs more than just one sun. There are three moons in the sky, so why shouldn't there be another two suns protecting this world from darkness? There could be only one thing he was talking about when it came to two other suns in the sky. King Rodion was called the sun that protected the world, so if there was a second one, that other sun would be Aliona. But for the king to mention a third sun, there was only one reason for that. At least, I thought there was. I needed to be sure, though. I know Aliona is the other sun, I began as I stared up at the night sky. Which makes sense. She's your daughter and the divine princess who will protect this world alongside you. But do you mean for me to be the third son? Nobles have been pushing for me to pick a companion for my daughter, 
King Rodion shrugged as he tilted his head back. Who else but you is able to stand on the same pedestal as my child? I see great things in your future. I've known it since I first saw you a thousand years ago. You would be the only one worthy enough to bear the burden of ruling alongside my beloved daughter. You're talking about marriage. A smile crossed my face as I thought about marrying the Divine Princess. For me to marry Aliona and become this country's prince. I am. The king nodded as he picked up his wine cup again. How else would you accomplish your goal of ensuring the walls of Hatra el Shamash will never again fall? Or the desire that burns inside of you to lay waste to all the demons that attack our world? You think everyone is just going to accept their princess being married off to a dragon? I snorted into my wine as I remembered how the green glass sect viewed me. Changing people's perception of dragons isn't going to be an easy task, not when my kind has been so violent towards mortals and vice versa. An army, perhaps a small one, was brought to Hatra's doorstep, all because of a rumor. Can you imagine what would happen if I stepped through those gates and proclaimed to the entire kingdom I'm going to marry their precious and divine princess? Ah, but you're not just a dragon, are you? King Rodion shook his head before he took a sip of his wine. You're the heir to the house of Hatra el Shamash. You're the wielder of the Sword of Healing, chosen by the sword itself when your city was in the most danger. Even the Blue Tree Guild, famous throughout all of Rama for never pledging themselves to any lord, has bent to your will. Not only that, but you have the favor and blessings of the Dark Lady of the Nine Heavens. Not to mention, you have the approval of the King himself. What is there you cannot accomplish if you put your clever mind to it? It's hard to argue when you put it that way. I chuckled into my wine cup as I leaned back. You might even give me a bigger head with all those compliments. But Hatra has no power yet, and as my lady mother would put it, Hatra is of little consequence now. Maybe in a few months things will be different. Hatra needs time to grow and rebuild. We need to establish trade and a source of income, and that won't happen overnight. There are ways to change that the king remarked with a sly expression on his face. There are ways to speed up the city's growth and consequence. Oh? I snorted as I let my imagination go wild. And what are these ways? Will you have me going city to city, healing people and eradicating demons? Maybe bandits and slavers who've sneaked in from other kingdoms, too. Prove myself to both the people and the nobility as the only choice and become their legendary hero. Even as I said those things, I had half convinced myself and realized the plan I'd come up with wasn't half bad at all. You said it yourself, King Rodion shrugged with quite a bit of amusement before he poured more wine into his cup. Wait a minute. You're actually serious? I asked as I narrowed my eyes at the king. You're not joking or anything, right? I am quite serious about this. The levity faded from King Rodion's eyes as he stared at me. What better way to showcase Hatra's divine son, a gift to them from the heavens, than that? So, I'm divine now? I laughed. What's the plan? Are we going to say I hatched from an egg that fell from the moon? No one is going to believe that. Wouldn't it be far better to say the elders found me in a cave and raised me? And then when the Blue Tree Guild and the princess arrived, I was in one of the caves in the forest hunting down stone giants. You have a point. King Rodion leaned back as he looked up at the three moons in the sky. Perhaps I've spent too much time at the breach, and the lines of reality have blurred for me. That's a bit dangerous for a king, I shook my head and put down my wine cup. You could end up becoming some sort of tyrant if you weren't careful. Yes, yes it is. King Rodion glanced over at me and hummed in thought for a moment. That is why I have decided to turn to you. A dragon who has bound himself to humanity. Most of your kind have turned their backs on us. They are not to blame, though, Evan. This world has been cruel to everyone who lives in it. People warring against each other for no reason other than greed and fear of change. Stagnancy is poison, even if you're long-lived and have seen hundreds of winters pass. Such poison would kill even the strongest among us. 
Well, if it's poison we're fighting, I replied as I smirked up at the three moons in the sky. That's something I can heal. We just need to let putrid blood flow out and allow fresh blood to take its place. A fine analogy. There was a secret sort of smile on King Rodion's face as he rested his chin in his hand. I'm sure you wouldn't be averse to the sight of rotten blood while protecting the healthy blood. You're looking at a top-rate dragon here, I grinned back at the king. Just wait and see. I'll purge Rama of every hint of corruption. I have faith you will, King Rodion laughed. Outrunning a dragon once they've caught your scent is nigh impossible. When are you heading back to the breach? I sipped gently from my wine cup and savored the bittersweet taste of the wine. Isn't it dangerous for you to be away from it for too long? I'm not sure how long it took you to get here, but it's a bit of a pity. Aliona would have loved it if you stayed longer, and I'm sure you could have taught me a trick or two. You're right. I've stayed too long as it is. The king ran his hand through his hair as he looked back up at the three moons. I will have to leave this coming day. I cannot delay any longer. I'll have words sent to the nearest cities for them to deliver aid to Hatra. Their finest architects and craftsmen will come to aid you in the rebuilding of the city. Materials and supplies will be brought by them, so do not worry about any expenses. That is the least I can do for you and this city. Thank you, your eminence, I replied, and I couldn't help the bit of sarcasm behind my words. If all of this had been offered beforehand, the city of Hatra wouldn't have ended up in the state it was in now. But things were different now. No, King Rodion shook his head as he shrugged. We are to be family, are we not? When it is only our family, you need not pay any heed to the titles and proper manners demanded by society. That sounds good to me, Rodion. I poured more wine into the cup and drank from it. I'll drink to that. We toasted to that, and I leaned back in my seat to look up at the night sky. I was already imagining the months to come. Rama was going to have a new prince, and I was going to raise hell. But why stop with just Rama? It was a nice place to start, but I was a dragon. I wanted everything in my horde, so this world was going to be mine. End of Book Two This has been Dragon Emperor 2, Human to Dragon to God, written by Eric Vall, narrated by Alex Perone and Marissa Parness. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.